Introduction to Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. Introduction this book the first volume it is hoped of a series was undertaken because the existing guide-books were through no fault in their writers by no means adequate to the needs of the traveller by motor-car a new method of travel in fact brings in its train the need for a new species of guide-book and the truth of this observation becomes clear when we consider an authoritative definition of the term guide-book it is a book of directions for travellers and tourists as to the best routes etc and giving information about the places to be visited all which needs to be added to this definition by way of explanation is that the information given may justly be of almost any kind so long as it is not tedious substantially all the existing guide-books some of them of admirable quality were written before the motor-car had entered into our social system except a small number of accounts of tours by horse-drawn carriages they were compiled by men who travelled by train from place to place obtaining no view of the country often for deep cuttings destroy all joy to the eye for the railway passenger and at best only a partial view for the use of men and women condemned to the like method of travel in them it is vain to seek for any appreciation of the pleasure of the road of the delight of travel itself the motor-car has changed all that the act of going from place to place is at least as essential a part of the enjoyment of a tour as the sojourn at the new place when it is reached as the leisurely survey of its features of beauty or interest or the inquiry into its history and its associations many matters too are of moment to the motorist which are of none to the traveller by rail he desires to know something in advance of the nature of the roads to be traversed of the gradients to be climbed of the facilities for housing his car when his destination of the day is accomplished and last but certainly not least where he can submit it to a skilled artificer for repair if occasion should unhappily arise does the motorist need or desire more than has been set forth in the preceding sentence the anti-motorist will think not will remain convinced that the motorist is a dust-raising property-destroying dog-killing foul-slaying dangerous and ruthless speed maniac but of course the anti-motorist is quite wrong the rational motorist who is in the overwhelming majority but black sheep are sadly conspicuous amidst a white flock passes through certain regular stages of evolution at first he revels without thought or without conscious thought in the sheer ecstasy of motion the road which seems to flow to meet him white tawny or grey as the case may be and to open before him as if by magic the pressure of the cool air on his face even the tingling lash of the rain as he dashes against it result in a feeling of undefinable almost lyrical exaltation in the next stage he begins to take in broad impressions of great stretches of country impressions similar in some respects to those obtained from a mountain top but secured in rapid succession soon 
for the faculties of man adapt themselves rapidly to his needs, the man in the car begins to observe more rapidly and more minutely than in the early days. The man at the steering wheel finds he can watch the road up to the farthest visible point in advance, manipulate his throttle, use accelerator or decelerator, and most important of all, be in vigilant sympathy with his engine subconsciously. At the same time, he can take an intelligent interest in the scenes through which he is passing, can carry on a conversation with her or with him who sits by his side, can tell a good story or listen to one, can impart information or receive it, without in the slightest degree neglecting his primary duty of driving and humouring the car. In this is nothing of novelty, the same state of doing instructively and without reflection the right thing at the right time is reached by every proficient in many crafts, by the driver of horses for example and by the steersman of a sailing vessel. The motorist therefore even if he be driving, can think of things outside the car, can remain a rational and intelligent man, can, and in my experience usually does, desire to know those associations of the countryside which, when known, appeal to his imagination or to his memory, and make the day's journey something better and more interesting than a progress through the air and over the ground. How much more, then, after the first bewilderment of motoring has worn off, shall the mere passenger be able and desirous to travel with seeing eye and thinking brain? There is no need to labour the point. Motorists are well aware without argument, that they feel an intelligent interest in every part of this amazing England, and that they would take that interest more fully if they were provided, so to speak, with the proper materials. Such materials ought to be found in guidebooks, written in the motorist's mood, which is wider and often less microscopical than that of the traveller in railway carriages, and from the point of view of those to whom county boundaries, which determine the scope of most guidebooks, have no meaning, except that the roads are better, and the police are more sensible in some counties than in others. It is the guidebook writer's business to give first practical facts and directions and then to provide the information which, after sifting a vast mass of history, legend, folklore, literature and gossip, appears to be most interesting and attractive. East Anglia has been chosen as the first theme, and in many respects it lends itself exceptionally well to isolated treatment. The motorist, it is true, has no regard for county boundaries, but let him once venture in his car to the east of an imaginary line drawn from the Tar Bridge to the mouth of the Welland, and he will never come outside East Anglia on wheels, except to the westward. The Wash, the North Sea, and the estuary of the Thames will block him effectually. Let him follow the history of this tract of land, to which the fens were an effectual bulwark on the northwest, and he will find that history to be one of isolation also. East Anglia has always gone on its own way, always worked out its own destinies, always indulged in self-satisfied but inspiring contempt for the shears, and so, perhaps, it has suffered less at troublous periods of the national history than other parts of the country. Its scenery is rarely, perhaps never, rugged, but it is marked in various parts by many kinds of peculiar characteristics not to be found elsewhere, some of them of quite exceptional charm. 
it has its ancient cities its majestic cathedrals time-worn edifices of many kinds it is haunted by the ghosts of many great artists in colour and in words and a small matter this but one adding greatly to the interest of a motoring tour there is no other part of the country in which the lover of bird life can see so much of bird life from the passing car one drawback and one only is there to east anglia as a topic for a motoring guidebook and that affects only the maker of the book not the motoring potentialities so to speak of the country taken as a whole it is not at all a flat district and it has enough ups and downs and variety of scenery to suit any taste but it is practically barren of hills presenting any real difficulty to a car of moderate power so in this volume it is not necessary or possible to indicate any very serious gradients to be encountered on this journey or on that it remains only after a word of thanks to the friends who have lent their company and their cars to add that every chapter is a faithful narrative of tours undertaken or of journeys made together with an account of the associations and memories appropriate to the places visited and that to say breaking the flow of the text an analysis showing the route taken in each chapter the distances from place to place the points at which repairs may be effected and the general character of the roads appears at the very beginning of the volume it must be understood however that these roads are judged by an east anglian standard for even in norfolk where the road surface is far better as a rule than in any other east anglian county the roads cannot honestly be said to be of the highest order of merit in the case of all hotels the presence of garage accommodation may be assumed and all have been tried end of introduction section one of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent winter oxford to cambridge newmarket and ipswich part one practical observations roads cambridge to newmarket mostly flat not good newmarket to bury st edmunds fair bury st edmunds to ipswich poor and very sinuous hills a sharp rise to newmarket some small ups and downs between newmarket and bury st edmunds some small ups and downs between ipswich and stowmarket distances cambridge to newmarket thirteen and a quarter miles newmarket to bury st edmunds fourteen miles bury st edmunds via stowmarket to ipswich twenty five and a half miles note well great care is necessary in driving through ipswich owing to narrow streets and fast tram cars the year nineteen o five had almost run out when this volume was finally decided upon and then a good many things happened according to expectation and otherwise christmas came surprising the railway companies as usual but not the public and the resignation of mr balfour's government the resignation of mr balfour with its corollary of a general election involved some unavoidable delay in opening this campaign of pilgrimages in east anglia for during that general election 
almost everybody who owned a motor car and could drive it or thought he could drive it was stirred to lend his car and his energies to the service of his party by motives of double cogency he desired more or less keenly at the outset but always vehemently and even passionately after he had tasted the joy of battle to lend his aid to the political party of his choice and he knew further that the general election of 1906 had provided motorists with a priceless opportunity of doing missionary work among the electorate at a critical moment in the history of automobilism he felt that the motor act of 1903 of limited duration in any event needed to be supplanted by a measure treating him as a reasoning and responsible being rather than as a dangerous beast and having some hope that the royal commission then sitting would report in his favour as on the whole it has reported he recognised that enlightened self-interest made it desirable to educate public opinion into the frame of mind suitable for the reception of an enabling measure for these reasons and some that are immaterial it was not convenient to make the first raid into east anglia until nearly the end of january nineteen o six and that was a period calculated to try the reality of man's or woman's sincerity as a devotee of motoring by a somewhat severe test how that test was applied it shall be my endeavour to tell in a narrative form and to that form a preference will be given throughout the book digressions being made as occasion serves or fancy calls to mention matters of practical utility or of intelligent interest let me therefore cut the cackle and come not to the osses by any means but to the country and to the motor cars on monday january the twenty third nineteen o six my daughter and i proceeded first to oxford and then to cambridge by rail both journeys were an object lesson in the inferiority of the railway train as it is arranged in england to the motor car for purposes of cross-country travel our starting point being abingdon distant six miles only from oxford we were compelled to change trains at radley en route a long wait at oxford would have been irritating if it had not been providential as it was it furnished me with a private copy of mr f j haverfield's romano british norfolk extracted from the victoria county history and the dreadfully tedious journey to cambridge allowed me to master that most accomplished and useful work cambridge we reached not for the first time by any means well after dusk and there we lay as they used to say in old times at the bull hotel on king's parade in reasonable comfort an undergraduate kinsman of trinity college having cheered us by his company at dinner here let me pause for a moment to speak of an all-important matter it has been written that we were comfortably entertained at the bull it might be added that the hotel seemed much cleaner and brighter than when i last entered it and that the charges were for an english hotel not unreasonable unfortunately it must be said also that the charges at the bull and throughout the united kingdom are far in excess of those for which at least equal accommodation and at least equally palatable fare can be obtained on most parts of the continent frequented by tourists and that this fact is at once the most serious obstacle to tours by motor-cars at home 
and the principal cause why englishmen go touring abroad to the neglect of their own country the prejudice of british hotel keepers and the profit of the foreigner they do not i think desire to ignore the beauties of their own country they are even anxious to study it in detail but the hotel keepers of the provinces without quite killing the goose that lays the golden eggs have a suicidal habit of making nesting accommodation so expensive that the bird being a wise bird really becomes perforce migratory as the swallow more unwise in relation to the motorist even than in relation to the ordinary traveller it will be observed that there is no special reference to the bull and that we did not go there as motorists openly hotel keepers frequently behave as if they thought the owner of a motor car must needs possess an endless supply of ready money whereas the legitimate inference from his ownership of an expensive vehicle is that he has none to spare motor cars of real value and no sensible man will have them of any other kind cannot be obtained on credit and hotel keepers might have learned from experience that a banking account is reduced unless it be an overdraft not increased by drawing a heavy cheque upon it some day perhaps there will be an improvement in this respect in the meanwhile the path is not altogether clear before him who would fain play the part of guide to his fellow men so long ago as seventeen ninety nine a correspondent of the norfolk chronicle wrote there is room for a most useful work in the form of an itinerary which shall give an impartial account of the several inns of the kingdom under the heads of quality cleanliness beds etc there is still just as much room but until the law of libel shall be changed the most useful work is not likely to be written certainly i am not going to write it not that i lack the inclination nor the desire to be of service not that i have not a nice taste for comfort nor an experience of british and irish hotels possessed by few men other than commercial travellers simply because i cannot afford the time or the money to fight a series of actions in which a verdict for the defendant would leave me still liable for the difference between my solicitor's bill of costs as between solicitor and client and the same bill taxed as between party and party the utmost that is possible and at the same time prudent is to point to examples of merit demerit dearness and dirt must go unchastised my arrangement with a friend who had done as much electioneering as he and his car could endure was that he should run down from london and pick us up at the bull on tuesday after luncheon tuesday morning therefore a frosty windless somewhat misty morning was spent in what in our domestic circle is called a broading in cambridge that is to say in visiting places of paramount interest but let the reader take heart some little knowledge of cambridge the fruit of many sojourns and of considerable reading is not going to be made an excuse for a topographical archaeological and architectural chapter upon a subject worthy of a long book already treated in many volumes grave and gay even if such a chapter could be legitimate here it would be wrong for a mere oxford man to write it and i shall never forget how when i was staying at cambridge a year or two ago a cambridge friend who took me out sightseeing closed my mouth before it was opened so to speak by saying you are absolutely forbidden to ask where our high is as matters stand 
remembering always that this Cambridge friend is not at my elbow, and firmly believing, with Mr. Ruskin, that the high at Oxford is not to be matched in the world as a whole, I am inclined to think King's College, as seen from King's Parade, leaves nothing to be desired, and that King's College Chapel has a claim almost equal to that of St. George's Chapel, Windsor, to be recognised as the most exquisite example of perpendicular architecture to be found in England. Of course, the best way to see all there is at Cambridge, and to understand it, is to live at Cambridge, and the next best is to go there often and to study it piecemeal. To try to absorb impressions of Cambridge in one visit, even one of many days, is to submit the human brain to too severe an ordeal. On former occasions, I had seen the backs in summer, had spent an hour or two in the Senate House on a state occasion, had looked into the University Library, and had admired the delightfully free and easy way in which graduates are permitted to borrow its books, had seen cricket played, and had played football on Parker's piece, had stayed in college rooms at Keys, and yet impressions remained a little confused in memory. This time we went to King's College, and to the chapel especially, again. If it falls behind St. George's at all, it is in point of lightness, in which St. George's is perfect. So to Trinity College, where we admired unfeignedly the Great Court, Neville's Court, and the Library, and spoke politely of the chapel, where the Grinling Gibbons carvings are really good but it was in the library that one would gladly have spent hours. A lecture was in progress in the hall, so that was close to us, but the library is perfect. Somewhere in the world there may be an equal of it, but in a life of fairly extended wandering I have not entered its match. One hundred and sixty feet long, forty feet wide, with its carved bookcases, its abundant busts of famous men, its portraits, its magnificent collection of coins, its rare books and manuscripts, its unbroken stillness, and, above all, its ample and all-pervading light. Trinity College Library is not merely a book-lover's paradise, but even a place to compel an air-loving man to be bookish. Hence, to St. John's, many courted with walls of ancient brick and stone dressings, the most architecturally individual of Cambridge's colleges, and so, by the bridge of size, across the chilly green and exiguous cam to the backs. These since there had been no white frost of the dainty kind that drapes a landscape in a fairy veil of silvered lace, were not at their best, but in summer they are of rare beauty. Still, this was winter, so the small remaining part of the morning was devoted to a pilgrimage to Magdalen, the only college entirely situated on the left bank of the Cam famous mainly for the Peepsian Library. Everybody knows how the six volumes of shrewd gossip in shorthand were discovered and interpreted, and itself a quiet and sequestered retreat in appearance, although the undergraduates are not always in the mood appropriate to their environment. By two o'clock the charioteer had come, his face bearing traces of the black fog through which he had forced his way out of London. The fifteen-horsepower panhard, with a short wheelbase, was in the yard. We must be tolerant, he said, of his panhard shortcomings, 
after a fortnight of hard electioneering on the part of master mechanic and car and he had come down from london on three cylinders in due course the panhard came round to the door dinted a little by the missiles of partisans having lost some of the white paint of her rear number under the impact of voters iron-shod toes a little war-worn and dingy in fact to the eye her carrying capacity was however soon tested severely and she bore the trial unflinchingly first luggage a suitcase for the daughter the same for my friend the charioteer a small kit bag for me nothing visible for the mechanic a stalwart ex-soldier of six feet and fourteen stone if he was an ounce charioteer in motor coat was about thirteen stone he and an undergraduate of some nine stone sat in the front seats the mechanic on the step in the back seats were my daughter, say ten stone, wraps included, myself, say thirteen stone in the like condition, and on the back step a second undergraduate, say eleven stone seven pounds, for the two young men were going to pilot us out of Cambridge. But the little Panhard made no account of these things, and started off as a greyhound from the slips practical considerations make it desirable to say what my daughter and i wore my friend and his mechanic wore a lot precisely in what detail i cannot say my daughter wore a thick tweed dress a short fur coat a mackintosh with sleeves gathered in at the wrists over that a red connemara cloak sometimes its colour proved to be of incidental advantage later in quite an unexpected way a motor cap and veil fur-lined gloves and a muff i wore a vest flannel shirt lined corduroy waistcoat ordinary tweed trousers a rowing sweater over the waistcoat thick norfolk jacket thick ulster coat without inner sleeves gathered worse luck and loose woollen gloves i was never too warm often much too cold and the woollen gloves turned out a fraud they were of no use as a protection against wind and cold combined and a motor car makes its own wind in fact there is nothing like leather with or without fur or wool within the undergraduates were useful as pilots to jesus lane where we turned to the right which brought us in fact although not in name into the direct road for newmarket not that it is so difficult in cambridge as in many other towns in east anglia to solve correctly the all-important problem how to find the absolutely right exit having regard to the point sought in the distance but the streets of the heart of cambridge are of an exceptional narrowness and we were not through them without becoming witnesses of an incident almost worthy of the title accident which delayed us a little and might have delayed us more but for the camaraderie of motorists we were proceeding slowly up a narrow street behind a motor omnibus the roadway being wide enough to allow two vehicles to pass but no more on the off side of the omnibus facing it were a motor car attended as the law directs at rest by the curb and a tradesman's cart and horse behind the car cart and horse being unattended as is not unusual law or no law the horse perceiving the motor omnibus and being probably unaccustomed to the sight proceeded at once to give one of those convincing exhibitions in equine intelligence which must be the constant joy of the thick and thin champions of that traditionally noble animal 
Planting its forefeet onto the pavement, it backed the cart violently into the bonnet of the passing omnibus, of course blocking the route completely. Somebody, possibly the man who ought to have been in charge, came up and pulled the stupid brute into line, but not before it had also contrived to injure a wing of the resting and innocent motor car. The omnibus was disabled for a time at any rate. Traffic accumulated rapidly behind us. It seemed likely that we might have to spend the rest of the afternoon in this street that might justly be called straight. But the injured motor car was most courteously backed out of the way to make a passage for us, and we proceeded on our journey, rejoicing and grateful. It would be a stretch of imagination. In fact, it would be what the late Sir William Harcourt once called a good thumping lie, to say that the exit from Cambridge to the eastward has any features of interest, or that the dead level of the Newmarket Road for the first few miles is attractive on a cold and dull day, when Ely, dominating the low-lying plain in decent weather, is not visible to the naked eye. This fen country has its charm of appearance no less than of history. Its history, indeed, is an engineering epic, to which it will be possible to allude, hardly to do justice, at a later point. January the 24th, 1906, was not a day calculated to make the motorist feel in a romantic mood concerning the fens. The road, straight, level, muddy where it was not metalled, metalled where it was not muddy, was lost in grey vapour to the front of us. The prospect on either side was of flat, ploughed land, and of land on which the steaming plough horses were even then at work. There was no distant view at all. Some five or six miles out of Cambridge, the undergraduates alighted to walk home through the mud, and we left them behind with many shoutings of farewell, reflecting to ourselves the while that one of them, who, with the true carelessness of a twentieth-century undergraduate of Cambridge, or, for that matter, of Oxford, was wearing tennis shoes, would find walking in the mud to be one of those carnal pleasures whereof satiety cometh soon rather than late. Soon we passed a church close to the road on the left, a striking structure of brick and stone, and said to be the finest example of decorated architecture in East Anglia. How that can be, having regard to the existence of Ely, and the rhapsodies that are penned concerning its decorated portion, is not for me to say. At any rate, Bottisham Church, commanding the landscape as it can only be commanded in a plain, is a stately and beautiful structure, leaving an abiding impression on the memory. It is, in fact, essentially a motorist church, that is to say, one of which a passing view gives sincere pleasure. The afternoon had advanced more than was desirable. I did not like to ask my kindly charioteer to make a detour for Swaffham, which I then believed to lie on our left. Instead of that, I regaled him with memories of Swaffham, which have their proper place in another chapter. The conversation helped to pass the time. At any rate, it did no harm, and it was only a month or two later, in the Maid's Head at Norwich, that I learned where the real Swaffham was, and that this detour if it had been made, would have shown us nothing but the relics of two churches at Swaffham Prior and another church at Swaffham Bulbeck. Now there is an end of the dead level whereof the most eager of motorists is apt to grow weary, if only because it gives his good car nothing to do. At Bottisham, among the fens, 
in fact but not in their heart the road is but forty-six feet above the sea level at king's lynn but in the course of two miles to streetway surely roman by its name the road rises rapidly and the panhard climbs cheerfully to a height of one hundred and seventy feet an upland having regard to its surroundings on the western side the very air eagerly as it bites the cheeks of those who are forced through it seems more bracing more exhilarating more instinct with life than the stagnant atmosphere of the plain here are wide spaces pines and scotch firs but the spaces are not wild for innumerable whiteboards on posts the marks of galloping grounds tell us that we are on the confines of newmarket heath and near the metropolis of the turf such it has been since the days of charles i and such having regard to the fact that it has been for upwards of a century and a half the headquarters of the jockey club it is likely to remain even though the going be better at newbury and berkshire which is a little nearer to london but we are not at newmarket yet there is the devil's dyke irreverently called the ditch where it bisects the familiar course to be crossed why his satanic majesty should be credited with so many dykes it is not easy to see devil's punch bowls of which there are scores if not hundreds in the kingdom are more natural and rational for a being of satan's traditional environment might reasonably be credited with thirst upon a large scale and with a liking for cold punch equal to that which was all but the temporary ruin of mr pickwick and quite fatal for the time to his young friend upon another memorable drive to ipswich for that was our destination too the devil did not make this dyke running from reach north of the great eastern railway to ditton green near wood ditton that is certain yet nobody knows exactly who the builders were what is known is that it has a rampart on the west side and that the iceni of whom all that is necessary will be told soon held the land to the eastward so far as land was held in those days probably like their successors in the same territory in medieval times during the stuart period and now they had a good conceit of themselves and a robust contempt for their western neighbours and therefore perhaps they built them this rampart and digged this ditch or made their captives dig it for them as a bulwark against the outer world it must be confessed however that thoughts and conversation ran not on the iceni not on the violent deaths which came to most of them eighteen centuries and a half ago but on the death of one man of our time whom newmarket heath had known as a familiar visitor only a few days before sir james miller had died full of racing honours but by no means of years a tribute to the memory of this prince of racing men was surely due most appropriately at newmarket of newmarket the story needs no telling it is not perhaps so long as that of cambridge but probably it is better known to a greater number of persons equally well known are the seats of the mighty in the immediate vicinity but perhaps the traveller through newmarket and to it by road will not only notice the thoroughbreds if there be any on view we naturally saw none late on a winter's afternoon but will not resent the fact that his attention is directed to an interesting feature of newmarket as of other racing and training centres newmarket may be as lord chesterfield said in his will that it was 
an infamous seminary of iniquity and ill manners men may back horses at newmarket may gamble may try every cunning device known to those who have to do with horses not that some of those who are concerned with motors are much better but newmarket in appearance at least is free from that worst of all evils poverty which is rarely absent from agricultural arcadia and as dr jessop has shown very prevalent in east anglia its houses are trim and weatherproof the paint of doors and gates is clearly renewed often the whole place has an air of prosperity which disarms curious investigation into the sources of its wealth the children are rosy and plump and that at any rate is a blessing and save perhaps for backing a horse with judgment now and again which is a great deal less vicious than backing one without knowledge or judgment i dare be sworn that their morality and their standard of life are much higher than those of the arcadian peasant the weak light was growing quite dim as we passed through newmarket and out of cambridgeshire into suffolk out of the shears into east anglia in the narrowest sense of the term our course for bury st edmunds lay along a road of astonishing straightness having many fine oaks and other trees on either side for the matter of levels it was and of course is a series of long ups and downs of no very severe gradients and the going on the newly frozen road left nothing to be desired at kenford according to the ordnance map and the tradition of the antiquaries of yesterday we crossed the icknield or eisenhilled way unfortunately from the point of view of one who would like to conjure up visions of ancient britons neatly painted with woad in summer fur clad in winter sweeping down this road with scythe chariots to meet an invader from the west or to make a raid into the midlands themselves the eisenhilled way has to be numbered among the pretty traditions which cannot be cherished any longer it has been called the war-path of the iceni or a principal roman road ickleton in cambridgeshire icklingham in suffolk Ickleford in Hertfordshire have been imagined to represent points upon its route from Norwich to Berkshire and the west. But probabilities, philology, and charters are separately fatal to the theory, and they are irresistible in combination. Over philology I shall not delay any longer than to say on the best authority that, according to well-known laws if the places now known as icklingham and so on had been called after the iceni they would have been written otherwise than they are again if the way had been the war-path of the iceni it would certainly be more clearly traceable in the east which was theirs than in the west which was not whereas the contrary is the case charters are even far more deadly to this romance than philology and probability referring to the date of the norman conquest and to the eisenhilled way mr haverfield says not till three centuries later do we find its name applied to roads in hertfordshire and cambridgeshire while east of newmarket we never find it at all this is conclusive for it is the considered judgment of a man exceptionally learned and acute upon the subject to which he has devoted most of the leisure of an academical life and so this avenue of romance and to romance is definitely and permanently closed End of chapter one part one
Section two of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter one of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. Winter, Oxford to Cambridge, Newmarket, and Ipswich. Part two. From Kentford to Bury St. Edmunds was a fine but cold switchback run along a very straight road just before lighting up time though it was not dark enough yet to prevent an impression of the landscape from being left on the mind no very great houses were close to the road on either side but the trees on the right were of a remarkable stature and on the left were many belts of scotch firs evenly planted almost like shores in kent which seemed as did many similar belts seen on other tours to indicate the existence of landowners past or present who had prepared the way for the continental method of driving partridges for the first time as our car coursed along with the subdued and yet lively melody of the true panhard hum one began to realise how vast an influence has been exercised over the face of nature in norfolk and suffolk how many new features have been grafted on to that face by men who have made good shooting the principal object of estate management in the part of england better suited to that purpose than to any other arthur young thought it is true of the land between thetford and bury and probably of this land also that it would repay cultivation it lies for some miles over a wild heath overrun with bushes winds and fern the wild luxuriance of whose growth displays evidently enough how greatly it would answer to break it up and convert it into arable farms for a soil that has strength enough to throw up such vigorously growing weeds would if cultivated produce corn in plenty but arthur young as we shall see in a minute or two had no eye for the picturesque he certainly could not have foreseen the present low prices of various grains and still more certainly he could have had no idea of the length to which game preservation would go or of the amount of employment to which it would give rise his advice was followed in a number of cases but it may be suspected that some of the famous warrens of norfolk and suffolk pay better in rabbits for the london market in these days than they would pay under crops soon we glided through the well-paved streets of a handsome little town to quote the words of charles dickens who was impressed as leland had been three centuries before him by the cheerful brightness of bury st edmunds arthur young's editor of seventeen seventy two the author of the farmer's letters i see i have done young himself an injustice tells us that bury is a tolerably well-built town in a dry and healthy situation many of the streets cut each other at right angles but a parcel of dirty thatched houses are found in some of them not far from the centre of the town which has a very bad effect we should probably hold a different view of the thatched houses now and the motorist who passes through bury will certainly desire to know more of it than the author of the farmer's letters deigned to tell i had been to bury before january nineteen o six and i have visited it since though never in such discomfort as the confessor who made the last mile of his pilgrimage to st edmund's shrine unshod yet interesting as bury st edmund's is 
it is not as a pilgrimage to st edmund's shrine that a visit to bury and a fairly long halt there are recommended st edmund is really rather a difficult saint concerning whom to wax rapturous because our certain knowledge of him amounts to very little and yet gives him a date sufficiently modern to make the monkish legends about him even more completely absurd than such legends are wont to be there is no doubt that he was a king of east anglia who was defeated by the danes in 870 a.d hume one of the most matter-of-fact of our historians and surely the most unimaginative man who ever took it upon himself to tell an historical tale says this and no more they broke into east anglia defeated and took prisoner edmund the king of that country whom they afterwards murdered in cool blood this is quoted from the edition of eighteen twenty three containing adam smith's appreciation of his friend written in seventeen seventy six and the author's last corrections and improvements the student's hume of my youth mindful perhaps of the wisdom of appealing to the memory of the young through the imagination gives the date of edmund's defeat as eight seventy one for the sake of variety perhaps and adds that edmund having rejected with scorn and horror a proposal that he should abjure christianity and rule under the danish supremacy the danes bound him naked to a tree scourged and shot at him with arrows and finally beheaded him that is not unlikely a live target was as the scandinavian mythology shows quite to the taste of the northern barbarians king edmund's body may very likely have been as abbo says valet asper hericius ort spinus hurtus carduus in passione similis sebastiano egregio martyri like a rough hedgehog or a thistle bristling with thorns etc there need be no apology for giving the translation which caused a classical schoolmaster some trouble because hericius is not a word used in classical latin that was a martyrdom sufficient to justify canonization an abbey in honour of the martyred king and pilgrimages to his shrine which were undertaken by quite a number of distinguished persons to the great profit of the institution preserving of it but the monkish chroniclers had an unhappy habit of spoiling their stories by excessive and impossible embroidery the romantic inventions that when edmund's followers stole back to the scene of his torture they heard a voice crying here 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 in a wood and there found a wolf guarding the saint's head between its paws and that the head being replaced upon the trunk by human hands was miraculously reunited to it only spoil the story for us of the modern world for 870 a.d is fairly late in the history of england really they suggest the vision of crafty ecclesiastics plotting how most effectively to advertise the shrine for the glory of god of course but also for the profit of the abbey and that to our minds is repellent that the ecclesiastics knew their public is clear however from the results here as at walsingham the wolf legend palpably false as it was passed into ecclesiastical heraldry throughout east anglia as generally as the story probably true of the manner of the martyrdom and east anglian churches have many traces of it in stone and in painted glass 
hence came the illustrious pilgrims and their offerings and hence in some measure at any rate the fact that this little inland city of east anglia played in its time a very important part in the history of england how great that part was it is exceedingly difficult to realize as one stands in the centre of that essentially peaceful town yet it really has a genuine claim to its motto sacrarium regis cunabula legis of the two great meetings of barons and clergy held before king john was forced to sign magna charta one was held in london at st paul's the other in the abbey church of bury st edmunds of all places in england as we should be inclined to add now in truth nothing could be more natural for the venue illustrates not only the paramount influence of ecclesiasticism in those days but also the characteristic tendencies of the east anglian people other ecclesiastical centres of course there were equal in importance and wealth and other mitred abbeys only in london always jealous for its liberties and in east anglia could such meetings have been held with confident assurance of the support of the mass of the inhabitants read the scattered history of eastern england reflect upon the many democratic risings that it witnessed remember the eastern counties association and the almost complete unanimity of east anglia for the parliament against charles then the selection of bury st edmunds for this memorable assembly becomes easily intelligible parliaments were held there sometimes royal visits were frequent in fact this quiet country town was one of the most influential places in the kingdom until the dissolution then it suffered a knock of a king to quote piers ploughman's prophecy concerning the abbey of abingdon and its glory departed for evermore it remains a bright town possessed of a famous old inn the angel and of the ruins of the abbey still of uncommon interest which were laid out as a botanical garden before thomas carlyle wrote past and present they are a garden and a playground still a good deal of imagination is called for before the architectural glories of the abbey can be reconstructed in a mental picture and the best help to be obtained in such an exercise of the imagination comes from reading once again words spoken of the abbey words purporting to have been uttered within what carlyle called its wide internal spaces words conjuring up realities none the less for that they are themselves the product of an inspired imagination need it be said that the reference here is to the second part of shakespeare's king henry the six here suffolk and the queen dropped poison into the king's ears concerning absent gloucester here gloucester pleaded his cause in vain in imperishable lines of despairing resignation and passionate patriotism i know their complot is to have my life and if my death might make this island happy and prove the period of their tyranny i would expend it with all willingness here in some dark recess of a dungeon suffolk's harling villains dispatch the duke here was enacted the grim scene very short but infinitely pathetic wherein suffolk goes to summon his victim to trial knowing him dead already and the queen the very embodiment of cold-blooded hypocrisy cries aloud to the king the cardinal and somerset god forbid any malice should prevail that faultless may condemn a nobleman pray god he may acquit him of suspicion back came suffolk 
trembling and pale for fear of consequences to announce the news that was well known to him for he had made it all too certain before he left the room of state upon his futile errand we can almost hear the dull sound of the swooning king's fall and his agonized lament for in the shade of death i shall find joy in life but double death now gloucester's dead and what comes next surely it is essentially characteristic of the people of east anglia the commons like an angry hive of bees that want their leader scatter up and down here again the substratum of authentic fact is as in the case of st edmund made the foundation of an imaginative structure but see how vast is the difference between the effects produced by the paltry monkish embroiderer and the poet the maker the creator the first tale almost raises a smile of incredulity the second written in characters of blood and tears stirs the heart to its depths berry has its lighter memories and associations too many good englishmen who would not step far out of their way to make a pilgrimage to what was once an edmund shrine who might even feel that the second part of king henry the sixth was a little above their heads may be relied upon to take a great deal of trouble for the sake of treading in the footsteps of the immortal mr pickwick it was at the angel in bury st edmunds still a large inn standing in a wide open street and nearly facing the old abbey that mr pickwick enjoyed a very satisfactory dinner this was as we shall have occasion to see at ipswich high praise indeed when uttered by the author of mr pickwick's being who if displeased by the accommodation and fare offered to him did not hesitate to express his opinion with remarkable force of language in the tap-room of the said angel mr weller having been voted into the chair cracked such jests and evoked such uproarious laughter that his master's rest was broken the pump in the angel yard called sam's throbbing head next morning so effectually that shortly afterwards he was able to describe the stranger in the mulberry suit stranger as he deemed him as looking as convivial as a live trout in a lime basket in the adjoining tap again sam the names of vella and gammon having come into contact for the one and only time in that voracious history cemented his alliance with the deceitful job trotter over gin and cloves he took the doubtless fragrant and pungent beverage as a pick-me-up in the morning it might have served us perhaps well as a warmth restorer in the afternoon but candor compels the confession that for the moment we forgot the pickwick papers drew up in front of the suffolk not the angel and did our best to restore heat to our chilled bodies by gargantuan consumption of crumpets tea and jam even this was mildly pickwickian who can forget the story of the gentleman who demonstrated by devoted self-slaughter the proposition that crumpets is wholesome but as we did not drink gin and cloves in honour of sam weller so we did not blow out our brains to prove the wholesome character of crumpets yet one more pickwickian association of bury st edmunds must be set down in a private room of the angel the artful mr trotter having gammoned sam proceeded to gammon his innocent master also with the story of the large old red brick house just outside the town sir 
and the pretended revelation of his own master's nefarious intentions hence came kindly mr pickwick's ludicrously pathetic vigil in the garden alarm of maids hysterics of miss smithers drenching of mr pickwick doubts whether he was burglar or lunatic imprisonment in the clothes closet rescue and explanation by mr wardle rheumatics of mr pickwick and last of all the parish clerk's tale these things are not history of course which there never wore no sich a person as mr pickwick but they are imperishable and essential truths none the less and the pickwick papers are a possession of bury st edmunds at least equal in commercial value to all the legends of st edmund king and martyr so much for bury on this occasion we shall see it again and foregather this time at the angel we left the hotel to find cold and windless darkness in full possession it was my first experience of driving in a motor-car on a dark night for any considerable distance through an unknown country the first few miles through Bayton and Woolpit were very difficult the road sinuous as a corkscrew the necessity for dismounting to study the signpost constantly occurring in marked contrast however to experience in some of our southern counties was the alert intelligence of the country folk from stowmarket the road to ipswich our destination was straight but seemed endless at first we tried to proceed with oil lamps only then we were driven to acetylene but with air none too clear at any time and wreaths of denser mist now and again even the acetylene rays did not penetrate very far on the whole cold apart this kind of driving at night is not to be recommended i remember nothing of that journey to ipswich except the cold and the mild excitement of trying to guess the species of the splendid trees passed by their shadowy forms and general character oaks i saw and elms and beeches for certain for the form of these may not easily be mistaken in the matter of ashes i would not like to pledge my faith for one might easily mix up an ash tree in winter half seen by a light not thrown distinctly upon it with some other tree but the best thing i remember of that night out of doors was the sight of the lights of ipswich and of the tall tram cars which told us that we were there at last neither fate nor inclination has taken me down this same road by daylight since then but something may be said of the places passed in the darkness with due acknowledgment of the aid afforded by mr w a dutz suffolk in the little guide series by methuen the acknowledgment is made the more gladly and the aid is borrowed with the more confidence that it will not prove a broken reed because in another place and at another time i have had the privilege of knowing mr dutt in manuscript as a careful and fascinating writer equally learned in antiquities and in ornithology and very much at home in east anglia had it been light we might have seen at tostock a fine church perpendicular in the main but with an early decorated chancel as motorists however we should hardly have been induced to descend and explore the interior even by the hope of seeing carved oak benches one of them showing the fabulous cockatrice and another the unicorn scratching himself with his horn at Woolpit, we might have seen a new tower to an old church, the tower built no later than 1854. 
but the tower is no outrage for it had to be built to replace an older one destroyed by lightning to woolpit too belongs one of william of newborough's strange legends thus summarized by mr dutt one day while some men were at work in a harvest field here they saw a boy and a girl whose bodies were green and their dresses of a strange material appear out of the pits known as the wolf pits they said they had come from a christian land which had churches but where there was no sun only a faint twilight but beyond a broad river there lay a land of light their country was called the land of st martin and one day while they were tending their father's sheep they heard a noise like the ringing of the bells of bury abbey and all at once they found themselves among the reapers in the harvest field at woolpit the boy we are told soon died but the girl lived to marry a man of lynn the name of the place in doomsday is wolf petter which is simply wolf pit but why this particular wolf pit out of the hundreds that there must have been retained the name there is nothing to show at hawley moved to a light by some of the guide-books in the hope of finding ruins we should have discovered a mound only its origin quite uncertain and at stowmarket there would have been no temptation to halt chemicals and cordite combined to give the ancient market town some prosperity some calamities and no beauty here we began to follow the course of the railway and the river gipping the eponymous river of ipswich until it is named anew at great blakenham we passed a manor given by henry the sixth to eton college and at claydon an elizabethan hall but sad truth to tell we were in the mood of gallio that evening so far as these things were concerned and the vision of the lights of ipswich was unmixed pleasure it was generally admitted that the last eight miles into the ancient city from the point at which a native stated that they begun must have been measured with a very elastic chain nor was entry into ipswich easy he who held the steering wheel was one who for combined nicety courage and consideration in slipping through traffic has few equals in this country but his task was of more than common difficulty the streets of ipswich or most of them are of an exceeding narrowness the electric tram cars glide through them swift monumental irresistible in their usual juggernaut mood hardly anywhere is there room for a vehicle to be drawn up to the curb on the inside of the tramway lines we indeed were not suffered by the police to draw up in front of the great white horse at all even for the purpose of dismounting but were motioned to a side street moreover although the immediately local election was over the streets were grievously crowded for some reason or other and surely there was never seen a population more serenely indifferent to the blast of a motor-horn they were perhaps inured to peril by the tram-cars swifter in towns than any motor-car would dare to be heavier by a long way and exceptionally dangerous by reason of the length and height of the moving veil they draw across the view at any rate they would not move out of the way arriving we were in a far more appreciative mood than that of mr charles dickens when he became a guest at the great white horse and wrote the account of mr pickwick's arrival on the coach of the elder weller 
we found no labyrinths of uncarpeted passages, no mouldy, ill-lighted rooms, no small dens for sleeping in, but rather a kindly welcome and attention, distinctly good rooms, a dining room having plenty of space, fire and abundant cheer, and a reasonably moderate bill to discharge at the end of our stay. Yet, I doubt not, that the edifice, built round a cobbled courtyard that is roofed over, the bar parlour on the far side of the yard from the door, where a good many of the citizens congregate of an evening, the office window at which mine hostess receives her guests, are precisely the same as when Boz visited Ipswich. In this view I differ from Mr. Dutt, but the probability is that the alterations to which he refers were made before, not after, Dickens saw the house. Dickens did not like the place at all, that is clear. If there be doubts whether Ipswich was the original of Eatonswell, as Mr. Percy Fitzgerald suggests, there are none about the Great White Horse, which is, of course, mentioned and abused from floor to garret, nay, from cellar to garret. For is not the worst possible port mentioned by name? We found things otherwise, but then it was not the misfortune of any of us to look out of bed and see a middle-aged lady in yellow curl papers busily engaged in brushing what ladies call their back hair. It would be easy enough to miss the way in the recesses of the great white horse. In fact, to be frank, I did so myself, although I neither entered the wrong room nor got into the wrong bed but the censure of Dickens generally has no reference to the present state of affairs at this classic hostelry. Nay, more, such is the irony of fate, the bad name given by Dickens to this house is now its chiefest recommendation. Prints of Leech's pictures adorn every wall, and the telegraphic address of the hotel is Pickwick, Ipswich. Thus has railing been converted into blessing. Thus it has proved more profitable to be abused by a great writer than to remain uncensured and ignored. Perhaps Mr. Percy Fitzgerald could oblige, as the saying goes, by explaining what the real meaning of his hero's attitude was. It must have had some deeper source than a stuffy bedroom, and a bad dinner, or else the essential kindliness of the Dickensian attitude towards everything except cruelty and injustice must be cast aside as an exploded belief. Certainly no public writer would dare to write in 1906 of any hotel as Dickens wrote of the Great White Horse in the thirties of the last century and perhaps that is not entirely to be regretted, for hotel keepers really are our fellow creatures, unwilling as some advocates of the temperance cause may be to admit the truth. By the way, why is the Great White Horse an hotel sign in East Anglia? Not that I can endorse the description of it as a stone statue of some rampacious animal, with flowing mane and tail, distantly resembling an insane cart-horse. It seems to me quite reasonably like to a Suffolk punch, except in colour. And one finds Phidias never, although a Pelez sometimes, over indoors. But why a white horse? One expects such signs in the parts about Berkshire, where the classic vale is named after the gigantic symbol on the northward side of the Downs, of which a simple explanation has become impossible, 
owing to the tiresome growth of knowledge but why despising all commonplace explanations have we encountered a white horse in suffolk well one of the many explanations of the white horse par excellence is that it was taken from the horse delineated on philip's stator which was copied a good deal in britain and an explanation of the white horse i beg its pardon the great white horse of ipswich may be that it had its origin in the horse figured on some of the icenian coins that have been discovered in east anglia or again it may be simply a survival of the ancient saxon totem such desultory speculation as this may serve to soothe the mind of an evening at ipswich not that after motoring all day the mind needs much soothing but i would counsel all male motorists to burn their last incense of tobacco as my friend and i did in the warm bar parlour on the side of the courtyard over against the main door for thus shall they see the native of ipswich in his natural state the discovery of this amazing england as mr kipling has said well is the main joy of motoring still in the evening one may do much worse things than pursue the proper study of mankind in easy-going mood and a provincial bar parlour is not a bad place in which to do it to ipswich i have been more than once since that night of freezing cold in january and to bury st edmunds also and more features of both will find a place in later narratives but of each there are a few practical things to be said which must not be delayed on a second visit to bury made in the course of the most troubled and delightful tour of my existence so far i lay at the ancient angel with mighty satisfaction and to the remarkably small minishing of my store of sovereigns on a second visit to ipswich i was hospitably entertained by a local gentleman at the crown and anchor because he thought it was the best hotel in ipswich and behold the fare was very good by the same gentleman i was introduced to oysters in a little shop near the butter market the best i ever ate and to handmade gloves in a little shop hard by which we have motored many a merry mile since then there need be no hesitation in advertising them they are made by a widow and her daughter out of soft and strong cape leather and with them it is to be feared the industry will die since apprentices will not come to them in these degenerate days since then i have exhibited these gloves during the scottish reliability trials to a casual acquaintance and her criticism although strictly irrelevant was too witty to be omitted hmm they look as though you had made them yourself ipswich gloves then are not for the dandy but for the motorist they are hard to beat End of chapter 1, part 2「3 Through East Anglia in a Motor Car」by J. E. Vincent This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent winter ipswich to norwich via woodbridge beckles lowestoft and yarmouth part one practical observations roads fair to blytheborough poor thence to beckles fair for rest of journey hill 
a sharp ascent on leaving Ipswich. Distances Ipswich to Woodbridge, eight miles. Woodbridge to Wickham Market, four and three quarter miles. Wickham Market to Saxmundham, eight miles. Detour to Oldborough recommended. Turn to right at Farnham, two miles short of Saxmundham. To Oldborough, seven miles. Rejoin Blytheborough Road at Yoxford. Yoxford from Oldborough, nine miles. From Saxmundham, three and a half miles. Saxmundham to Yoxford, three and a half miles. Yoxford via Darsham to Blytheborough, three and three quarter miles. Detour to Southwold, six miles advised. Return same route of going to Beckles or by Raiden, Wankford and Blyford, and then to Beckles Road, thus adding four and a quarter miles in all. Blytheborough to Beckles, nine miles. Beckles to Lowestoft, ten miles. Lowestoft to Great Yarmouth, ten miles. Great Yarmouth to Norwich, direct route, nine and a half miles. Truth to tell, Ipswich on the Gipping, which becomes the Orwell and an estuary lower down, seemed to me then an ancient city showing, except in a few picturesque houses and the gateway of Wolsey's College, few signs of antiquity. If it cannot be called happy in having had no history, for it was plundered by the Danes in 991, it has had little cause for unhappiness of that kind since the conquest. It has produced no really famous man except Wolsey, though Gainsborough lived in it for some years, and its churches, although not quite devoid of interest, are not striking enough to delay a motorist. Note in passing, not the least advantage of an exploring tour by motor. You need neither spend time in examining that, which is barely worth the process, on the ground that there is nothing else to be done, nor hurry away from that which is interesting, in order to catch a train. But staying so long as seems pleasant and no longer, you may be transported when you please, rapidly and pleasantly, to scenes you have reason to believe are to be worthy of your regard. In these circumstances, after an admiring glance at the famous Sparrow's house in the butter market close to the hotel, I frankly betook myself to an effort to follow the Wellers, father and son, Mr. Pickwick and his followers, through an eventful day. This stable yard round the corner to the left, where the panhard was now being furbished up, was the same on which Mr. Weller, senior, looked when, in a small room in the vicinity, he discussed a pot of ale and the gammoning of Sam, and drank to the toast, May you soon vipe off the disgrace as you've inflicted on the family name. The office in the courtyard was doubtless that at which he got his vey bill. Walking about these very streets, Sam wormed himself into the confidence of the lachrymose Job Trotter. In this inn parlour, Mr. Peter Magnus, alias Jingle, splendidly attired, made a hollow pretense of breakfasting with Mr. Pickwick. Here the latter gave his simple hints on courtship and proposal. And here was seen the joyous face of Mr. Tupman, the serene countenance of Mr. Winkle, and the intellectual lineaments of Mr. Snodgrass. In this room was enacted that memorable scene when Mr. Magnus presented Miss Witherfield to Mr. Pickwick, and Miss Witherfield screamed but neither she nor Mr. Pickwick was indelicate enough to mention the cause, his unwitting invasion of her chamber overnight. Rushing out of this room, the lady, 
after bolting herself into her bedroom, went forth in search of Mr. Nupkins, and appraised him of the forthcoming duel, which there was not really much reason to anticipate. Where exactly Miss Witherfield saw Mr. Nupkins, I am unhappily not able to say, nor yet, and for the same reason, with a grummer, with his Myrmidon doubly and his division, each with a short truncheon and a brass crown, conducted Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Tupman in the old sedan chair. But for all that, it is easy to picture the whole of the never-to-be-forgotten scene, all the more memorable in that it never was enacted. In fact, it is no mean regret to me that, on that cold January morning, I was not able to find the house with the green gate, with the house door guarded on either side by an American alo in a tub. It has eluded me since also. Perhaps it is gone, like a good deal of old Ipswich. Possibly some miscreant has had his gate painted white instead of green. Perhaps I looked in the wrong place, in the vicinity of St. Clement's Church. It is even within the bounds of possibility that the house with the green gate never had any more real and substantial existence than Mr. Pickwick himself. All I know is that I could not find it. At noon, or thereabouts, time does not worry one in a motor car, unless one is seeking records. We boarded the Panhard, now bright as a Birmingham button, and started off up a long and trying hill, in cold, dry and windless weather, for a circuitous drive, its sinuosities determined by the desires of my friend. A new member was added to the party, in the person of a resident at Norwich, desirous of reaching that ancient city in due course, who was supposed to know, and probably did know, every considerable turning of every high road in the two counties of Norfolk and Suffolk. He had not, however, enjoyed much experience as the pilot of an automobile, and he found, as I had in years gone by, when I was new to the pastime, that I and memory were not equal to moving together at a speed proportioned to that of the car. Which road? the charioteer would cry. The new passenger was riding astern, when we were from fifty to seventy yards from a fork or a turn, and hesitation would often be visible in the reply, so that it was necessary to slow down and sometimes having invaded the wrong road, to back out again. This is not a criticism. It is rather matter of observation and experience. Only recently have the minds of driving and driven men been called upon to exercise their judgment to choose a line, as a fox-hunter might say, while they are being carried through space much more rapidly than of yore and the pace puzzles them at first. You are past a familiar turning in a car in less time than is consumed over approaching it in a dog-cart or on horseback, and the aspect of the turning itself has something strange about it. But you grow accustomed to the new conditions with experience. In fact, motor-cars sharpen the perceptions and spur the intelligence. To venture an audacious travesty, and some even more hardy doggerel, Urgendi, didicise, fidelita, artem, execuit, mentum, ne, sinet, esse, pegram, meaning, he who has learned a car to drive, sharpens his wits, and looks alive. Personally, I sat alongside the driver, a place of honour, if cold, and the mechanic sat at my feet. 
pity is wasted on a mechanic so placed at any time for he likes the position and it is not so comfortless as it looks by a long way experto crede in any case our ex-soldier was a proud man that morning for his car was a joy to the eye the day before owner and mechanic were hustings worn the car looked battered and dissipated as well as fog dimmed now the brass shone with a glow that would have satisfied the proud commander of a man of war who is the most exacting person living if that mechanic had read the greek tragedians he would have known that nemesis must needs come soon brass glittered varnish shone all four cylinders worked nobly but the engine would race from time to time it became all too clear to him who had the control of the machine or desired to have it that he had it not in entirety since the clutch kept slipping hence came power wasted miles per hour lost and a definite feeling of discontent in the owner so after a hill or two had been climbed without satisfaction a halt was called on the level the mechanic did not like it a bit and he had our sympathy he had worked hard he had turned out the car with a creditable appearance it was crushing to be found out in a single fault i knew his feelings from experience to be blamed when you thoroughly deserve it is tolerable to be blamed for no fault at all is to find consolation in private reflection upon the folly of him or her who administers reproof to discover that one essential point has been forgotten when you have tried hard to remember everything is to be compelled to recognize that after every willing effort you only look a fool after all the mechanic had our sympathy on another ground too he vowed of course that the clutch could not be made tighter he declared that if it were the consequences would be disastrous for you shall note that your mechanic dearly loves a bitter play in fittings and abhors a nut screwed quite home all these things were clear to us but we were none the less inexorable as in starting on a heavy job in carpenter's work minutes spent in putting a keen edge on to a plane and chisel are hours saved in the end so it is sheer idiocy to muddle on with a motor car if at the beginning of the journey you are aware of something wrong that is capable of being set right on the road it is indeed in detecting the first premonitory evidence of trouble and in meeting difficulties more than half way that the genius of an inspired driver is shown this little weakness of mechanics for a bit o' play is also worth remembering so we were sorry for the mechanic but the thing had got to be done whether he liked or no and for half an hour he lay on his back under the car straining grunting otherwise eloquently silent while black and viscous oil made a little pool on the road alongside of his honest head and while we pacing up and down the frozen road forbore even to remind him that if the road had been muddy his fate would have been worse in cases where an angel would lose his temper under the gentlest persiflage it is only decent to leave a willing but disappointed man to himself the half hour ended the job was done overdone a little as the mechanic well knew yet not so much overdone but that a driver of rare skill could disappoint him by ignoring the inconvenience and we took our seats again the car sprang forward like a living creature 
moving fast and smoothly. There was all the difference in the world between the motion as it was and the motion as it had been, and the chagrin of the mechanic yielded to time and to the proud feeling that all was right with his car through his handiwork. Sooth to say, the scenery was not interesting on a frosty and somewhat misty day. The route was, to start with, via Woodbridge, Wickham Market, and Stratford St Andrew to Saxmundham. That is to say, the road runs along the brow, the very much wrinkled brow of the upland, which is high by comparison with the lowland, extending a long way in from the coast, running from Felixstowe to Oldborough and beyond. Of that lowland we could see nothing. Woodbridge, appearing to consist of one street, long, straggling and narrow, was the first village of any consideration through which we passed. Its chief claim to fame is that Edward Fitzgerald wrote letters at it, remarking in one, dated 1855, that Woodbridge had not reached 1842 yet. But we shall see Woodbridge again. Next came Wickham Market, narrow, straggling and long. It is quite commonplace. From Wickham Market we went on to Saxmundham, and there committed a grave error. Hot dinner, it was stated, was due in three quarters of an hour, but it could be hurried forward if we wished. We wished accordingly, and wished afterwards that we had not, for the meat, some forgotten joint half-boiled, was in a state in which, according to the traveller Bruce, the Abyssinians eat their meat from choice, and the accompanying parsnips, quite hard, may have been fit to place before sheep. As we were neither Abyssinians nor sheep, but English travellers, the error was felt the more acutely, because we had ourselves only to blame. Given the same conditions another time, I should urge a detour to Oldborough, a detour of some six miles, to be begun about two miles short of Saxmundham, for Oldborough is worth seeing, and man can feed there. Of Oldborough, an observation or two may be made on the basis of a sojourn a few years since. It is certainly one of the most bracing places in this world. It has a tolerable hotel, good golf links, and a fine view of the sea, and the ancient moot house is picturesque. The abiding impression left by Oldborough is simply that it is the oddest place ever seen. The little river Old, starting somewhere near Saxmundham, follows a more or less southerly course for a couple of miles, then an even smaller river joins it, and, flowing eastward for a mile or so, the combined streams seem to be heading for the sea, distant about six miles. But it takes them fifteen miles, even with the help of another so-called river, purposeless as themselves, to reach the sea. For first, they are lost in a McCranking mere of sluggish water, which actually approaches within a hundred yards of the sea at Oldborough, where it is stopped by a stony bank. The mere continues, and the rivers are merged in it, parallel to high water mark, divided from it sometimes by a hundred yards or so, sometimes by half a mile, for nine miles from the point of turning, and soon the water is dubbed River Oar in the map. By this time it is meandering, mainly under the influence of the tide, most likely, behind and to the west of Orford Ness, and it is not until somewhere about the middle of Halsey Bay that this utter absurdity of a river this monstrous estuary for three trifling streams 
finds its way into the sea. A year or two ago, the good folks of Oldborough celebrated their native poet, George Crabbe, though why they chose the date, seeing that Crabbe was born in 1754 and died in 1832, it is not quite easy to see. The celebration, indeed, was like the use made of Pickwick by the hotel at Ipswich, an example of the truth that a community or an individual having a mind for advertisement will not be stopped by petty considerations of pride. George Crabb was born at Oldborough, through no fault of his own. He left it in 1768 to be apprenticed to a surgeon at Bury St Edmunds. He came back to it to practice as a surgeon and failed miserably as a medical man because his mind was on the making of verses all the time. Then he tried his fortune in London and beat despairingly on the doors of fame until Burke introduced him to Dodsley who brought out the library with some success in 1781. At about the same time Dr. Johnson expressed a high opinion of his verse. Next, he was ordained, and took up his residence as curate at Oldborough, but he left it soon to become domestic chaplain to the Duke of Rutland, and he does not seem to have had much, if anything, to do with his native place during his subsequent career as prosperous poet and comfortable clergyman. He was a distinctly sound poet, with a queer vein of humour, although his admirer, Edward Fitzgerald, whom we meet today, valued him perhaps too highly, and Byron, probably for his own purposes, overpraised him in the words, Nature's sternest painter, but her best. Crabbe hated Oldborough, or Oldborough scenery at any rate, or, if he did not hate them, he took the stern view of them. Lo, where the heath with withering brake grown o'er, Lends the light turf that warms the neighbouring poor. From thence a length of burning sand appears, Where the thin harvest waves its withered ears. Rank weeds that every art and care defy, Rain o'er the land and rob the blighted rye. Thus does he describe the vicinity, and thus the so-called river and its marge. Here samphire banks and saltworth bind the flood, and stakes and seaweed withering in the mud, and higher up a ridge of all things base, which some strong tide has rolled upon the place. No, assuredly Crabbe had no liking for Oldborough, and to be perfectly candid, I agree with him that, save for golfers, it is a dreary and eye-afflicting place. In this view, I confess to have believed myself to be singular, and, for expressing it, have incurred scorn more than once. So Crabbe is quoted in confirmation, yet with the hope that those who visit Oldborough may agree with the general view, and not with that of a minority of two, one of them something better than a minor poet. Be it added, in justice to Oldborough, that you can look for amber among the pebbles on the beach, so you can anywhere, and find as much as I did. From Saxmundham we laid a course due north for Yoxford. Peasenhall, of murderous fame, lies some three miles to the west, and pass by way of Darsham to Blytheborough. Here, in a village named in the Doomsday, is a really striking 15th century church, in good perpendicular and with splendid clerestory, plainly visible from the road. And we are not far from Southwold, now known of many as a summer resort, whereas in days not long past it was visited by few persons, 
save those who knew of the existence of St Edmund's Church, with its really majestic tower and rare rood loft. Here, by the way, is buried Agnes Strickland, the historian. The very slight inward curve of the coastline here is dignified with the name of a bay, and as Sol Bay, which is simply Southwold Bay spoken short, it has a considerable place in history. On the 28th of May, 1672, the combined fleets lay at Sol Bay in a very negligent posture. They were the fleets of England under the command of the duke of york with lord sandwich under him and of france and here de reuter the greater sea captain of his age took his royal adversary quite by surprise this was due not so much to the dashing merit of de reuter as to the crass carelessness of the duke for sandwich being an experienced officer had given the duke warning of the danger but received they said such an answer as intimated that there was more of caution than of courage in his apprehensions what hasty words i wonder of the rude and haughty admiral were represented by this sonorous periphrasis de reuter came with ninety-one ships of war and forty-four fireships sailing in quest of the english and sandwich after giving the warning in vain saved the day by a display of gallantry to be ranked as extraordinary even in the annals of the english navy sailing out to meet the dutchman he engaged him at once and gave time to the duke and the french admiral he killed van ghent a dutch admiral and beat off his ship he sunk another ship which ventured to lay him aboard he sunk three fireships which endeavoured to grapple with him and though his vessel was torn to pieces with shot and of a thousand men she contained near six hundred were laid dead upon the deck he continued still to thunder with all his artillery in the midst of the enemy but another fireship more fortunate than the preceding having laid hold of his vessel her destruction was now inevitable warned by sir edward haddock his captain he refused to make his escape and bravely embraced death as a shelter from that ignominy which a rash expression of the duke's he thought had thrown upon him admiral and flag captain in fact perished when the fire reached the magazine and this time at any rate the price of admiralty was paid in full the english claimed a victory and embalmed it in a ballad although the truth was that the duke's fleet was too much shattered for pursuit and the french fleet under secret orders perhaps from louis the fourteenth did next to nothing the dutch probably claimed one also although the battle ended the hopes with which de reuter's expedition started all that matters nothing now the moment that heartens a man is that at which he stands on this low-lying shore as spectators stood all the long day in may sixteen seventy two and remembers the gallant fight and the glorious death of sandwich sir isaac newton is also said to have heard it the firing at cambridge so writes the accomplished author of murray's guide in eighteen seventy five and there is nothing incredible in the suggestion the distance is but seventy miles roughly the cannon of old time with their black powder made a terrible sound acoustics are full of mystery and the noise of the big guns at portsmouth is often heard in the heart of the berkshire downs from euston to the centre of sole bay is about half the distance over which sound is said to have reached newton and it is on record 
that lord ossory then a guest of the duke of grafton heard the guns and rode halfway across east anglia to witness the battle surely it was a majestic and awe-inspiring spectacle for those on the shore and surely it is worth while to reconstruct it now in imagination from blytheborough we went along a road of poor surface and of no scenic attraction in winter save that the trees were fine to beckles one of the three principal towns of suffolk possessed i was content to believe of a grand church and boasting a view over the marshes of the waveney once navigable but we saw little of beckles the name of which reminded edward fitzgerald of hooks and eyes we were indeed quite glad to leave it after penetrating a quarter suggestive of a new and prosperous midland town for election fever was running high and car and its occupants were cheered or hooted by eager crowds cheered most perhaps for the crowds were mostly red and the connemara cloak seemed to express a sympathy which in truth was not felt we had all had enough electioneering and to spare and were glad to turn our faces for lowestoft as will be seen later beckles made a far more pleasant impression on a subsequent visit at lowestoft too it is a short and easy run election fever was running high and the political excitement of a seething mob does not make for an individual appreciation of the picturesque but old lowestoft is picturesque hanging as it were over the sea and south lowestoft has a peculiar origin worth knowing among the pleasant enterprises incident to the writing of this book has been the making of notes from norfolk and norwich notes and queries reprinted from the norfolk chronicle to which i have added in my notebook o c sic omnes would indeed that all county papers laid themselves out as this one does to collect notes from those interested in the antiquities of their county here as to lowestoft are found two notes one entertaining and suggestive the other distinctly taking it appears that in fifteen fifty eight one thomas north published a fantastic explanation of the origin of herring curing in which lowestoft has always rivalled yarmouth without giving it in detail it may be stated that in essential spirit if on a different topic it exactly anticipates charles lamb's divine theory of roast pig but thomas north has none of that grace of expression which compels quotation when one encounters lamb and one only regrets that lamb did not think of describing the origin of herring curing as well as of roast pork end of chapter two part one Section 4 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. Winter, Ipswich to Norwich, via Woodbridge, Beckles, Lowestoft, and Yarmouth. Part 2 the second lowestoft note deserves a paragraph to itself for it is full of moral lessons and a curious illustration of the way in which the overweening ambition of one community and the churlishness of a second has ended in loss to the first and in the profit of a third community to the prejudice of the second in the records of st peter's church at norwich 
St. Peter's per Mounter Gate, if memory serves accurately, which is St. Peter's per Mentor's Gate, or Taylor's Street, is an entry of the 27th of March, 1814. Ringing the bells for Norwich, a port, ten shillings and sixpence. Early in the last century, it appears, Norwich was a very important centre of the wool trade. Now Norwich thrives on mustard and boots, but let that pass. At the time in question, wool was the staple trade, and it was exported by way of Yarmouth. In 1812 or thereabouts, like Manchester later, Norwich determined, if possible, to have direct communication with the sea. Enterprising men consulted William Cubitt, afterwards Sir William Cubitt, and a very distinguished engineer in matters relating to canals and docks. They probably consulted him mainly because he was a Norfolk man, for he was not yet thirty years old, and his fame, which was to be considerable, was yet to come. They sought the advice also of that consummate Scottish engineer, Thomas Telford, then well advanced in middle age, and almost at the pinnacle of his fame. Alternative routes for the proposed canal were suggested, one by way of Yarmouth, the other by way of Lowestoft. Yarmouth, its safe trade threatened, opposed from the beginning, and eventually the Lowestoft route was adopted. The mouth of Lowestoft Harbour was cleared from the sands that blocked it. A cut was made, connecting it with the Waveney through Alton Broad, another cut from Haddisco to Reedham, and in 1814 the bells rang gaily to celebrate Norwich a port. For Norwich it was a short-lived triumph, since the scheme did not pay its way, and in 1844 it was practically, possibly indeed formally, bankrupt. At any rate, the Lowestoft part of the works was bought outright by Sir Samuel Pito, who, in that year, but whether before he acquired the harbour or not, I cannot say, bought some Leighton hard by, sometime the seat of the Fitz Osberts and the Jernigans, from Lord Sidney Godolphin Osborne. Sic vos, non vobis. The Norwich folk lost their money, or some of it, Sir Samuel Pito took Lowestoft in hand, developed it, as the saying goes, so that South Lowestoft became a flourishing seaside place, and finally Lowestoft as a port became a serious rival to Yarmouth. As a seaside place, Lowestoft is pleasing to some taste now, even as it was in the days when Edward Fitzgerald would betake himself thither from Woodbridge to spend his days in sailing and in writing letters, which are a treasure to posterity, and his evenings in reading Shakespeare or Don Quixote with his close friends, Cowell and Aldous Wright, who often lodged at Lowestoft for a short time in summer it would have been good to have their opinion upon the derivation of Lowestoft, appearing in Doomsday as Lothu Wistoft, which is said to be the enclosure by the water of Loth, who, in his turn, is said to have been a Norse invader, but nothing is to be discovered of Loth or Lu, save that Lake Loathing, now the inner harbour, is named after him, as was the hundred of Loathing Land, or Ludinga Land, and Edward Fitzgerald is really much more interesting than a nebulous Norse pirate. Election fever and its ravings, a short glance at picturesque features, 
and the inestimable blessings of tea and warmth are the principal memories left by this particular visit to Lowestoft. Thence we ran along the easy coast road in the darkness to Great Yarmouth, which, on this occasion, left no vivid impression on the memory. No such language, however, can be employed with regard to the remainder of that evening's drive. Doubts had arisen whether it would be wiser to make for Norwich by the more circuitous route which fetches a compass round Caister Castle, or by the new road running in a direct line for Acle first, across a salt marsh, and from Acle fairly straight for Norwich. The new road was much the shorter, and, being across a salt marsh, a dead level. But our local pilot was doubtful as to the state of its surface. However, it was decided to make inquiry at the toll gate, a mile or so out of Yarmouth, and to abide by the answer, which was satisfactory. So was the road so far as its surface went. It ran first for five miles straight as an arrow. The straightness was apparent at the time, but the five miles seemed like twenty. A fine mist was frozen over the watery land. Nothing was visible on one side except, at stated intervals, a towering telegraph pole, and on both sides, at shorter intervals, were puny and poor trees, which may have been poplars or willows. It became my duty, seated beside the man at the wheel, to peer into the darkness, trying to distinguish any possible obstacle or turn, to make out the character of any light that might be seen, and to watch for the bend, which, after another straight run of some three miles, would take us to Acle. As a rule, I could just see the outline of one telegraph post as we passed its predecessor. There was, in all probability, a deep dyke on either side, and it was an ideal night for running into a country vehicle travelling without a tail light. But happily, we encountered none. Indeed, Although motorists complain much, late years have seen a great improvement in this respect. Of lights on approaching vehicles, we saw one or two, appearing at first to be distant and stationary as a planet on a clear night, and then to be close to us in an instant. It was, in short, a trying experience to the nerves and to the eyes, and we resolved to avoid night journeys as much as might be in the future. The resolution was renewed when we looked at our strained and bloodshot eyes the next morning, and broken perforce the next evening. But night travelling by motor car in winter is not to be recommended unless the moon is strong. It is a process to be resolved upon when circumstances suit, not to be planned in advance. From Acle to Norwich was ten miles, more or less, of up and down travelling. The hills not serious enough to try a good motor high, and it was an unfeigned relief to reach the shelter and food of the Royal Hotel. Here, practically, ends the account of the second day of this excursion for the Royal Hotel is comfortable, not expensive as English hotels go, and new. But mere comfort is fortunately commonplace. Its novelty is more of an outrage than usual in this case, and the novelty of the hotel's name is an offence not to be pardoned. Here, where the modern Royal stands, in the very centre of the city, stood the famous angel from the 15th century at least to the middle of the 19th. Local antiquaries, many and eager, 
rejoice in tracing the history of this celebrated hostelry finding frequent allusions to it in the records of the master of the revels for here mountebanks performed and theatrical performances were given and strange monsters were shown it had the glory of paying one hundred and fifteen pounds tax for thirty windows in the eighteenth century this makes one understand the block windows in old houses more sympathetically than a bare mention of window tax does and it was the great whig house in the days when norfolk elections were as mr walter rye tells us half of the history of norfolk the other half being concerned with trade it is true that mr walter rye speaking of the election of sixteen seventy five says that sir neville catton's party used the royal then called the king's head and the other side using a stratagem singularly enough repeated at the same house last election two or three years ago ordered a great dinner there on the pretence that they might friendly meet and dine with the other party and ultimately secured the whole house as their election quarters catton who was brought into town by four thousand horsemen having to put up with the white swan at the back side of the butcher's shambles a history of norfolk by walter rye elliot stock eighteen eighty five i prefer to pin my faith to norfolk and norwich notes and queries not only because its elaborate article on the topic is evidently based on careful research but also because its statements are not contradicted in subsequent issues and these bear eloquent testimony to the fact that the local antiquaries of east anglia have at least one trait in common with the antiquaries of the wider world they contradict with freedom and dispute with endless pertinacity here there is no contradiction and mr rye's accuracy is by no means equal to his industry or to his love of antiquity so it may be taken as reasonably certain that the royal is on the site of the angel and that the angel first appeared by that name in fifteen seventy eight when it was leased to one peterson but the property has been traced back to mistress catherine dis in the rolls of the mayoralty court of norwich and she lived early in the fifteenth century here in october sixteen seventy seven joseph argent had fourteen days allowed to him to make show of such tricks as are mentioned in his patent at the angel in sixteen eighty three robert austin at the angel hath leave given him for a week from this day to make show of the story of edward the fourth and jane shore and no longer in several later years peter dolman clearly made a great success with punchinello or punchinella both forms are used there are a score of similar entries also of displays at the angel of freaks and monstrosities waxworks and the like hither fled mr thomas coke of holcombe father of the agriculture of norfolk during a corn law riot of 1815 escaping through the back of the house with the then earl of albemarle in the angel in 1794 the duke of york stayed when on his way to yarmouth to meet the exiled family of the prince of orange and here the duke of wellington changed horses on his way to gunton in eighteen twenty receiving a hearty welcome from the citizens from the angel the whigs sallied forth during the election of eighteen thirty two and enjoyed a glorious fight in quite the old style with the tories in the market-place an inn name of such antiquity 
and so many associations should not have been changed apparently however the house has not changed its political colour for it is a curious coincidence that on the evening of the twenty fourth of january lord kimberley was a guest at the royal and next day his son lord woodhouse won the mid norfolk election now the woodhouses have been whigs ever since whigs were and it need not be doubted that sir philip woodhouse member of parliament for castle rising who died in sixteen twenty three was of much the same political temper as those of the name who came after him next morning i walked about norwich and i have done the like many times but short of writing a book on the subject which is certainly not necessary it is by no means easy to decide how to treat it norfolk has more parishes and churches in proportion to its area than any other county seven hundred and thirty to two thousand and twenty four square miles whereas yorkshire to five thousand eight hundred and thirty six square miles has but six hundred and thirteen according to mr rye and of these besides a remarkably striking cathedral there are no less than thirty-five in norwich alone norwich has a castle its history and nature far from free of doubt some relics of walls built by the citizens for their own safety in the time of edward i when they were empowered to levy a murage tax an ancient guild hall of smooth black flint which interested me although it is said to have no regularity or beauty of architecture to recommend it st andrew's hall the nave of an ancient dominican church a school partially domiciled in what is left of a dominican convent a fine museum containing some rare treasures of antiquity the curious part known as tombland and a great store of ancient houses each one of them possessed of a history also in the maid's head to be described later it has the most alluring old inn known to me anywhere true it is that a mayor of norwich conducting a royal personage on a tour of inspection is reported to have said this was an ancient city your royal highness before several of the old houses were pulled down but while there can never be too many old houses left to be an endless delight to the antiquary there are far too many to be noticed in a work of this kind one learns without surprise but not without satisfaction that a society of persons interested in antiquities meets periodically for walks in norwich and it is pleasant to follow their wanderings now they are studying the stately cathedral with its three magnificent gateways and its beautiful fourteenth-century spire and listening to its story from the lips it may be of dr jessop all i need say at this moment is that i have never known the grand simplicity of the prevailing norman style to strike the imagination so quickly and so completely as when i first entered it at a time as it happened when the exceptionally perfect organ was being played in the empty church at another time they are investigating the butter hills and learning that they take their name from john le Boteler, who gave them to carrow abbey at another finding traces in a malt house of the house of that stout sir robert de salle who opposed wat tyler's rebellion in these parts and was celebrated by frossar here the temptation to quote a little is overpowering the insurgents it should be said were led by sir roger bacon and geoffrey lister 
a dyer. The reason that they stopped near Norwich was that the governor of the town was a knight called Sir Robert Sale. He was not a gentleman by birth, but having acquired a great renown for his ability and courage, King Edward had created him a knight. He was the handsomest and strongest man in England. Lister and his companions took it into their heads that they would make this knight their commander and carry him with them in order to be the more feared. They sent orders to him to come out into the fields to speak with them, or they would attack and burn the city. The knight, considering that it was much better for him to go to them than that they should commit such outrages, mounted his horse and went out of the town alone to hear what they had to say. When they perceived him coming, they showed him every mark of respect, and courteously entreated him to dismount and talk with them. He did dismount, and committed a great folly, for when he had done so, having surrounded him, they conversed at first in a friendly way, saying, Robert, you are a knight, and a man of great weight in this country, renowned for your valour, yet notwithstanding all this, we know who you are. You are not a gentleman, but the son of a poor mason, just such as ourselves. Do you come with us as our commander, and we will make so great a lord of you that one quarter of England shall be under your command? The knight, on hearing them thus speak, was exceedingly angry. He would never have consented to such a proposal and eyeing them with inflamed looks answered begone wicked scoundrels and false traitors as you are would you have me desert my natural lord for such blackguards as you are i had rather you were all hanged for that must be your end on saying this he attempted to mount his horse but his foot slipping from the stirrup his horse took fright they then shouted out and cried, Put him to death. When he heard this, he let his horse go, and drawing a handsome Bordeaux sword, he began to skirmish, and soon cleared the crowd from about him that it was a pleasure to see. Some attempted to close with him, but with each stroke he gave, he cut off heads, arms, feet, or legs. There were none so bold, but they were afraid, and Sir Robert performed that day marvellous feats of arms. These wretches were upwards of forty thousand. They shot and flung at him such things that, had he been clothed in steel instead of being unarmed, he must have been overpowered. However, he killed twelve of them, besides many whom he wounded. At last he was overthrown, when they cut off his legs and arms and rent his body in piecemeal. Thus ended Sir Robert Sale, which was a great pity, and when the knights and squires in England heard of it, they were much enraged. On the very same day the party of explorers, I find they were not the Norwich Society, but the Yarmouth branch of the Norfolk Archaeological Society on a pilgrimage, had visited the old foundry bridge, heard the story of the loss of a Yarmouth packet hard by in 1817, learned that a neighbouring yard, once known as Spring Gardens, was a resort of fashion in the 18th century, seen the remains of the Austin Friars Watergate, visited the Devil's Tower, heard the history of the city walls and St. Peter's Southgate. Dr. Bensley had read a paper at Robert de Salle's house aforesaid. Then St. Ethelreda's church was visited, the plate was examined, and Dr. Bensley read another paper in the crypt of the house of Isaac the Jew, a Norman domestic cellar clearly to be traced from the days of William Rufus, to a house subsequently occupied by Sir John Paston 
and Lord Chief Justice Coke. Next, at St Peter's per Mountergate, attention was called to all manner of details, personal, historical, and architectural. St Andrews and Blackfriars Halls were visited and explained. A paper was read on sundry discoveries made in excavating under the Guildhall. King Edward VI Middle School, the one in the ancient convent, was seen. A paper was read on St Andrew's Church, and, after dinner at the Maid's Head, the vicar of St Peter's per Mountergate read a paper on the parish records. Just a few of the entries it is impossible to resist, for they are of imperishable interest. 1798, October the 19th. Form of prayer on the victory obtained by Admiral Sir Horatio Nelson over the French fleet off the Nile on the 1st of August. Sixpence. November the 12th. Form of prayer for general thanksgiving on the 29th of November. One shilling. 1805. December the 5th. Paid for a form of prayer and proclamation on account of the late glorious victory over the combined fleets of France and Spain by Lord Viscount Nelson of Cape Trafalgar on the 21st of October. One shilling. No bells were rung in Norfolk that day, for the calamity of Nelson's heroic death saddened the heart of every man in his native county. But they were rung at St. Peter's per Mountergate, merrily enough, no doubt, in 1814, when there was the entry, April 12th, putting flag upon the steeple on Bonaparte's overthrow, beer, ditto, seven shillings and sixpence. Does this multiplicity of topics take away the breath as is intended? Not without set purpose has this very full day in the life of an archaeological association been set forth with some little of particularity. It is an illustration, deliberately chosen, of the truth that a learned party, or a party desirous of becoming learned, can spend a day comfortably in a single quarter of Norwich, under expert guidance, and without wasting any time, and yet leave a vast number of the most interesting places and remains altogether unvisited. We have no mention here of the city walls, of Tombland, the meaning of which is still in doubt, of the castle, of the guild hall and its treasures, of the strangers' hall, and a score of matters besides. This is not criticism, but a preliminary to an excuse in the nature of confession and avoidance. The Yarmouth archaeologists were wise in their generation in contenting themselves with a single section of the city on a single day. They had come, perhaps, before. They could come, no doubt, again. What they saw and heard in a single day is an explanation, combined with cursory mention of some of the things not seen, at once of the extraordinary fascination Norwich must exercise over a man or woman of intelligence, of the immense variety of its attractions, and of the sheer absurdity of attempting to deal with them in a part of a book with any completeness. It is better, surely, to give something of detail, if not a tenth of what is due, to a part, than to attempt the vain task of stretching the complex whole in outline. To him or her who has time, I would say, spend a great deal of it in Norwich, and you will find no hour hang heavily. Also, it is as well to know a little of Norwich as an historical city, and of its associations, of which indeed the latter are so much the more interesting 
that the history may almost be cast on one side first of all the idea that norwich was venter isonorum may be dismissed with mr haverfield's authority as untenable for lack of evidence no considerable roman remains of clear authenticity have been found to warrant the theory the castle is a complete puzzle the city was ravaged by the danes of course under Svein, in one thousand and three and it became a diocesan centre in ten ninety four and has remained such ever since it was walled as has been stated by the citizens it flourished in the wool trade early worsted owes its name to an adjacent village and sir john paston wrote i would have my doublet all worsted for worship of norfolk it suffered grievously in the time of the black death it had its share as we have seen of trouble from wat tyler's rebellion and from kett's rebellion in the sixteenth century mousehold heath being the place of encampment on both occasions elizabeth also visited it in state in fifteen seventy eight and it contributed its quota towards the repulse of the armada from the troubles of the civil war it escaped almost scot-free mainly because east anglia the home of the eastern counties association was exclusively parliamentarian except in the case of lynn whereof more later after that it is true to write of norwich as mr walter rye has written of norfolk that the history of the last three centuries is really one of elections and of trade neither of them very alluring from our present point of view all these things however are but history in the primitive sense there is far more pleasure and perhaps as much profit in remembering that the editor of the paston letters a mine of information and of interest was sir john fenn a man of norwich that dean hook mrs opie hooker the botanist and harriet martineau were born in norwich these names except perhaps that of fenn do not stir the imagination much in these days we are spared from study of miss martineau's political economy or of her history and sir john fenn was really as his comments in the paston letters and his omissions from them prove a dull dog but what man or woman of literary taste can see as i did the first day i was in norwich the name rackham on a solicitor's brass plate without remembering that the wayward genius george borrow was clerk to messrs simpson and rackham solicitors or perhaps they were attorneys then of norwich or will omit a pilgrimage to the house still unchanged in which he lived in willow lane then chiefest jewel of all in the crown of norwich is the norwich school of painting that rose in her midst whereof old crome his portrait is in the guildhall was the father and the founder his pictures you may study in the national gallery but only in norwich where he was born an apprentice to a coach and sign painter can you realize his gradual progress see him in imagination producing signs for the lamb and the maid's head teaching the gurney children at earlham having george vincent and james stark as apprentices founding with ladbrook r dixon c hodson and john thurtle the first provincial art society holding in eighteen o five and subsequent years considerable exhibitions joined in eighteen o seven by john tell cotman only here can one realize the depth and justice of the pride taken by norwich and norwich men 
in their most honourable school of painting and the eagerness with which the merchant princes of norwich collect the examples of the school but there are some in the guildhall too as is but right end of chapter two part two section five of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent winter norwich to london by roman road practical observations roads the surface is reasonably good and the milestones are legible so long as the road is in norfolk on entering suffolk the milestones are often found illegible and the surface of the road becomes noticeably worse the main road from colchester to london via the east end of london is of fairly good quality but traffic is very troublesome during the later part hills between norwich and ipswich are no hills of at all a serious character on this route except when surface is very soft at stratford st mary on crossing the river towards colchester is a fairly stiff ascent and the colchester vicinity is hilly but not difficult for cars of moderate power note well great care should always be observed in leaving norwich the streets being narrow crooked and full of risk and the way difficult to find distances norwich to london marble arch one hundred and fourteen and three-quarter miles norwich to long stratton ten and a quarter miles long stratton to scole nine and a quarter miles scole to thornton parva four and three quarter miles thornton parva to thwaite two and three quarter miles thwaite to claydon eleven and three quarter miles claydon to ipswich four miles ipswich to colchester six and three quarter miles colchester to chelmsford thirteen and a quarter miles chelmsford to romford fourteen and three quarter miles romford to stratford eight miles stratford to marble arch six and three quarter miles norwich was left behind in mingled sorrow and regret the next morning for on the one hand it seemed a sin to leave so fascinating a city practically unexplored and on the other frost had given place to rain and the rain having abated the air was mild and warm so that motoring promised to be entirely pleasant however other visits to norwich were a certainty in the future so off we went gaily but lord to copy mr pepys were ever streets so straight or so prodigal of angles as these where some folk were hastening to their business at the assizes while others on cars garlanded with significant ribbons were clearly bound for election work in mid norfolk where it was the polling day of a surety a pilot was needed and we had one undoubtedly although tilney all saints is far away in marshland the epitaph appearing there and here quoted must have been written by a norwich man and by no other this world's a city full of crooked streets death is the market-place where all men meet if life was merchandise then men could buy rich men would always live 
and poor men die. So hey for Ipswich and London, for at last we are on a straight road, which hardly curves before Ipswich is reached. The air seems soft and balmy after the frost of the day before, and, crowning blessing of all, the surface is good and even. This fact, completed and rounded off by plainly legible milestones, seeming to follow one another at intervals satisfactorily short, induce us to pass an informal vote of thanks to the county surveyor of Norfolk, and the heaps of repairing material at regular intervals along the roadside call for observation on more than one ground. They are alternate heaps of blue stone, granite probably, broken into commendably small pieces, and of some whitish matter, probably chalk, doubtless used for binding. This may not be ideal road-making, in fact it is not, for the smaller the stones are broken, and the less the use of any kind of binding material, the better the road will be in all weathers. But it must be admitted that this road was remarkably good on a morning when fairly heavy rain, it turned out that there had been much more of it further south, had followed shrewdly sharp frost. For the good surface, we had to thank modern times. For a straightness of direction, having the double advantage of saving labour and sometimes rendering a really exhilarating speed prudent, we had to thank the Roman invasion of Britain. It was the first time on this tour when passage through the air gave one that almost undefinable feeling of thrusting through liquid and cool purity, for cold is horrid but coolness is bliss, which is one of the chief pleasures of automobilism. It was also, after we had passed Caister by Norwich, the first time we had been on a road that was once undoubtedly Roman. Here, since in the course of our wanderings we shall be upon Roman roads fairly often, and upon reputed Roman roads much more often, I am going to take the ball frankly by the horns, and to dispose at once of a problem which, taken in detail, might be tedious. Nor shall any apology be offered for saying here once and for all, on the authority of Mr. Haverfield, almost all that needs to be said concerning the Roman occupation of East Anglia and of its Roman roads in the course of this volume. The digression shall be made as brief as may be. It can, of course, be omitted by those who know the subject, and by those who do not desire to learn. Both will have the consolation of knowing that there is next to nothing of the same kind afterwards. Those who do desire to learn may be informed of that which is a common place to everybody who has given any attention to the story of the Romans in Britain, that Mr. Haverfield knows all that is ascertainable on the subject, and at least as much as any other living man. As for the dead, none of them, since the fifth century, at any rate, have had the chances we have of ascertaining the truth although posterity may learn more, for our sources of knowledge will be available for it, and there is, or may be, a vast amount of information to be obtained still by the intelligent use of the homely spade. The antiquary, no less than the politician, appeals for spade work, especially in East Anglia. One or two principal facts must be borne in mind. County divisions are, of course, long post-Roman. They have no meaning in relation to Roman Britain, 
which was simply a remote and not very important province of the empire. By the end of the year AD 46, the Romans had overrun the south and the midlands of England, annexing part entirely, leaving the rest to protected native princes. Such were the princes of the Iceni, who occupied Norfolk, most of Suffolk, and part of Cambridgeshire, and, for intertribal reasons, took the side of the conquerors at the outset. The Iceni rebelled twice. The first effort was puny. They were defeated, and they returned to their native princes. Then, in AD 61, came the affair of Boudicca, better known as Boadicea, the British warrior queen, and so forth. It is quite an interesting little story, of which our poetic dramatists might easily have made use, and it is told shortly because, judging from personal experience, the details may not be generally familiar. Besides, they are essential to an understanding of East Anglia as a field for the prospector, so to speak, on the lookout for Roman finds, and to know of how little account East Anglia was under the Romans is to understand the more easily why many so-called Roman remains are really not Roman at all. The Icenian Prince Prasutagus, dying, had bequeathed his private wealth to his two daughters and the Emperor Nero. Such was the fashion of the time, to satiate a greedy emperor with a heavy legacy, lest he should confiscate the whole fortune. Prasutagus hoped thus to save his kingdom for his family as well as a part of his private wealth. He did not succeed. The Roman government stepped in and annexed his kingdom, while its officials emphasised the loss of freedom by acts of avarice, bad faith and brutality against Boudicca, or Boadicea, the widow of Prasutagus, her daughters and the Icenian nobles. All this happened when the Roman governor was away fighting in North Wales, and his absence enabled the rebellion, which Boadicea immediately headed to gain temporary and very substantial success. Her Icenian warriors destroyed a whole Roman army, three Roman towns, and 70,000 lives. Then Suetonius came with his trained legionaries. A single great battle destroyed the Icenian power for ever, and their whole country was laid waste. We hear no more of the Iceni in history. Their sometime territory, of little agricultural value in those days, simply became a part of the province, thinly populated, having a few country towns and villas, centres of large estates. In it, we have no reason to look for traces of large military stations of early Roman date, for, as we have seen, the Iceni were wiped out of existence in AD 61. And, after Hadrian built his wall from Carlisle to Newcastle in AD 124, the frontier on which Rome always kept her soldiery was never to the south of that wall. Some military stations there are of later date, 4th century, which were erected for the specific purpose of beating off the Saxon pirates. Hence, and hence only, the phrase, the Saxon shore, who began to raid the southern and eastern coasts of England, running up the rivers in their vessels of shallow draught. Such were Brancaster, guarding the mouth of the Wash, and Borough Castle, defending the outlets of the Waveney and the Yare, and with them we shall deal later in their place. As for the roads, 
they all radiated from london as indeed they do still in large measure one passed direct from london to colchester and thence via stratford st mary and long stratton and skoll to caister by norwich such names as stratford and stratton unless shown to be of modern origin are strong evidence of roman occupation and at skoll where the road crosses the waveney and enters norfolk have been found some roman remains and perhaps traces of a paved ford that is the road on which we are now travelling caster by norwich where we should not have seen much if we had halted that is the worst of these roman remains is in all human probability venta isonorum concerning the situation of which debate used to be carried on vehemently what we might have seen is a rectangular enclosure of earthen mounds covering massive walls having bonding tiles and flint facing to a concrete core the walls themselves being visible on the north and west and a great fosse surrounding the whole its area is about thirty-four acres and there were towers at each corner a careful analysis of the evidence leads to the sure conclusion that this was a small country town and not a great military fortress this particular road crossed the ipswich river a few miles to the north-west of ipswich and a branch from it ran by way of goodenham to peasenhall thence it can be traced due east to yoxford where it ends so far as our certain knowledge goes from peasenhall another direct road can be traced as far as the waveney near waybred and no further other roads there are of uncertain roman origin but the most important of them was the pedders or peddlers way which can be traced with certainty from barningham in suffolk to fring about seven miles from brancaster and perhaps even to holm which is nearer and is indeed one of the supports for the theory concerning the nature and origin of brancaster but the modern roads seldom follow its course a roman road was supposed to run from caister via down a market and across the cambridgeshire fens to peterborough but its existence is hardly proved in norfolk and its origin is hardly clear to demonstration in cambridgeshire these are all the roman roads which need concern us and the references to roman roads in guide-books and on ordnance and other maps may be disregarded this is written not at all by way of disparaging the ordinary guide-books some of which are monuments of learning and industry and by no means in any mood of conscious superiority there is no credit at all in knowing that which mr haverfield has made easy and until he coordinated the facts and sifted the evidence it was practically impossible for anybody but a specialist to know the truth he is a specialist of the true scientific temperament eager to acquire knowledge cautious in inference and it is to be feared that he and his like knock a good deal of romance out of travel in england what they leave however is real and it is worth stating once and for all at any rate we were on a roman road with a sound british surface on this genial january day for genial it was by contrast with those which had gone before and we sped along gaily regretting not so much that a great deal of norfolk is hilly as that when there came a tempting downhill stretch there was generally a village or a crossroad at the bottom to counteract the temptation 
such were the circumstances as we passed down into long stratton where our eyes were delighted by the first specimen on the roadside of the round church towers of flint for which east anglia is famous many theories there have been as to the origin of this peculiar form of tower but the best of them because the most obvious and simple is that of mr j h parker they are built round to suit the material and to save the expense of stone coins for the corners which are necessary for square towers and which often may not have been easy to procure in districts where building stone has all to be imported now we bade leave to hills for a while and at dickleborough the floods were out in some force skull came next a pleasing many gabled village with a fair share of scotch firs and once a great coaching centre it also contains the white hart inn of which mr rye writes of course the best known inn in the county was that at skull built by james peck a norwich merchant in sixteen fifty five the sign costing one thousand and fifty seven pounds and being ornamented with twenty-five strange figures and devices one of which was a movable one of an astronomer pointing to the quarter whence the rain was expected there was also an enormous reproduction of the great bed of ware which held thirty or forty people the inn itself is a fine red brick building with walls twenty-seven inches thick and with a good oak staircase skull by the way is only just in the county of norfolk and there is room for doubt whether the white hart was ever so famous as the maid's head at norwich mr rye however is entitled to be modest in this matter even if modesty lead him into inaccuracy for he saved the maid's head from being modernized by buying it out and out and restoring it in perfect taste may the motor-car bring back prosperity to the white heart and may the white heart merit it it is well situated at the crossing of two trunk roads that on which we were travelling and the bury and yarmouth road in our case it was not convenient to halt here we entered suffolk crossing the waveney and a country of road surfaces far worse than those traversed up to that point the rain had apparently fallen more heavily than it had near norwich but it had not rained gravel an infamous material for road making nor could it account for the weary attitude of the tumble-down and illegible milestones as it was when hills were encountered the panhard was hard tried and the driving wheels although they wore anti-skid gaiters revolved many times more than the distance covered by them warranted there was simply no hold for the wheels in the dirty porridge-like mud concealing a crumbling subsurface and now and again although no great height above the sea had to be climbed the gradients were almost trying owing to the bad surface shocking bad roads luncheon sadly deferred in consequence and the certainty of much travelling after dark if london were to be reached that evening may be accountable for the fact that between skull and ipswich the only point that seemed worthy of a passing note was a church on the left-hand side i think at yaxley clearly visible from the road and having a good parvice over the porch it has been written i think at yaxley in all honesty for it is not always possible to identify on a map the village through which the car is passing nor always easy to consult the map 
even when travelling at moderate speed. Blessed be the villagers that proclaim their titles, even by modest boards on the post offices, as many do in East Anglia, for by such boards is the traveller saved from the scorn poured upon him who asks of a rustic the name of his native village. This is an almost universal phenomenon, so frequently an occurrence that one is tempted to speculate as to its origin, and that may be that the normal rustic, painfully conscious of the narrow limits of his own knowledge, feels that he has encountered a fool indeed when he meets anybody who is more ignorant than himself, although it be but as to a single and quite trivial point. The one important thing about luncheon at the Great White Horse, thrice welcome as it was to us, was the sad fact that it did not begin until three o'clock. Of the places passed through between Ipswich and London, or of their appearance and their story at any rate, little shall be said here for two reasons, or even three. The first is that having once stayed at Colchester for ten days and more, going out motoring every day and studying Colchester itself, full of interest at many odd times, I deal with Colchester and excursions from it in another chapter. The second is that, after it grew dark, that is to say not long after we left Colchester behind, our journey seemed to become exciting and mysterious in a degree hardly conceivable, of which it is hoped to reproduce an impression. And the third, last, and most cogent, is that this chapter grows full long already for the small portion of road of which it really treats. We pass then to Colchester, via Copdock, Capel St Mary and Stratford St Mary. Here we entered Essex, and the name of the village reminded us again of the antiquity of the road, and so passing, especially after Capel St Mary, we encountered some hills which would not have seemed despicable to a weak car. Through Colchester, its outlines rendered picturesque by the fading light, we hastened, setting our course for Chelmsford. But we were hardly a mile outside Colchester before the lamps had to be lit and the darkness came down upon us like a curtain. Now it was my turn to fail as a pilot and a guide. It has been said that I had motored round Colchester every day for ten days at least, and that not long before. I had, in fact, followed the Essex manoeuvres of 1904 in a Lanchester on business, and had stayed on for pleasure afterwards. But on that occasion except in a futile effort to see a night attack on Colchester during pitch darkness, there had never been occasion to use the lamps, and it was astonishing to find how vast a difference the darkness made. We halted at Kelverdon to procure water. We would have taken tea there at a roomy inn of old time if the mere mention of tea had not seemed to paralyse those who were in charge of the house. I had been through Calverdon at least a score of times before, yet I had to ask its title. In Whittam, the long and straggling congregation of houses three miles beyond, I had been interrupted at luncheon in an inn by a sharp fight between the armies of Sir John French and General Wynne yet I could not recognise the place at all in the gloom. Chelmsford revealed itself by process of inference. There was no other considerable community to be expected at this point, and Chelmsford it must be, and was. After this, all was fresh and mysterious. 
Ingatestone I had visited before, and passing lovely some of its environment, which we shall see by daylight some day, had been found to be. To Brentwood there had never been occasion to go, so there was no shame in failing to recognise it. On we sped a dozen miles which, what with feeling our way in the darkness, and the impossibility of calculating distance accomplished, here was one of the cases in which a recording instrument would have been useful, seemed to be at least a score. Surely we must be approaching the environs of London, for there was a glow of light ahead, and there were railway lights to the left, and beyond them more lights still. Not a bit of it. The lights ahead turned out to be merely Romford. Those on the left beforehand must have been Hornchurch. Even Romford was at last detected only by virtue of a fortunate glance at some public office. Again, we were out in the open country, as it seemed in the dark, although, no doubt, the rural illusion would have vanished by daylight. After that, in a short time, lamps began to appear regularly. But the mystery and ignorance of us who were travellers was not less than before. The pride-destroying fact must be admitted that a glimpse of Seven Kings Station only set me thinking of the two kings of Brentford with whom the Seven can have no reasonable connection. That Ilford was new to me, save by name, and that I began half to think it possible that, like the Turkish admiral who, having been sent on a voyage to Malta, came back to say that the island had disappeared, we might have missed our course by many miles, and might be skirting London to the north. Multitudinous lights stretching far away over the left front aided the illusion. Then came a reassuring advertisement, that of the Stratford Empire, a distinct presage of the east end of London, and before very long, on our left, was a row of houses, quite respectably old among many that were horribly modern. The old houses were, at a guess, not earlier than Queen Anne, but the mind went back further to reflect that Stratford had been Stratford at a bow in Chaucer's time, and that there his prioress had learned to speak French, full, fair, and fetisly, at the Benedictine nunnery. To my friend, at any rate, the environment of the Mile End Road was familiar, for he and his car had been busy electioneering there. As for me, the pangs of hunger notwithstanding, I was fascinated by the deft way in which he slipped through the traffic. Truly, the motor car is capable of marvellous dirigibility in skilful hands. Eftsoons were we in Whitechapel, breathing a murky atmosphere of naphtha and fried fish, so all-pervading that, at the moment, the very thought of food seemed nauseous. It is surely one of the standing mysteries of creation where all this multitude of fishes can have their origin. So, at precisely nine o'clock in the evening, we passed up Holborn out of the city of London, and, for the purposes of this book, our subsequent proceedings were of no interest. Let us, before closing the chapter, see what had been gained by this tour in midwinter. Well, first it was a conviction that, although motoring in winter is a cold occupation, productive of some absolute pain, for it hurts to be really cold, and of a compensating increase of appreciation for familiar comforts, it is distinctly better than not motoring at all. This conviction I should probably retain, 
in spite of a constitutional dislike to cold in all circumstances except those of heavy snow when falling which i am content to believe without trying it is all but an absolute bar to motoring if you have a screen the snow destroys its transparency if you have not a screen it blocks your vision and covers up your eyes or goggles moreover on high and fenceless roads where the motorist is most liable to be overtaken by snow the white mantle obliterates the track and renders movement full of perils but something more substantial than this conviction was gained during these three days they were days be it remembered when the face of nature in what may be called a tamed country is at its worst they had been spent in traversing districts up to that time for the most part unknown to me but there remained much of east anglia familiar to me in summer and in winter dress which have been purposely omitted in this effort to gain a general impression of the country i pictured to myself the breezy uplands of the sandringham district the pines the heather and the bracken as i had seen them many a time in summer sunshine and in stormy winter fancy filled the brown ploughland we had passed a sea of yellow corn i remembered the beautifully umbrageous lanes and roads of eastern essex where they rarely shroud the elms in the barbarous fashion prevailing in berkshire and other counties the strange crops whole fields of dahlias for example which i had seen in the seed-growing districts the heavy laden orchards upon which it must be admitted mr thomas atkins levied heavy toll in nineteen o four so remembering i concluded there and then that i should find ample satisfaction in my task but at that time i had not seen a tithe of the characteristic scenery of east anglia ely rising majestic from the plain the very singular and impressive run along the sandy coast from cromer to wells next sea the road on thence to hunstanton and lynn the glorious expanses of heath in many parts of norfolk and suffolk the extraordinary hedges of fir along the roadside near elvedon and in many another place all these things and a score besides were as a sealed book to me the book has been open now and its prodigal variety of infinite charm appalls me even though a substantial part of my pleasant duty has been accomplished end of chapter three Section 6 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. Spring Through the Heart of East Anglia. Part 1. Practical Observations. Roads main roads throughout good in surface for the most part very straight and free from crossroads so that high speeds may be enjoyed with safety hills none worthy of mention distances royston to newmarket twenty four miles newmarket to thetford twenty and a quarter miles thetford to attleborough fourteen miles attleborough to windham six miles windham to norwich nine miles note this was merely an afternoon drive in east anglia preceded by a morning spent in reaching it by car 
but it is not the less likely to be suitable to other motorists for that reason during the interval between the first and second tours in east anglia many books more or less promising of material were read of these books it will be prudent to say a little before recording an expedition in which east anglia was attacked so to speak amidships many of them it is needless to mention though some will come in for passing reference the first was murray's handbook to essex suffolk norfolk and cambridgeshire which is well planned having regard to the needs of its age and well no less than learnedly written but it was published more than thirty years ago and is therefore rather out of date as to some of its facts and for motorists absolutely obsolete in its method it proceeds for the most part county by county its routes are railway routes it almost ignores roadside scenery and it enlarges very usefully sometimes upon the internal details of churches and of other edifices with which the motorist can rarely be concerned for as it is not intelligent to hurry through the country always so it is not motoring to potter at every place the good murray is really rather embarrassing to the motorist let me illustrate skull mentioned in the last chapter is a little more than two miles from yaxley on the roman road a brief account of skull is found on page 183 if yaxley were mentioned at all and it is worth mentioning for the sake of its church in a guide-book pure and simple it would find a place in some suffolk route for only very occasionally does the guide-book writer allow even a railway to transport him across a county boundary amongst other books studied were leland's itinerary the paston letters in five stately quarto volumes and arthur young's six weeks tour these studies were not quite in vain for they will at least show a reader what to avoid young's six weeks tour is most consumedly dull reeking of turnips sticky with marl and the accounts of the seats of the nobility and gentry and other objects worthy of notice by the author of the farmer's letters are very rarely interesting some of them which are to our purpose for of course the tour was not confined to east anglia shall be quoted in due season to reading leland stimulated by many quaint quotations in later works i had looked forward for years but the second edition in nine volumes of the itinerary of john leland the antiquary oxford printed at the theatre for james fletcher bookseller in the turl and joseph pott bookseller at eton 1745 was a grievous disappointment the plums seem all to have been picked out by the guide-book writers few of them if any relate to east anglia the only things worthy of note were an account perfectly straightforward and to be quoted in its place of the dunmo flitch and some doggerel concerning the properties of the counties of england the material ones for us are essex full of good housewives north folk full of wilds south folk full of styles huntingdonshire corn full good cambridgeshire full of pikes leland in fact cannot be commended but that is only because he planned his magnum opus like many a good man before him and after 
without regard to the allotted span of human life, not to speak of its uncertainty. In his New Year's Gift to King Henry the Eighth, in the thirty-seventh year of his reign, Leland talks of his studies, of his six years of travel, and then sketches his plan. It is to write an history, to the which I intend to adscribe this title, De Antiquitate Britannica, or Els Civilis Historia. And this work I intend to divide into so many books as there be shires in England and shires and great dominions in Wales, so that I esteem that this volume will include a fifty books, whereof each one severally shall contain the beginnings and creases and memorable acts of the chief towns and castells of the province allotted to it. Leland died when he was forty-six, but if he had lived another century, he could hardly have achieved his self-imposed task even if he had been miraculously endowed with a Mercedes, and he cherished divers other projects. As it is, his so-called itinerary is, at best, but a collection of rough notes, having frequently no sort of coherence, often corrected or added to later in a distant geographical connection. In spite of a taste for antiquity, it may be put down as stiff and heavy to read, and not sufficiently abounding in quaintness to repay the trouble of the reader. The Paston letters, on the other hand, are the best of reading, giving a wonderfully vivid idea of life in East Anglia at a singularly troublous period and there will be occasion to quote them more than once. The edition by the worthy Sir John Fenn, stately as it is, and a joy to handle, is far from being the best. Posterity owes to him a deep debt for rescuing the letters from oblivion, but he omitted as uninteresting precisely the little fragments upon private and domestic affairs which we value most now in later editions. His notes, too, prove him to have been a rather dull dog and lacking in a sense of humour. Sometimes he scents impropriety where there is clearly none. At others he misconstrues the most obvious badinage. Thus, where John Paston is addressed in the phrase, wishing you joy of all your ladies, Fenn suggests a reference to the Virgin Mary, heaven knows why. Still, Fenn rescued the letters, and the latest edition, far more complete than his, is at once one of the most entertaining and valuable of historical documents and essential to the right understanding of life in old Norfolk. In fact, the Paston Letters is one of the few really old books which a man not too studiously inclined may not prudently be contented to take as read. It is vastly entertaining, but, it must be said, it is not for the young person. A spade was not called a horticultural implement in those days, and there are many spades, and some knaves of spades too, in the Paston letters. Fortified with this literary foundation, and a good deal more of minor importance, I left my Berkshire home near Abingdon on the 9th of March in a 30 horsepower Rolls Royce car, six cylindered, and equipped with every luxury in the shape of glass screens and a cape hood, and driven by Mr. Claude Johnson. For companions, we had my two daughters, and for assistance, if it were needed, a mechanic. As it happened, there was not a particle of trouble with tyres, 
engine or apparatus of any kind during the three hundred miles and more of this expedition and we might have dispensed quite well with the mechanic and with his weight indeed at the end of the little tour and for that matter after the next on another car arose a feeling that the days of the uncertainty of motor cars were over need it be said that nemesis was in waiting for this sanguine feeling and that before my travelling days were o'er in east anglia one of those extraordinary runs of misfortune came which in motoring more than in any other pastime justify the sayings that troubles never come singly that it never rains but it pours it is perhaps wise to make this statement now for a record of motoring wherein all was plain sailing the metaphor is hardly mixed for there is kinship between the motion of a sailing craft running free and that of a car in good tune might run the risk of being dull how our troubles were turned into a positive pleasure at the time as well as in retrospect by the skill patience and good humour of this same mr claude johnson shall be told in its proper place in another chapter one thing however may be said by way of preliminary to the account of this particular tour there was much controversy at the beginning of nineteen o five upon the question whether the movement of a six-cylinder petrol car is or is not more luxurious than that of a four-cylinder car of first-rate design and construction a prolonged match not entirely free from flukes the bane of motoring trials has been held by way of attempt to decide the issue and it has ended in favour of six cylinders as illustrated by the identical car in which this tour was taken the controversy will probably go on forever none the less for it is the old case of de gustibus which can never be settled and it is all but impossible to compare memories of kindred sensations felt at different times who can say for example which cigar glass of old wine sail on a strong breeze gallop over the downs run in a first-rate motor-car dive into cool water which almost what you will so long as it be one of the pleasures classified by old aristotle as coming into being through the touch was absolutely the best of his life without scientific certainty however there may be strong conviction and mine is that a good six-cylinder whether rolls-royce or napier runs more smoothly than any four-cylinder car and i have tried nearly all the best of them in fact there is very little to choose in point of smooth running if indeed there be anything to choose at all between it and a white steam car used on another east anglian tour tried by the to me infallible touchstone of my own spine a six-cylinder is a very little but still distinctly more luxurious than the best four-cylinder car but this is not to say that there are not a round dozen of four-cylinder cars on the market which make their passengers as comfortable as any man or even delicate woman can reasonably wish to be in this world we started just after ten on a windy and rainless morning in an atmosphere giving beautifully clear views of distant objects and thereby raising some reasonable apprehensions for the morrow among the weather wise our route lay outside my present manor until royston was reached for it was through dorchester tame aylesbury ivinghoe dunstable luton hitchin and baldock and the temptation to describe some of it 
especially the run along the Chilterns, is strong, but it must be resisted. One observation, however, must be made. From tame onwards, in spite of the tendency of our road system to radiate from London obstinately, as in Roman times, much as our railways do, and as if cross-country travelling were not a thing to be encouraged, there was little reason to complain of want of directness in the road. But to journey from Abingdon to Tame, it is necessary to go round two sides of a rough but large triangle, whether the route chosen be through Oxford, distant six miles, or through Dorchester and Shillingford, which is rather longer. In either case, the traveller has been compelled to go a long way out of his true course, and from the turning point to Tame is about the same distance in both cases. To Royston, the distance is, as nearly as may be, seventy miles, and the last part of the run, where we followed the northwest edge of the Chilterns, cutting in and out of Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire and Cambridgeshire in bewildering succession was very exhilarating. A pretty sight too were the Chilterns, with their swelling undulations of down turf marked out near Royston for galloping grounds and showing here and there in the form of a flag and a carefully tendered green that the golfer has found his way to Royston. Indeed, this close-down turf, this skin of grass-catching the full force of northerly and westerly gales, is suitable to the golfer's needs as any save that of seaside links. At Royston we found an ancient and interesting inn, actually bisected by the ancient boundary line of Hertfordshire and Cambridgeshire, a kindly welcome, most benign bulldogs, and last, but by no means least, a glorious pie. The inn is there still, no doubt, so probably are the bulldogs, so no doubt is the kindly welcome, but the pie vanished in a manner almost miraculous. It came in an ample dish, steaming, succulent, the crust browned to a nicety. In a surprisingly short time, the dish went out, empty, almost clean as Jack Spratt's and his spouse's platter, and its exit was accomplished by a gurgle of suppressed laughter from without. Was there something of a rueful tone in that laughter? Perhaps there was. He who would feed after March motorists have eaten their fill had best send in to them a gigantic pasty, else will he go hungry. At Royston, the gate of East Anglia, we strolled about a little, finding it to be just a quiet town of the country. There is no sufficient reason to believe it to be really ancient, according to the standard of antiquity in these islands, and the intersecting point of two great roads that followed by us, which went on to the eastward, and the road between Hartford and Cambridge. Here, according to the antiquaries of yesterday, Isonhilde Way and Erming Street crossed one another. The antiquaries of today question the Isonhilde Way so far east as this, laugh at the philology which would make Ickleton evidence of its existence, and make nothing of the authority of the learned Dr. Guest. Perhaps they would treat with more respect Erming Street, said to have led from Royston to Huntingdon, and to cross the Ouse at Arrington, for there appears to be sound evidence that Edgar granted to the monks of Ely the Earminger Ford, or Ford of the Earmings, or Fenman. Walking eastward along the spacious street, we found first the turning for Newmarket, which was of present interest, and, quite by accident, a notice to the cave, 
leading us into a back yard and to a locked gate and provoking a little later research we couldn't get in of course the custodian if there be one was at his sacred dinner as everybody in royston seemed to be but royston struck us as the kind of place in which an obsolete notice might hang unmoved so long as the fibre of wood would support its covering of paint investigation in books showed the cave to have been discovered by a fluke in 1472 but the cave like a good many others here and elsewhere seems to have been merely an ancient bone shaft or rubbish pit afterwards excavated sufficiently to be used as a subterranean chapel hence the sketches of saints carved on the chalk walls which candidly i should like to have seen close at hand royston is quiet enough in all conscience now and it is doubtful whether the motor-car rapidly as it increases in the land will bring much prosperity to it although it is placed at an important crossroads cambridge is but twelve and a half miles distant and cambridge is a good deal more interesting than royston as well as a more certain find for refreshment for pies may not always be to the fore being at the crossroads however royston is likely to see as much life passing through its midst and to like it as little as it did in the days of james i nay it may even like the bustle less for more dust will go with it james who really was an ardent if not a mighty hunter planted a hunting box near royston his particular object being probably to course the chiltern hares for this is a first-rate coursing country possessed as is most downland of remarkably stout hares and when hares are stout the open prospect of the downs makes coursing a very pretty sport deer of course there may have been but the country does not look like them and as for the fox of whom the moderns have written and sung although we would kill him we love him he was vermin in the days of king james to hunt the hare either with greyhound or harrier on the other hand was a sport much loved of our kings even in saxon times and in downland of berkshire not dissimilar to the chilterns there are examples of manners held on the condition that the tenant should keep a pack of harriers for the king's hunting whether the royston folk had to keep hounds for the king is not clear but murray has unearthed a lovely story of their catching his favourite hound and attaching to his collar a scroll bearing the words good mr jowler we pray you speak to the king for he hears you every day and so doth he not us that it will please his majesty to go back to london for else the country will be undone all our provision is spent already and we are not able to entertain him longer here was a new way of conveying a broad hint baby charles visited royston twice immediately before his standard was raised at nottingham and later as a prisoner the distinguishing feature of the road from royston to newmarket which crosses over the south-eastern end of the gog magog hills is its undeviating straightness it is plain from the map that it curves gently here and there having indeed almost a sharp turn to the left before it ascends the gog magog hills which would be of little account as hills elsewhere than near a fenny country but the general impression left was of wide prospects scotch firs 
belts planted for partridge driving and abundant game birds the feeling that this is an ideal shooting country and not half a bad one for motoring was at its strongest when six mile bottom famous in the history of sport with the gun was reached it was a day as luck would have it on which a bird lover could take rapid observations of bird life as he swept along for there were no vehicles to distract him on the empty road and there was no chance of his coming upon them unawares partridges we saw galore cock pheasants strutting on the ploughland confident that they were safe from the gun by law till the next october and probably knowing quite well for there are few things a wily old cock pheasant does not know that there would be no serious danger away from the boundary hedges until the leaf was clear in november less handsome than the cock pheasants but more interesting because less familiar to my eyes were the hooded crows in their sober suits of drab grey and glossy black walking about in perfect amity with the pheasants this bird is a grey mystery in shape and dimensions he is identical with the carrion crow carrion crows and hoodies or royston crows will interbreed on occasion their nests and eggs are of identical situation structure colour and shape their common habits include a partiality for young birds and young rabbits as well as for carrion i have heard a rabbit scream looked in the direction of the noise shot a carrion crow which rose and found it lying within a couple of yards of a half-grown rabbit quite warm and with its skull split and yet nobody knows for certain whether the two species are distinct or not the black crows may be migrants the grey crows certainly are they come over to the east coast in hordes in the autumn mostly from russia where they also interbreed with the carrion crow they come inland a little and i have seen one or two in berkshire but west of berkshire they are certainly very exceptional in england and wales though they are quite common and even breed in scotland and ireland in fact they are birds of whom one would like to know more attired in a quakerish habit according ill with their disposition still when you have no game coverts of your own in the vicinity it is good to see them circling about over these wide spaces near royston and to remember that they used to be called royston crows the marshmen call them danish crows also and it is a great pity when ornithologists omit to specify these local names of birds hoodie danish crow royston crow are identical and each of them at least as interesting as corona cornix they are all as mr rowdler sharp says ravens in miniature but it is open to doubt whether as pets they would be equally amusing in their tricks we saw them in great numbers as we swept along and like many wild things they took no notice of the car it is strictly irrelevant of course but it may be interesting to say that since these words were written i have found that even a highland stag is not afraid of a motor car which shows a highland stag to have far more sense than some reasoning men newmarket we have seen before and since this time also it was passed without a halt whereas on a later visit we stopped for a while it need not detain us now our road which kept to the high ground to the south-east of mildenhall fen took us first through characteristic environs of newmarket 
not seen on the former tour past endless training grounds trim houses and carefully built stables and later through the wild heaths known as icklingham and weather heath the latter actually one hundred and eighty two feet above the sea level right well no doubt that last named heath has earned its name for it is easy to imagine and much more comfortable to imagine than to feel how a gale from the north or west would have swept across the fens over that heath for that matter there is not a single eminence of more than two hundred feet between weatherheath and the gales from the north sea so the east wind swept it too here the hand of man has wrought a great and beneficial alteration in the features of nature mention has been made before of the belts clearly planted for partridge driving to be seen in some parts of east anglia and they must be noticed more particularly a few miles farther on when we pass elvedon the landowners who planted them and the pheasant coverts have improved the scenery and their own shooting at the same time they cannot perhaps be credited with absolute and unalloyed altruism and soon on this naturally bleak upland the road was sheltered on either side by close hedges of fir trimmed to a height of ten feet or so such as i never saw before nor have seen since out of norfolk they cannot be meant for screens to conceal the guns from the driven birds for the british public has to stand a good deal of shooting in illegal proximity to high roads but it would hardly tolerate permanent arrangements to that end even in norfolk or suffolk where game is sacrosanct there can be nothing of this kind here nor if there were would it have been necessary to plant both sides of the road no these hedges charming because of their quaintness can have been planted in no other spirit than that of humanity in the widest sense of the word they break the monotony of the landscape and that is something close and impervious they must break also the force of the wind and must form an effectual barrier to the slashing rain that the wind sends with a terrible force before its breath they are an unmixed blessing a wonderful improvement to the conditions of wayfaring and it only remains to be hoped that there may arise no county surveyor who using the arbitrary discretion given to him by law shall decree that these merciful shelters be laid low in the season of the year when his word is law on we glided with supreme ease the whole distance from newmarket to thetford being eighteen miles but the going so good as fox hunters would say that distance counts for little and the evidence of the cult of st pheasant was more and more conspicuous were we not drawing near to elvedon hall an italian house built in eighteen seventy six for the maharaja duleep singh now the property of lord ivor and have not fabulous bags been long a tradition of elvedon hall estate let it not be supposed for a moment that this fact is mentioned by way of pandering to the prejudice of protesting radicals or of joining in the chorus of ignorant invective against game preservation now happily seldom heard in the land looking at this bleak upland having regard to the recent and probable future history of british agriculture and if a personal allusion be permissible to the well-known character of the present owner of elvedon hall it is plain that this ground could not be better employed than as a game preserve that as such it probably produces more food and gives more employment than if it were in the hands of farmers 
and that if this were not so lord ivor would not be the man to preserve game there is no east anglian grievance here and east anglia certainly feels none if there be any grievance at all it is that some of the money primarily made on the banks of the liffey is spent in east anglia but no doubt much of it comes indirectly from east anglia also and there is no sort of doubt that lord ivor does his duty and much more than his duty by ireland as well as by england more completely than most men leaving elvedon behind we sped to thetford passing a mile or so beyond the gates of elvedon across the county boundary and out of suffolk into norfolk the character of the scenery remained unchanged we were in a land of heaths barren and pleasing and of rabbit warrens some of them very ancient and famed for the quality of the skins and fur of the rabbits reared among them arthur young found this country from northwold to thetford and again from thetford to ingham an uncultivated sheep walk and as he made no suggestion for its improvement generally in spite of the success achieved in the neighbourhood by one of the best farmers in england mr wright through the use of marl which was not even the fat soapy kind it may be taken that the case is a fairly hopeless one the rabbits probably pay as well as anything else would and we have to thank them and the sterility of the soil for the preservation of a fine tract of wild and open land and for the sense of freedom in passing through it as for thetford its motto certainly ought to be ichabod there are few places in england possessed in their time of a substantial reputation whose glory has departed more completely it was the scene of a fierce battle between dane and saxon it was the second city in norfolk in point of importance it had a mint so late as the days of henry the second its priory was founded by roger bygod but is now an uninteresting ruin it had twenty churches five market-places and twenty-four main streets in the time of edward the third it was the diocesan centre of east anglia for nineteen glorious years from ten seventy five to ten ninety four also it has always had its vast earthwork commonly known as the mound commonly believed also to be of enormous antiquity roman at the latest and by virtue of it thetford has been identified with the roman cytomagus it is a little hard that when all the rest of the glory of thetford is gone even the mound which without excavation is totally devoid of interest should have the glamour taken away from it and that investigators on scientific principles have exploded the cytomagus bubble mr rye says it has been guessed to be cytomagus and certainly many signs of roman occupation have been found here but the great castle mound steep and high with its grass-grown sides so difficult even in times of peace to climb up is the chief object of interest in the town there are no traces of buildings on it and the platform at the top is so small that the generally received theory that it was thrown up as a refuge against the danes is obviously untenable the labour and energy necessary to create such a mound would have been enormous and surely would have been expended in comparatively recent times such as those in which the pirate danes harried our country to more practical use that the mound is mainly artificial i have little doubt 
but whether it was a burial mound or not cannot now be discovered without deeper excavations than are likely to be allowed considering that the earthwork is a hundred feet high and a thousand feet in compass it would certainly be rather a large sized burial mound let us look at what mr haverfield says he relegates thetford to an index of the principal places where roman remains have been found or supposed in norfolk but does not dignify it by a position in the text which is confined to places where vestiges of permanent occupation have been found the finds at thetford have been first roman coins according to sir thomas brown and bloomfield but coins alone do not carry us far hordes of coins have their own value for the students of political economy since they often reveal secrets in the history of the roman currency but they do not so often illustrate the occupation or character of the districts in which they are found sometimes they occur in the vicinity of dwellings buried for instance in a back garden which the owner had constantly under his eye but they occur no less often in places remote from any known romano-british habitation they have been lost or purposely hidden in a secluded and unfrequented spot this is a general remark on the test applicable to sporadic finds such as those at thetford which are banished to the index there another sporadic find which if it had been real would have conveyed more meaning receives very short shrift a lamp is said by dawson turner to have been found at thetford in eighteen twenty seven under the red mound and the lamp he figures is now in norwich museum that sounds promising does it not men might bury hordes of money in odd places and forget them or meet their deaths before they unearth them they would hardly be likely so to conceal their household lamps alas for this pretty piece of foundation for an imaginative structure the curator tells me it was brought from carthage and presented by edward stanley bishop of norwich and it certainly has the look of a foreign object finally thetford has been called cytomagus by camden and others and also isiani but it does not seem to be a roman site at all its earthworks are post-roman camden's river sit or thet is a piece of characteristically bad etymologizing the learned scholar deigns to write no more than this of thetford and being concerned only with romano british norfolk sets up no positive theory but why was the mound built exit mr rye's a priori view that it could not have been built in such comparatively recent times as those of the danish invasions because the energy and labour would have been expended to better purpose in those times for the mound is post-roman it may have been raised between the date of the roman departure in 410 and that at which the kingdom of east anglia was established this is one of the most delightful chapters of history to a persistently boyish mind because next to nothing is known about it there is no reason to suppose that the romanized britons remaining in east anglia as it was to be welcome the saxons with open arms and every reason to believe that the saxons were a thoroughly barbarous crew the britons may have raised it against them or again it may have been raised by the saxons against the danes as in the opinion of dr jessop 
were Castle Rising, Castle Acre, Milam, Elmham, and the Norwich Mound. The works at some of these places are certainly post-Roman, and at none of them is there clear evidence of Roman occupation. In fact, the chances are that they were all of later date, and the chances are also that there was a great deal more fighting in these parts between 410 and 800 AD than the muse of history has chosen to reveal. But this problem is glanced at later. As for Mr. Rye's a priori view that the exertion would have been better employed in those days, why, bless the man, Offer's dyke was made, from the mouth of the D to that of the Y, late in the 8th century, and it is a Cyclopean work. The mound is rop in mystery, that is all about it, and a heap of earth whereof the meaning is not known to the learned is a precious dull spectacle. So, to tell the plain truth, is Thetford. To us, the most interesting facts it provided were a substantial tea at the bell, itself quite old enough to please. While tea was in preparation, we saw quite as much of Thetford as any reasonable man could wish to see. When tea came, it was marked by the appearance of weird things in the nature of tea cakes, combining something of the toughness of the muffin and the texture of dry toast, not very new dry toast, with the shape of the crumpet. The other memory of Thetford is of a strange old man, having toy windmills for sale and attached to every part of his person, after the fashion of those street musicians who, by dint of ingenious contrivances in string, can play, or at any rate make a noise with, some half-dozen rude instruments at the same time. This wandering toy seller was a blessing in disguise. He was, and is, a providential reminder that windmills, here, there, and everywhere, are striking objects in the East Anglian landscape. Travelling eastward from the Midlands, one sees them as far west as Buckinghamshire, and they're not in the Chilterns only, and in East Anglia proper their name is Legion. In or out of working order, and in a country of much wind travelling fast, of water moving, as a rule, very slowly, they are mostly in working order. They add picturesque character to the landscape. Moreover, in beauty they have a distinct advantage over the watermill. The latter may be, often is, exquisite at close quarters. Its foaming stream, its dripping and moss-covered wheel, its gleaming pond with willow-shadowed or elder-girt bank, are among the loveliest objects in England when seen at close quarters. Your windmill, on the other hand, must in the nature of things be placed either on an eminence or in a wide and open space. Not so beautiful, perhaps, only perhaps, at close quarters as the watermill. It is still more than pleasing, and it can be seen for miles. It is as a beacon on the coast which the mariner can see for many leagues before he passes it, as the motor car passes the windmill at a safe distance. Constable, it is worth while to remember, learned some of his skill in an East Anglian water mill. It was only afterwards that, consulting the faithful Murray, I learned that Thetford had been the birthplace of Thomas Paine, the infamous author of The Age of Reason, and that the house in which he was born was standing thirty years ago. It would not, perhaps, have been very interesting to discover whether it was still standing, 
but it was decidedly quaint to learn that tom paine was the son of a quaker staymaker could there be anything more incongruous that a quaker should be the father of thomas paine was bad enough that a quaker should make stays let us hope he never measured his fair customers for them but made them in stock sizes was monstrous yet on investigation in other books it turned out to be a true story and from the investigation came an awakened memory which others may need also that thomas paine was a really influential personage among the founders of american independence end of chapter four part one section seven of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent spring through the heart of east anglia part two during tea and the consumption of the strange tea cakes which may after all have been slices of the traditional norfolk dumpling more or less toasted rose a suggestion that we might turn southward for three or four miles cross the waveney enter suffolk again and take a motorist view of euston park it would be the same euston park planted with many of the same trees grown bigger which surrounded the house when lord ossory heard the thunder of guns from the east and rode off as has been recounted before this to be a spectator of the great sea fight in sole bay it would be the same house too for it was acquired by the first duke of grafton with the property by marrying lord arlington's daughter in the days of charles the second and the dukes of grafton from time to time hold it still the decision not to make a detour was reached partly because as we meant to make norwich by way of attleborough and wyndham it would have involved a return by the same road as that taken on the outward journey and partly because the descriptions were unpromising the reference here is distinctly not to the description in murray it is a large good red brick house with stone coins built by lord arlington in the reign of charles the second and without any pretensions to beauty except from its position in a well timbered and well watered park that description such is the perversity of human nature raised a suspicion that the house might if it were visible from the road turn out to be a very satisfying structure conveying that idea of spacious comfort and substance which is completely lacking in many a more imposing mansion nor was i moved by the fact that walpole wrote the house is large and bad for it might have been possible to disagree with walpole of strawberry hill on a question of taste but walpole went beyond matters of mere opinion it was built by lord arlington and stands as all old houses do for convenience of water and shelter in a hole so it neither sees nor is seen that settled the question euston might or might not be one of the stately homes of england whose owners permit them to be inspected by strangers on stated days this march day might have been such a day but not even the prospect of seeing euston's watered vale and sloping plains or some fairly interesting portraits or verio's frescoes would have induced me to avail myself of the privilege 
if indeed it had existed i know what the legitimate inmates of a great house feel on those occasions besides motorists are unpopular in ducal parks and with good reason it is absolutely true that a duke riding a bicycle in his own park has been abused coarsely violently and recently by a motorist who was enjoying that park by the duke's grace that park is now closed to motorists and no wonder and the case is not exceptional in character so we glided onward gliding is the true word for the onward movement of a good car over the open ground of croxton heath first then past sundry villages not lying close up to the high road between the houses of attleborough and noticed without halting attleborough's fine church after this for quite a long while there were no more villages and then in front of us and dominating the view rose a huge church having two towers one at the west end it stirred memory of pleasant browsings in norfolk and norwich notes and queries this could be and in fact was none other than wymundham pronounced windham where the benedictine monks and the parishioners quarrelled over the parish church which had been appropriated to the abbey so bitterly did they quarrel that the east end transepts and part of the nave were walled off for the monks they certainly took the lion's share in fourteen ten the parishioners being relegated to a portion of the nave and there at the west end they built them a tower and hung bells in fourteen seventy six a mighty religious house was this of wyndham entitled to all wrecks between Eccles, Haysborough, and Tunstead, and to a tribute of two thousand eels every year from Ealingley. This tribute, we may be sure, was paid in Lent, for it is pretty clear from the Paston letters that, while herrings were the stock food of the days of fasting, eels were the luxury that made them tolerable mistress agnes paston writes to her husband in london that she has secured the herrings from yarmouth no doubt as she lived hard by at caister by yarmouth but that the eels are delayed which appears to be accounted very sad just because this was a mighty religious house at wyndham it is not surprising to find that ket of the famous rebellion was a wyndham man here unfortunately it is necessary to be at partial variance with mr walter rye he writes lingard as of late professor rogers has said that kett's rebellion had a religious origin the former so writing from religious bias the latter from ignorance that is a rather brusque way of putting things for although lingard as a roman catholic was a little apt to think too ill of the effects of henry the eighth's policy towards the religious houses professor rogers deserved to be spoken of with more respect enclosures were of course the main cause for kett's rebellion in fifteen forty nine and kett had a private grudge to avenge against one sergeant flowerdew at the outset but as a wiltshire labourer once said to me where there's stones there's cairn so where there have been great religious houses in england the rebellious spirit manifests itself in the pages of history before and after those houses came to an end at abingdon and at bury st edmunds i quote the two places of which the story happens to be fresh in my memory conflicts were incessant and there is no reason to doubt 
that the state of things was the same at Wyndham. The religious houses had become, with exceptions of course, corrupt within and extortionate without the gates. They were oppressors of the poor, whose best friends they had once been. There was no limit to the variety of the tolls they demanded. They were, by far, the largest landowners in the country. All this had ceased but a very few years before Kett's rebellion, but the spirit which it had created, the very men in whom that spirit had been raised by extortion and injustice, were very much alive. If Kett's rebellion had not such a directly religious origin as Lingard supposed, it is more than likely that it was indirectly due to the spirit of unrest and discontent which always arose in the vicinities of religious houses. Indeed, the very success of Henry VIII's stern treatment of the monasteries is proof positive that he was supported by popular opinion. As for the enclosures, some may have been made by the new lords of manors. Others, and probably the vast majority, had been made by the grasping religious. Moreover, the petition sent up to the king when the rebellion was at its height contained express allusions to religious grievances. It asked that parsons shall be resident and all having a benefice worth more than ten pounds a year, shall, by himself or deputy, teach the poor parish children the catechism and the primer. Not a very outrageous demand, surely, and if we scan the material grievances complained against, establishment of numerous dovecots, and claims to exclusive rights of fishing, for example, we see that they are essentially the grievances which the religious houses had originated. How Kett and his men marched in due course to Mousehold Heath on the outskirts of Norwich, the grievous fighting which followed in and about Norwich, how they killed Lord Sheffield by the palace gates at a spot marked to this day by a stone with an S on it, how Warwick, after many reverses, finally defeated Kett, who was hanged, drawn, and quartered, shall not be told at length in this volume. These things are an essential part of the history of England. They are far and away the most exciting events in the history of Norwich, and, since they cannot be dealt with fully here, they are best passed over with this slight mention. At Wyndham is, or was, an old house having a very curious inscription. Nec mihi glis servus, nec hospes hirudo, which is not quite free from difficulty, even as it stands, for a verb is left to be understood, and it may be sit or est. In the one case the guest hopes, in the other the house boasts, the servant to be no dormouse and the host no leech. Things were worse when somebody read Hirudo as Hirundo, though one might make attractive translations of that too. But we cannot linger over that when we are close to the scene of a tragedy far more recent, and therefore a good deal more affecting than that of Kett's Rebellion. Stanfield Hall is close to Wyndham. It is the reputed birthplace of Amy Robsart, who may or may not have been murdered at Cumnor. Lady Warwick says she was not, and Stanfield Hall was certainly the scene of a series of remarkably cold-blooded murders in times which may still be counted recent prefacing a frank confession that my personal interest in murders is small, which seems to be a misfortune, judging by the enraptured attention they attract from many intelligent and cultivated persons, 
I endeavour to give some account of these murders, partly because I desire to please, partly because a very old friend, now dead, devoted a vast amount of attention to them. His meticulous care in studying the locus in quo may serve to compensate for my lukewarmness as a student of homicide. Nay more, his interest in the subject seems to have been infectious, for, having read his monograph of some five-and-twenty octavo pages on the subject since the foregoing sentence was penned, I am now distinctly conscious of being keen on the subject and of finding interest in it. Truth to tell, it was not the first time of reading. The late Sir Llewellyn Turner of Carnarvon was one of those rare men who, inhabiting remote corners of the provinces, escape provincialism and retain intelligent appreciation of public affairs and a sympathetic interest in all sorts of events. In the year 1902, having committed to paper his memories and opinions upon a large number of subjects, and being all but eighty years old, he entrusted me with the task of preparing his manuscripts for the printers, and he had the satisfaction of seeing himself in print, to the extent of some five hundred pages, with illustrations, before he died. Among the miscellaneous chapters of the book is one entitled Stanfield Hall and its Terrible Tragedies. It is, of course, far too long for quotation, but it is also a treasure house of nice points, some of them, perhaps, new even to precise students of the history of crime. In the year 18-something, I accepted an invitation from my valued friend, connection, and old schoolfellow, Colonel Boyley, to pay him a visit in this interesting old moated house, the scene of fearful murders and bloodshed, that is, the murders of Mr. Isaac Jermy, the recorder of Norwich, of his son, Mr. Isaac Jermy Jermy, and the shooting of Mrs. Jermy Jermy the son's wife and her maid by probably one of the greatest scoundrels that ever disgraced humanity james bloomfield rush the quotation will serve to show that my old friend's literary method is too leisurely and minute to justify the repetition of the story in his own words truth to tell he rambled somewhat and was not unduly particular about the sequence of events. Still, it may be possible after study of his monograph to produce a narrative of this crime having something more of freshness than would follow from reference to the textbooks of crime. For these murders, it must be remembered, were on a colossal scale, and the case, although simple enough in its legal aspect, has a place among the celebrated crimes by virtue of its wholesale character, its beginnings in long-planned roguery, and its culmination in thorough-paced brutality. The foundations of the programme of crime, which was finished on the 28th of November, 1848, were laid many years before and it is a curious study in the wickedness of which human nature is capable to trace the evolution of the scheme. In the second half of the 18th century, the then head of the Jermy family held Stanfield Hall and its estate as, probably, his predecessors of the same name had held it for centuries. Jermian is one of the Norfolk names of an early date, for which Mr. Walter Rye claims a Danish origin, and he was probably a Jermy, or letters to that effect, who, in Tudor times, built Stanfield Hall, and motored it round and about. At any rate, a Jermy held it when our story opens. 
a poor relation of the name sold his reversionary interest in the estate to a mr preston and mr preston came into the estate in the shoes of the poor relation and was able to settle down in stanfield hall outside the lodge gates lay the home farm having james rush for its tenant a plausible fellow it would seem but a whole-souled rascal at heart ascertaining that his landlord was going to london by coach on a given day rush engaged the three remaining inside places for himself and so agreeable did he contrive to make himself to the old man on the journey that he returned to stanfield not merely as tenant of the home farm but also as accredited agent of the estate as such he had access to mr preston's title deeds which he stole before mr preston died so mr preston the elder slept with his fathers if he had any and mr isaac preston his son reigned in his stead rush remaining agent and tenant of home farm and as mr isaac preston was recorder of norwich the beautiful old house within easy access of the great town suited his needs admirably he settled down in it at once and later as we shall see he began to think of adding to the estate when exactly the recorder discovered that the title deeds were missing my authority does not relate but probabilities seem to point to an early discovery coupled with a suspicion which was perhaps difficult to bring home that rush had annexed them that would give rush a hold over the recorder and it is only on that hypothesis that the recorder's subsequent conduct in relation to rush can be explained at one and the same time we find rush practically bankrupt and the heirs of the original jermys egged on by rush into an attempt to recover the family estate in the court of chancery the recorder really was in rather a tight place for the simple reason that he could not have proved his title without the deeds and that he could not bring the theft of them home to rush still he was recorder of norwich and a person of consideration and when the claimants weary of the delays of the court of chancery organized a small army of emergency men in norwich took possession of the house by force and held it barricading the windows and the bridge over the moat the dragoons then quartered in norwich soon restored the peace in so acting the claimants were but following an ancient precedent of the county of norfolk for early in the fifteenth century the duke of norfolk besieged caister castle built by that renowned knight and valiant soldier sir john falstolf then deceased and occupied on what ground does not appear clearly from the paston letters by sir john paston's family there were however material differences between the two cases the first of them being that the duke had apparently at least a show of title to caister castle through the courts while in this case the claimants were anticipating the judgment of the court and the next being a trifle of four centuries for it was so recently as april eighteen thirty nine that john lana daniel wingfield and eighty others the emergency army in fact were indicted for riot at stanfield hall still it is not easy to understand how after so lawless a proceeding at so recent a date the presiding judge could have passed as he did a series of sentences of from three months to one week's imprisonment true it is that the recorder recommended them to mercy as ignorant persons actuated by a mistaken notion of property 
but the sentences are still hard to understand so for that matter are many sentences in these days at about the same time the recorder brought a suit preston versus rush against rush for breach of covenant no doubt in relation to the home farm and it was clearly after this that the recorder went through the process expensive in those days of taking the name of jermy because he found that it was necessary by the old settlements of the estate that the owner should bear the name of jermy a year earlier than the riot so far as i can make out the dates some land called the potash farm came into the market and it is clear from the recorder's conduct over this matter that he felt himself to be very much at the mercy of rush he must have known rush to be practically insolvent he knew that the title deeds were missing and he probably suspected rush yet he sent out rush as his agent to bid for the potash farm which adjoined stanfield park rush came back from the auction having bought the farm not for his master but for himself at a price greater than that to which his master had limited him and the recorder actually lent him five thousand pounds repayable in ten years and secured by mortgage wherewith to complete the purchase of course the price may have been considerably more than five thousand pounds and the bargain may have seemed on the face of it as promising as that which the original preston made with the poor relation but it all sounds as if rush had a stronger hold of the recorder than even the possession of the title deeds would give him or as if the recorder were a strangely nervous and foolish man eight years passed away one knows not how so far as these persons are concerned and the end of them found rush a widower with several children occupying the potash farm and holding another at felmingham fourteen miles off also from the recorder now mr isaac jermy by due form of law at the end of those eight years rush advertised for a governess engaged one emily sandford who replied to the advertisement and betrayed her but she continued to live with him then came november of eighteen forty eight on the last day of which the five thousand pounds was payable and the recorder often entreated would not give rush time it does not appear that the chancery suit had failed utterly and hopelessly but it is clear from the sequel that the original germies had fallen very low in the world and the recorder recognising that they were no longer dangerous may have found courage if so it cost him his life the day of fate and blood was the twenty eighth of november on the evening of that day mr jermy according to his usual custom one no doubt familiar to rush went to the hall door at half past eight to look at the prospects of the weather and the night was fine for the time of year for five persons servant girls and their sweethearts were as the evidence at the trial showed gossiping by the gate beyond the moat only thirty-five yards from the hall door no sooner did mr jermy come out than rush who was disguised shot him dead with a pistol the muzzle of which must almost have touched his body the fourth fifth and sixth ribs were shattered the entire body of the heart was carried away the loiterers on the bridge ran away in terror mr jermy the younger rushing from the drawing-room to see what was the matter was met and shot dead on the spot by rush in the corridor mrs jermy the younger hurrying into the hall saw her husband's body 
ran to call the butler Watson, and was met by her maid, Eliza Chastney. Rush encountered them both in a passage, shot Mrs. Jermy in the arm, and the maid in the thigh and groin. Mrs. Jermy's daughter and the cook ran out by the back door, and took refuge in the coach-house. The coachman jumped into the moat, swam across, and rode to Wyndham for help. As for the butler, he heard the first shot, went into the passage, saw an armed man with a cloak and mask who motioned him to keep off, and, well, he kept off. Rush was arrested at Potash Farm before three o'clock the next morning. His trial, at which Emily Sanford was a most valuable witness for the Crown, and a most deadly one to him, attracted immense attention. Sir Llewellyn says, The excitement throughout the nation exceeded anything of the kind ever known, and the Times actually sent down a printing press to Norwich to report daily the incidents of the magisterial and coroner's inquiries. Perhaps it need hardly be said that inquiry has shown the statement about the Times and the printing press to be entirely without foundation, for since the Times, as a whole, has always been printed in London, and London has always been its place of publication, nothing could have been gained by sending a printing press to Norwich. It would have been just as wise to send a piano, a plough, or a pump but it does not follow that Sir Llewellyn Turner is to be distrusted in other matters, because he knew nothing of the mechanical technicalities of journalism. What happened, no doubt, was that The Times secured and published a very full report, and good folks, wondering how the miracle was performed, hit upon the idea of a special dispatch of a printing press, and were satisfied because an explanation which they could not understand had been set up. Suggestions quite as impossible are made in these days. A correspondent, who very likely cannot write shorthand, is frequently asked whether he hands his shorthand notes directly to the printers or to the telegraphists, neither of whom would be able to cope with the notes if he were capable of making them. Huge crowds attended the funeral of the victims at Wyndham. Immense excitement also was caused by the trial of Rush at Norwich Assizes, although the issue cannot have been in doubt for a moment after the evidence of Emily Sanford. Indeed, the report of the trial is only interesting now as showing, by comparison with discoveries made later, how little the police had found out, and as bearing, especially with reference to the violence of Rush at the trial, upon the kinship of homicidal crime and madness. The attraction of the case consisted then, and consists now in its sheer brutality, and prodigality of bloodshed, and in the long series of cunning plots, to be outlined shortly, by which it was preceded. Within the space of a very few minutes, Rush had murdered two persons, and had grievously wounded two others. He had shown himself to be quite an exceptional paragon of villainy, and public curiosity to see so hardened a ruffian was natural. Nor need it be matter for surprise that the public execution of Rush at Norwich, where the remains of the Norman castle on the mound in the heart of the city were then the jail and the place of execution, was attended by a vast concourse of people. If ever there was a good excuse for gloating over a wretch ignominiously done to death, it was present in the case of James Rush, the wholesale murderer. In all these thoughts, stirred by the sight of Stanfield Hall, there is, it may be, little of novelty to students of crimes and criminals, 
even though many of the details may have been forgotten. But my old friend's monograph has a peculiar interest and value because, although he wrote with the failing memory of one well stricken in years, it is possible to follow in it an elaborate development of criminal cunning almost, if not quite, without parallel in the history of crime. Also, it enables one to see a long string of earlier crimes, probably committed by Rush, which, while they could not have been mentioned at his trial, would have well qualified him for admission to the role of unmitigated miscreants, disgracefully distinguished by preeminence in ill-doing, whom Mr. Thomas Seckham and his associates gibbeted in Twelve Bad Men, published by Fisher Unwin in 1894. His preparations for the crime were of the most elaborate character. His plans for taking the most complete advantage of it when it had been committed, and for so perpetrating it that suspicion might fall upon others, were of an absolutely diabolical ingenuity. Let some of the details of those plans be enumerated. He had provided numerous disguises, some of which were not discovered until long after he had been hanged. He had covered with straw, as if for cattle, his most convenient path to the hall, and his footsteps could not be traced on the straw. He had made Emily Stanford drive with him towards the hall, so that she might be seen with him by a turnpike keeper and the lodge keeper on the 10th of October, 1848, and the 21st of November, 1848. He had forged documents of both those dates, which were afterwards found under the floor of a cupboard in Potash Farm. The first was an agreement between the recorder and himself, whereby the recorder gave him three more years for the payment of the £5,000. The next was an agreement between the same parties that, if Rush gave up the missing title deeds, the recorder would burn the mortgage deeds of Potash Farm and give Rush a lease of the Felmingham estate. It was further agreed that Rush should do all he could to assist the recorder in retaining possession. There was also a forged lease of Felmingham to Rush. To all these, Emily Sanford had signed her name as witness without knowing the contents. To the efficacy of them all, the death of the recorder was indispensable, for, of course, he would have denounced the forgery at once, and the death of Mr. Jeremy the Younger, who knew his father's affairs intimately, would be a decided help. But Rush, although he had no scruples at all about taking life, as he proved very conclusively, had a very considerable regard for the skin of his own neck. The new Jermys were to be ruthlessly exterminated, the old Jermys, or some of them, he did not care how many, were to be hanged, and Rush was to become a rich man. He inveigled some of the old Jermys into the vicinity of Stanfield Hall on the day of the murders. He left on the floor of one of the passages in the hall a warning in printed letters. There are seven of us here, three of us outside, and four inside the hall, all armed as you see us here. If any of you servants offer to leave the premises or to follow, you will be shot dead. Therefore, all of you keep in the servants' hall, and you, nor anybody else, will take any arm, for we are only come to take possession of the Stanfield Hall property. Thomas Jermy, the owner. The very illiteracy of this document may have been designed for the original Jermys, having come down in the world, had, as Rush well knew, come down with a run to the very bottom. 
indeed one of them probably this thomas swore at the trial that he did not know how to write if he had been in the dock instead of in the witness box as rush had planned his mouth would have been closed and with the recorder and his son dead with the memory of the riot of 1839 fresh in the minds of the jury things might have been very awkward for thomas and others of the true germy family they had been seen about the hall on the day of the murders the murderer had disguised himself most likely so that he might be taken for one of the true germies he had not been careful to go unseen though he had avoided observation in leaving potash farm the rude warning printed on the cover of a book was just the kind of missive an illiterate person might be expected to produce and thomas jermy would have stood in quite measurable peril of that last interview with calcraft which rush went through with callous effrontery of the penmanship of the other forged documents it is not possible to speak but their phraseology is sufficiently clear and they might have passed muster the question whether they would have done so or not has however no bearing on the character of rush he had laid his plan with devilish ingenuity he had made all things ready in such fashion as to satisfy his knowledge of what legal documents ought to be it was a plan as complete cunning and merciless as it was possible for man to devise sir llewellyn turner had little doubt that if rush had escaped scot-free and the forged documents or either of them had been effectual rush would have murdered emily sanford also and in the circumstances the view can hardly be stigmatized as uncharitable she would have had rush at her mercy she would have been in his way and rush had no scruples in dealing with those who were in his way it was believed locally that he got rid of his mother and forged a codicil in his own favour to her will that forgery at any rate succeeded for he obtained fifteen hundred pounds by it and the circumstantial story of his stepfather's death by which the money came to the mother raises a strong suspicion that rush murdered his stepfather also it shall be told in sir llewellyn turner's words his stepfather was shot in 1844 he had gone to sleep after dinner which i believe was his custom and from that sleep he was not allowed to wake his mother was ill upstairs and rush's account was that he rush had gone upstairs leaving his gun on a table that hearing a shot he went downstairs and found the gun and his stepfather on the floor the gun having exploded and killed the latter rush himself gave the intelligence to the coroner and he was the only witness his story was believed and a verdict of accidental death was returned but the subsequent career of rush leaves little doubt that the guilt of this murder also lay upon so much of conscience as he possessed stanfield hall then a very beautiful building still although full of tragic memories may justly claim to have been the scene of crimes as brutal planned by a brain as devilish and ruthless as ever were committed in england or found in man from wyndham we swung on to norwich easily and without difficulty or incident of any kind and at half past six or thereabouts passed under an archway into the court of the maid's head and the maid's head 
is an absolute reason for ending one chapter and beginning another. End of chapter 4, part 2section eight of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent spring in norwich and to ely and cambridge part one practical observations Roads fair at outset, worse on approaching Ely. Hills, none of any moment, but no monotony of level until reaching Fordham. Distances, Norwich to Watton, eight miles, Watton to Brandon, thirteen miles, but note well, this is a byway to find which turns sharply to left on reaching the Lynn and Thetford Road. The distance is approximate. Brandon to Mildenhall, nine and a quarter miles. Mildenhall to Fordham, six and a quarter miles. Fordham to Soham, three and a quarter miles. Soham to Ely, five and a quarter miles. Ely to Cambridge, 16 miles. Cambridge to Royston, 13 and a half miles. Caution. Great care should be taken to ascertain the right exit from Norwich. Note. This is not a full day's drive, and in fact left me 70 miles to travel, but it is a convenient exit from East Anglia westwards. From Royston to London is forty two and a quarter miles. We had crawled through the narrow and crooked streets of Norwich to its central market place under the Castle Mound, swinging to the left on entering it. Turning to the left again, we were soon in Tombland, a wide and open space opposite the west end of the cathedral the meaning of the name of which is uncertain. We had seen the cathedral spire rising against the clear sky, had glanced through the two great archways leading to the cathedral church itself, had passed on our left the stranger's house already mentioned, though the quaint fact that the faces of the figures of Hercules and Samson supporting the arch of its door are adorned with imperial beardlets was forgotten then at the end of tombland we were in wensum street and the maid's head was the first house on the right we entered it by an archway some way down the street and forthwith in the covered courtyard there was such a contrast between the old and the new as has never been matched in my experience the surroundings, thanks to Mr. Walter Rye, who bought the ancient house and saved it from destruction, and thereby won the gratitude of every traveller of taste, were as nearly identical with those of the 15th century, when the Pastons used the maid's head and spoke well of its accommodation, as was possible consistently with some modernisms which are indispensable. The bar parlour on our left, from which an attentive hostess issued to take our commands, one felt she ought to have had a chatelaine and a wimple, seemed to be, and was, of almost immemorial age. So did the surroundings generally. Yet in the centre was the most modern thing in this world, the very incarnation of novelty, a motor-car, and a six-cylinder motor-car at that, and staring us in the face was a notice requesting motorists, in effect, to make no unnecessary noise, 
but to deposit their passengers or pick them up as the case might be rapidly as possible and then depart in such surroundings surely no motorist possessed of even decent feeling could stand in need of this request but since it was there it must be assumed that it came into existence because misconduct had shown it to be needed for ourselves we almost felt inclined to push the car instead of compelling it to propel itself onwards through the covered court and into the carriage yard and garage beyond it was and it is a beautiful car for cars can be beautiful and half the assertions that they are ugly are due to the fact that the generation has not been sufficiently educated in relation to cars has not grown familiar enough with them to know what the lines of beauty in them are still in the court of the maid's head the car was an anachronism a jarring note not in the picture and the sooner it was moved out of sight the better so moved it was and the original picture remained the white cap of a chef having a countenance that might pass for french beneath it did not spoil the picture in the least it was easy and very likely correct to imagine that the costume of male cooks and scullions has changed little with the progress of time and the material reflections called up by that white cap were comforting the man or woman who will not confess to enjoying a good dinner is usually either a hypocrite or one who exiled from a real and innocent pleasure of life by a contemptible digestion assumes airs of superiority on the ground of an abstinence due to fear and not to asceticism meanwhile the daughters had gone up a very ancient and charming staircase of real oak really black with real age not through the application of quicklime and water and had been shown into queen elizabeth's chamber but a message that i must visit them there met me in the jacobean bar parlour and the visit was more than worth paying it was a spacious room if its floor area alone was considered but of course the ceiling was very low and the dark beams supporting it were still lower it would have suited hannah moore who loved ceilings you could touch as you stood but it lacked the bishop she required as an accompaniment at least it lacked them then one great bed was of carved oak relieved with gilding another made no impression on my memory but the long and low windows the shining planks of the ancient floor which boasted its own hills and valleys slopes and hollows and the cleanliness and brightness of everything made a very vivid and pleasant impression queen elizabeth may not have slept in that chamber or in the maid's head at all when she visited norwich in 1578 and weird pageants were displayed in her honour i can find no evidence that she did which is not to say that there is none but the maid's head was an old inn even then and it is reasonably certain that the chamber called after queen elizabeth was there also it is an ideal room for those who hanker after the old world but do not yearn for that dirt which the more we think of it seems to have been an all-pervading characteristic of the lives of our forefathers the maid's head is spotlessly clean i prepared to saunter forth into the city for half an hour before dinner but at the foot of the stairs was a person almost perhaps quite a personage whose presence was a happy coincidence 
it has been noted earlier that on a first visit to the royal the ancient wig house of norwich lord kimberley was found to be a guest and by all that was wonderful here at the foot of the stairs of the maid's head was none other than the duke of norfolk with the duchess and both were about to become guests of the ancient hotel heavens what a contrast was this to the scene which would have been presented on a similar visit some two centuries ago in that wonderful chapter on the state of england in sixteen eighty five macaulay has a passage which must needs be quoted although it has been cited very often before and although it has the incidental disadvantage which i feel rather acutely of showing the grand style side by side with mine norwich was the capital of a large and fruitful province it was the residence of a bishop and of a chapter it was the chief seat of the chief manufacture of the realm clothing of course some men distinguished by learning and science had recently dwelt there and no place in the kingdom except the capital and the universities had more attractions for the curious the library the museum the aviary and the botanical garden of sir thomas brown were thought by fellows of the royal society well worthy of a long pilgrimage norwich had also a court in miniature in the heart of the city stood an old palace of the dukes of norfolk said to be the largest town-house in the kingdom out of london in this mansion to which were annexed a tennis court a bowling green and a wilderness stretching along the banks of the wensum the noble family of howard frequently resided and kept a state resembling that of petty sovereigns drink was served to guests in goblets of pure gold the very tongs and shovels were of silver pictures by italian masters adorned the walls the cabinets were filled with a fine collection of gems purchased by that earl of arundel whose marbles are now among the ornaments of oxford here in the year sixteen seventy one charles and his court were sumptuously entertained here too all comers were annually welcomed from christmas to twelfth night ale flowed in oceans for the populace three coaches one of which had been built at a cost of five hundred pounds to contain fourteen persons were sent every afternoon to bring ladies to the festivities and the dancers were always followed by a luxurious banquet when the duke of norfolk came to norwich he was greeted like a king returning to his capital the bells of the cathedral and of st peter mancroft were rung the guns of the castle were fired and the mayor and aldermen waited on their illustrious fellow-citizen with complimentary addresses in the year sixteen ninety three the population of norwich was found by actual enumeration to be between twenty eight and twenty nine thousand souls what a contrast on the ninth of march nineteen o six the duke of norfolk entered a city of between one hundred and twelve and one hundred and thirteen thousand souls the bells of the cathedral and st peter's mancroft were not rung the latter by the way is the crowning ecclesiastical glory of norwich apart from the cathedral and not to be confounded with st peter's permountergate often quoted because its records are curious no guns were fired no mayor and alderman waited upon the duke in his palace because there was no palace any more all that happened was that a quiet bearded english gentleman walked limping slightly 
the reward of service to his country in south africa with a lady to the courtyard of the maid's head hotel and after a parley with the hostess vanished up the stairs and was no more seen it was mere luck that i saw him and that i happened to be able to recognise in this unostentatious figure the premier duke and earl the hereditary earl marshal and chief butler of england he was received with precisely the same courtesy of attention that had been shown to us but without civility received in fact as he desired and in a manner which really did credit to him for it was what he wished and to the quiet dignity of the old hostelry and the city of norwich at large knew not who was within its gates no more was left of the pomp and dignity of the seventeenth century palace and reception than of the clothing trade the duke of norfolk had become in the interval an englishman first and a great power in sussex next and the clothing trade had vanished the city of one hundred and twelve thousand souls odd subsisted as i had been told on the proceeds of boots and mustard the latter industry founded by one of whom a correspondent of the norfolk and norwich notes and queries wrote the original coleman the name means free man was a jolly old fellow who used to give me sixpence and direct me to the house for refreshment it subsisted also as i learned for myself next morning and i venture to say it prospered also as one of the largest agricultural and pastoral centres it has ever been my good fortune to witness times were indeed changed but he would be a rash man who should say that they were changed for the worse in all respects dinner in the coffee-room at the maid's head was pleasant by virtue of its surroundings for the room has an air of antiquity and its deep fireplace charmed the eye because the cookery was distinctly good and the attendance was quiet and prompt as that in a well-ordered private house the final bill next morning too to introduce a most important consideration at the earliest possible moment was quite moderate for england dinner was the time also for gentle allusion to some of the famous associations of the inn the pastons had used and commended it that their words of praise should be blazoned on the outer door seemed right and proper but it was a pity to have placed near them the raptures of modern and not very prominent newspapers sitting in this same inn on the morning of his last fight with kett and his rebels warwick had breakfasted and had then led his men who were camped on the market-place to victory here in the time of the rebellion the royalists resorted says mr rye and it is certain that dame paston's horses were seized here but it is to be feared that mine host of the time had but a scantily filled till for royalists were scarce in the eastern counties freemasons held their lodges in the maid's head so early as seventeen twenty four and it is stated that on one occasion a mrs beatson hid behind the wainscot of the lodge-room and heard all the mysteries whether such there be myself innocent of masonry but closely attached to friends who would certainly have advised me to take steps to enter the brotherhood if it were likely to be to my advantage i have often doubted and still doubt my pleasure was decidedly enhanced by the fact that i knew these things in advance and perhaps a little increased by being able to mention them it was a pride to be able to say 
that the house was built on the site of an ancient palace of the bishops of Norwich, that it stood on Gothic arches, that the assembly room had a minstrel's gallery, that a carving in the smoking room represented a fish, possibly a ray, and that, if so, it probably accounted for the title of the house, for the house was once undoubtedly called either the Myrtle Fish or the Mould Fish. Readings vary, and, if either of them be a ray, a difficulty vanishes, for the sea fishermen of Norfolk call, or called, the ray, Old Maid. Certainly the house did not take its new title on the occasion of Queen Elizabeth's visit, for it was the Maid's Head in 1472, and it is mentioned in a curious petition to Wolsey, unearthed by Mr. Rye. Bless him again for having bought and saved the inn. After dinner, and the necessary interval for rest and burnt sacrifice, two facts became manifest. It was a glorious moonlight night, mild for the time of year, and through all the long day we had hardly walked so many yards as we had traversed in miles. So we started forth, and soon came to the firm conclusion that the pale moonlight is every whit as conducive to a soul-satisfying view of Norwich Cathedral as of fair Melrose. Our first view of the West End, after passing under the great archway, giving on tombland, pleased not a little. But we had read something of the glories of the cathedral, of the apse and the apsidal chapels, of Jesus and St. Luke, abutting on the apse at either side of the east end, and the desire to see them was strong. It was not, however, very easily satisfied, for Norwich Cathedral, like far too many of the stateliest and best-proportioned edifices in our congested islands, is so hedged around with houses that it is difficult to look upon it as a whole form from a sufficient distance. They are interesting houses in their way, venerable some of them, suggestive of peaceful lives spent in scholarly research, but they exasperate by impeding the view, and exasperations provoke memories of Trollope's studies of cathedral society, studies suggesting that its tone is not invariably peaceful nor high-minded, that petty jealousies and scandal can invade the most outwardly tranquil precincts and closes. Nay, more, we all know there is no direct reference here to Norwich, and I cannot remember to have met or to have heard any evil of any inhabitant, male or female, of its ecclesiastical dwellings, that of some cathedral society, Trollope's studies are still essentially true. On this occasion, it is the plain and unvarnished truth that the houses blocked the view, and this not too kindly thought came to mind. The chances are that it would not have thrust itself forward if the houses had not done likewise, and that, in point of narrowness of view, or breadth of it, nothing distinguishes dwellers in deaneries and canon houses, huddled round the walls of a cathedral, from those in others which, having been placed at a respectful distance, allow the outline of the majestic structure to be seen in its pure beauty. At Norwich, too, there is more excuse for the huddling than in many a cathedral city, for space was valuable in Norwich from very early times. Citizens who tax themselves, as those of Norwich did, to protect their city by walls, were not likely to encourage open spaces, lungs, as it is the fashion to call them now, within the walled space 
and the crowding of the precincts of the cathedral by buildings mean and insignificant compared to it the reference is to inhabited houses only is explained by the same cause as the narrow streets of the city itself streets wherein the tramcars render life full of peril by fetching a compass however to the south and without asking directions of any man we contrive to penetrate to a narrow walk beyond the east end of the cathedral and past the cloisters where after finding a point of view giving the eye shelter from the glare of incandescent lamps we looked upon a spectacle of indescribable beauty at the bottom were the swelling curves of the apse and the chapels above them in orderly succession the sloping roof and the wondrously graceful and lofty spire outlined for the moon was behind it with strange clearness and yet softened in the most mysterious fashion for in the borrowed light of the moon is no suspicion of glare to dazzle the eyes how long we gazed spellbound and silent cannot be said time passed out of our thoughts but as we looked i remember a gossamer wreath of detached cloud lying all alone and at quite a low elevation drifted slowly across the face of the heaven and behind the steeple that pointed towards it that was all to describe the scene is utterly beyond my power and probably to convey a complete impression of it is not within the compass of human words for they must proceed step by step idea by idea but the vision was seen long yet the first upward glance revealed the whole of it and the last lingering look showed as much and no more it reduced us to silence then to that silence which is always the unconscious tribute to unspeakable beauty even now no more can be said than that the memory of the vision remains clear and pure as of the most perfect combination of man's work and nature's background it has ever been my privilege to behold in any part of the world what meaneth this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which i hear such was the familiar question that occurred to me when early the next morning i woke to find the light streaming in at my window in the maid's head then i remembered that this was saturday morning and probably market day and i went forth quickly and unlike samuel of old gladly for of all beasts which minister to men's needs the patient kine are to me the most interesting except dogs and besides that if one desires to know something of people as well as of places there are few more profitable fields for easy-going study than a large market for there the inhabitants of the countryside are assembled from far and near with the products of their farms and one may study both man and beast at leisure it was fully quarter to eight before i left the maid's head and five minutes more had passed before i was in the heart of the market already droves of cattle were being driven away to the station probably but hundreds yes literally hundreds and hundreds remained behind and among them circulated drovers dealers and butchers feeling their backs and loins with intelligent hands and less rough in their usage of the beasts it was a pleasure to see than is usual in some other counties sheep there were also and pigs doubtless perhaps in another market it seemed to me not by any means innocent of cattle markets that by some unforeseen piece of luck i must have happened on the occasion of a customary fair 
inquiry proved that this was not so that as a matter of fact this was but such a gathering of cattle as is customary at the season of the year and that i had not reached the scene until the bulk of the business had been transacted it was clear at once that boots and mustard in the former i gathered that cut-throat competition had reduced profits to a minimum and almost to a minus quantity were not by any means the only industries by which norwich stood it was and is an immense cattle market and the stock the general average of quality in which was distinctly high was worth a tremendous lot of money yet as i saw at first it was a market which had more than begun to dwindle away a colossal and altogether gratifying sight notwithstanding it was pleasing to observe that although here and there a black beast or a mongrel might be seen and a considerable number of short horns the norfolk farmers as a body cling to the old east anglian breed of red poles they could not do better the red poles mature early make a lot of beef and are hardy the cows of the breed are admirable milkers and celebrated for remaining long in profit and the absence of horns is a distinct gain when it comes to a matter of transport by train far be it from me to compare the merits of breeds of cattle apart from the environment for that is often rather a foolish thing to do environment matters a great deal and nobly as shorthorns thrive in many parts of the country and at sandringham in norfolk particularly there remains in me a strong conviction that the local breeds red poles in east anglia herefords in the marches and borderland of wales devons in the county from which they take their name castle martins in south wales and welsh black cattle in north wales thrive best in their appointed districts under the conditions to which the normal farmer is more or less bound to expose them they fill in the picture better too than do cattle of a foreign stamp your white-faced hereford seems out of place in berkshire a kerry looks like a toy in hertfordshire only for the gentle jersey cattle mr cobbold has a herd of them at felixstowe but that is a story to come later would i make an exception they however are not farmers cattle for they are worth little to kill and their rich milk sold at ordinary prices as it must be is too small in quantity to be profitable they are for private owners and butter makers only and as such they cannot be surpassed let this headstrong hobby be curbed but let it be added that these burly fair complexioned farmers of norfolk whose very faces seen in considerable numbers convinced one more than much reading of the presence of abundant danish blood in the county looked and acted as if they understood their business thoroughly if they go on breeding gentle red poles the red poles are really quiet of disposition perhaps because inherited instinct tells them it is poor sport to fight without horns it is because the process pays let me add in opposition to a statement seen elsewhere that i saw nothing of that brutal treatment of the animals which is far too usual an accompaniment of the cattle trade so to the general market near the guildhall a grateful sight because more flowers were for sale on the stalls than is usual in provincial markets and the wares particularly the butter and the fowls the latter neatly trussed and wrapped in coarse muslin of spotless cleanliness 
were so nicely exposed for sale leland observed that north folk were said to be full of wiles a barber from hampshire told me that morning when i said i found the people very intelligent that he thought they knew far too much my own view is that of the wiles which consist in cleanly neatness in exposing food for sale it is not possible to find too much and not often easy to find enough in this england of ours of the guildhall really a very interesting example dating from the beginning of the fifteenth century of ingenious work in flint and its contents some mention has been made before and of the interior of the cathedral also but we entered the cathedral once more walking on tiptoes in the grand and empty nave and certainly not disturbing the worshippers in the chancel for service was going on the organ as on a former visit was remarkably impressive and as quite a minor detail i noted part of an almost illegible inscription to one ingloy on the south pillar of the chancel arch in descant most involuntary all he passed what was or is descant none of us knew the necessary if rather humiliating process of reference to a dictionary which it is more honest to confess than it would be to profess to have understood the legend at first sight showed that descant was the first stage in the development of counterpoint so mounting once more to the norman tower on the castle mound to look at the entrance to the museum but not entering for time pressed and our enterprise lay in the open air we repaired to the maid's head discharged the reckoning and were off again to the westward on a windless and rainless day but that wisp of cloud no bigger than a man's hand which we had seen behind the cathedral spire against the pure blue overnight had been the precursor of a grey veil of cloud which overspread the whole face of the sky always to make sure of your exits is one of the golden rules of successful motoring entrances do not matter so much if having followed unknown roads over strange country for many miles you eventually strike the town of your desires that is enough for all practical purposes you are sure to be as near your actual destination as makes no difference to a motor car worthy of mention in almost any town or city in england except london but a wrong exit is fatal our instructions from john ostler of the maid's head who took to a motor kindly as if he had never seen currycomb or dandy brush were elaborate but the leading feature of them was that when we reached the market-place near the guildhall we should ask for what on its spelling we called earlham road ask for the earlham road said john ostler and forthwith sprang into memory the fact that at norwich we were in the heart of that part of east anglia in which the gurneys and their kin were never weary of well-doing and as is the custom of quakers throve amazingly in their business of them of their good deeds of their family life a full account may be found in one of the very best books of what for lack of a better description may be called earnest family gossip need it be added that the book is the gurneys of earlham by augustus j c hare published by george allen of london well perhaps it is necessary to give the information for the two volumes contain little or nothing which is sensational 
they saw the light of day in 1895, and all but the very best of books, to say nothing of a good many of them also, pass out of the mind of a hurrying generation in less than that time, and in much less. Of the Gurneys, of their manifold relatives and connections, of their abundant and honourable commerce, of their share in the making of Norwich, of their sober and intimate family life, it would be a sheer delight to write at length. But this is hardly the place in which to attempt to gain that which has been done remarkably well already. Suffice it, therefore, to commend the book and to quote an unrivalled description of it by a masterly hand. That it happens to be found in the first three pages of the first volume is mere coincidence. Those who are so disposed may, if it pleases them, imagine that they are quoted simply because they come first, and refuse to believe that the volumes are among the familiar acquaintance of one who finds a wholesome and hearty appreciation of the joys of the open air to be entirely consistent with a rational pleasure in books. After leaving the hollow, where the beautiful crocheted spire of Norwich Cathedral and the square masses of its castle rise above the dingy red roofs and blue smoke of the town, the road to Lynn ascends what, generally called an incline, is, in Norfolk, a long hill. After passing its brow, at about three miles from the city, the horizon is fringed by woods, grey in winter, radiant with many tints in summer, which belong to Earlham. This delightful old place has, for centuries, been the property of the Bacon family, and they have never consented to sell it. But since 1786, it has been rented by the Gurneys, a period of a hundred and nine years, perhaps one of the oldest tenancies known for a mansion of the size, though very frequent in the case of farmhouses. Thus, to the Gurney family, it has become the beloved home of five generations. To them, its old chambers are filled with the very odour of holiness. Its ancient gardens and green glades and sparkling river bring thoughts of domestic peace and happiness, which cannot be given in words. Its very name is a refrain of family, unity and love. The little park of Earlham is scarcely more than a paddock, with its fine groups of trees and remains of avenues, in one of which a bacon of old time is still supposed to wander, with the hatchet in his hand which he was using on the day of his death. Where the trees thicken beyond the green slopes, above an oval drive, familiarly called the world, stands the house, whitewashed towards the road by the colour-hating Quaker, second wife of Joseph John Gurney, but infinitely beautiful towards the garden in the pink hues of its brick with grey stone ornaments, and the masses of vine and rose which festoon its two large projecting windows and white central porch. Hence the wide lawn, to which the place owes its chief dignity, spreads away on either side to belts of pine trees, fringed by terraces where masses of snowdrops and aconites gleam among the mossy grass in early spring. The west side of the house is perhaps the oldest part, and bears a date of James I's time on its two narrow gables. Hence the river is seen gleaming and glancing in the hollows, where it is crossed by the single arch of a bridge. From the low hall, with its old-fashioned furniture and pictures, a very short staircase leads to an anteroom opening on the drawing-room, 
where Richmond's striking full-length portrait of Mrs. Fry now occupies a prominent place among the likenesses of her brothers and sisters. Another sitting-room leads to what was the sitting-room of the seven Gurney sisters of the beginning of the nineteenth century, with an old bacon portrait let into the panelling over the fireplace. The dining-room is downstairs, and was the latest addition to the house, a handsome, long and lofty room, built by Mr. Edward Bacon, long Member of Parliament for Norwich, that he might entertain his constituents. Close by is the humble little study, occupied by the father of the numerous Gurney family of three generations ago. But the pleasantest room at Earlham is Mrs. Catherine's chamber, always occupied by the eldest daughter, mother and sister in one, and in which, in her old age, with her beautiful intonation and delicate sense of fitting emphasis, she would assemble the young Norwich clergy to teach them how the scriptures should be read in church. Surely Mr. Hare, who wrote many a vivid description, was often entertaining and sometimes a little spiteful, never penned a passage better calculated than this to bring home the characters of a home and of the dwellers in it. The single trace of the old Adam, or the old Augustus, is the gently sarcastic antithesis of Richmond's portrait and the likenesses. Burlam's peace and goodwill bewitched Augustus Hare, and those who had been entertained by his bitterness, no less than those who have writhed under it, will recognise the strength of Earlham's tranquil witchery. Somewhere I have read of late that the Gurneys are of Earlham no more. That is sad indeed. End of chapter 5, part 1Section 9 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. Spring in Norwich and to Ely and Cambridge. Part 2. Ask for the Arlham Road when you are near the Guildhall, was what John Osler said, and we, full of map and guidebook pride, translated it into Earlham. But we were reduced to Arlham at last. Even in England it is wise to adopt local pronunciations of place names when you know them, unless you have plenty of leisure, and it is easy to do so. In Wales, it is equally wise, indeed wiser, for collocations of apparently English characters have totally distinct values in Welsh words, but English lips have, I am given to understand, some difficulty in expressing those values. Apart from place names, it seemed to me, talking often and freely with the natives, that the spread of education has banished not a little of the Norfolk dialect, and that the country folk of Norfolk pronounce in a more clean-cut fashion, use more ordinary English words, and are easier to understand than their contemporaries in Berkshire, Sussex, Devon, Cornwall, or infinitely most difficult of all, Durham among sundry quaint books lent to me by way of preparation for this are several containing terrific examples of norfolk dialect which it would be a real pleasure to transcribe but it must be confessed frankly that at the moment of writing i have no more excuse in experience for copying them out than for introducing a sentence or two of welsh 
Gaelic, or Erse. Yet I am, in the matter of tours to be described, many hundreds of miles ahead of the point which my lagging pen has reached. Suffice it to say that the Norfolk dialect may survive, that I have heard it from the lips of cultivated folk of Norfolk, whose normal talk is the same as that of any educated English folk, but that it has not come my way as an everyday phenomenon. Is that matter for regret? Sentimentally, perhaps, it is, but practically it is a decided convenience, and, combined with the exceptional intelligence of the East Anglian people, it seems to argue that the schoolmaster has been abroad among them to good purpose. Dialects may be picturesque. The words in them may have philological interest, especially when they are good and old words like largesse, much used in East Anglia, but by no means peculiar to it but persistence in sheer mispronunciation, which is the main ingredient of most dialects, is really a sign of ignorance or of affectation, and neither is to be encouraged. For example, I can talk and can approach fairly near to writing English, as she is spoke, by the more ignorant Welsh, without any difficulty and that is as much a dialect, really, as that of Devon or of Yorkshire, but it would be a very foolish and inconvenient thing to do. Nothing could have been more delightful, for the time of year, than the travelling, for the air was not too cold, hedges had the unmistakable air of verdure on the point of coming, tree twigs seemed to have thickened as the buds upon them swelled, spring was in the air and the steaming horses we pass now and again in adjacent fields straining at plough or harrow added to the pleasing effect of a landscape undulating a little but rich in tall trees looking on them from time to time i remembered the lines in the freer's tale the carter smote and cried as he were woed height scott Height Brock. This may sound like affectation, but it is nothing of the kind. Although most travellers in spring are apt to quote, more or less correctly, the first few lines of the Canterbury Tales, because they are familiar and because, for simplicity, sweetness, and truth, they are not to be surpassed in the English language. One does not at least the ordinary man does not, go about the whole country with all Chaucer on the tip of his tongue. And that, on the whole, is a blessing. On this occasion, however, there was an express reason for having these lines in mind. There were even two reasons, and for looking for a farm horse as an excuse for letting them fly. The first reason was, that East Anglian antiquaries have long cherished the tradition that Chaucer was born in Norfolk. There is even a jingling rhyme. Lynn had the honour to present the world with Geoffrey Chaucer, and the curled pate a Lanus de Lena. The rhyme may be true of a Lanus de Lena. It does not matter much whether it be true or false but it is undoubtedly false about Chaucer, who was the son of a London vintner, and was born at Charing Cross, and at Charing Cross, London, not Charing Cross in Norwich, as the learned have now discovered for certain. Still, it is a peculiar fact that it is, or is reported to be, the custom of Norfolk farms to apply the name Scott to a very large proportion of their farm horses, and it is true that Chaucer's poetry shows a very intimate knowledge of rural life in Norfolk. The explanation may be found on family tradition, for Dr. Skeet says, 
it is probable that the Chaucer family came originally from Norfolk. The second reason was soon to come on the left-hand side of the road in the form of a park, boasting superb trees and ensconcing Kimberley Hall, the seat of the Woodhouse family, who are of far more ancient standing in Norfolk than is the present hall. It was built on Italian lines in the reign of good Queen Anne, but the Woodhouses, of whom Lord Kimberley is the head, had been in the land long before Philip Woodhouse, Member of Parliament for Castle Rising, was created a baronet by James I. Not that the honour attached the family to the Stuart cause, for Sir Thomas, the second baronet, sat in the Long Parliament and, I think, fought for it against Charles. Clearly they were a fighting family. Agincourt is inscribed under their coat of arms. Their crest is a dexter arm, cooped below the elbow, vested argent, and grasping a club or, and over it, the motto Frappe Fort. The quotation comes apposightly, or at any rate, one striking word in it does, because the supporters are two wild wood men, wreathed about the loins, and holding in the exterior hand a club, raised in the attitude of striking sable. Yet, with this explanation always before them, staring them hard in the face whensoever a head of the house of Kimberley has been summoned to sleep with his fathers, some good folk of Norfolk have, as the notes and queries show, been content to puzzle their brains, and to seek far for an explanation of the wild man as a tavern sign. They have even gone so far as to drag in the historic Peter the Wild Man quite unnecessarily, for he is modern by comparison with the wood men who support the Woodhouse crest now, as they supported it, no doubt, in the spacious days of Queen Elizabeth, when she visited in 1571 a Kimberley Hall which modern taste would probably prefer to the present Italian edifice. Almost immediately after passing Kimberley Hall, we came into full view of Hingham Church, which is exactly what a church should be, and stands exactly as a church ought to stand for the purposes of the motorist. That is to say, it is a very commanding edifice, which has the appearance, at any rate, of standing with its length at right angles to the road, and both tower and clerestory, surely there are more clerestories as well as more churches to be found in Norfolk than in any county, are visible, and very imposing from a great distance. It was built for the most part by Remedius of Heatherset, who was rector for forty years from 1319, and is of most remarkable height. Inside, most motorists will be content to believe, are some interesting tombs and much stained glass of admirable quality, presented by Lord Woodhouse in 1813. In fact, Hingham is emphatically one of the places at which a halt ought to be made, for old stained glass of high merit is, unhappily, very rare in this England of ours. This secluded village of Hingham ought to be, perhaps is, one of the places in England to which Americans make pilgrimages, for far away in Massachusetts is another Hingham, owing its origin to an emigration, early in the 17th century, of one Robert Peck, vicar of Hingham, and many of his parishioners. Apparently, Parson and parishioners were Puritans of the violent order, who pulled down the altar rails and lowered the altar, insomuch as they incurred the wrath of the reigning bishop. 
Parson Peck deemed it wise to flee from the wrath to come, and many of his parishioners went with him. Settling down in Massachusetts, they gave the name of the old village in Norfolk to the new home, and although the parson returned to his cure when Puritanism got the upper hand, parishioners stayed in the new world. At any rate, Hingham, Massachusetts, exists to this day, not, indeed, as one of America's mammoth cities, but with a population, in 1900, of 5,059, of whom oddly enough more than 900 were foreigners. In fact, in its minor way, it is as much more important than Hingham in Norfolk, as Boston, Massachusetts, is greater than Boston, Lincolnshire. But it is not likely to be more pleasing to the eye, and it is very safe to conjecture that, in fact, it is not a tenth so pleasing as the Norfolk village. Before long, we reach Scalton Mere, a silent sheet of gleaming grey, with not a bird to be seen on or over it, a fine expanse of sedge-girt water. Here, says Murray, the black-headed gull breeds in enormous numbers, and their eggs are collected to be sold as plovers' eggs by thousands for the London market. This may readily be believed, for the eggs of Larus ridibundus, although they vary a good deal in marking, are often practically indistinguishable from those of the green plover or grey plover, except that they are not so sharply pointed at the small end. The imposture does not matter a straw, so long as the two kinds of eggs remain, as they are at present, identical in point of flavour. Indeed, the subject prompts a digression, flagrantly irrelevant, but certainly pardonable for its practical value. Ten or twelve years ago, the owner of Hanmer Mere, which is situate at about the point where Shropshire and Flintshire are so inextricably mixed that an ordinary atlas will not tell you which is which, desiring to reduce the number of the coots, spent an afternoon with a friend in taking some two hundred eggs. It seemed a pity to destroy them without trying them cold and hard-boiled, like plovers' eggs. They were every whit as good to eat, and they were distinctly the clow of luncheon at Chester Races next day. This is certainly worth knowing, for, if plovers be more numerous than coots, there are enough coots and to spare, and their nests are as easy to find as those of plovers are difficult. But Murray proceeds. There are only three breeding places of this gull in Britain. This must be quite wrong. The late Mr. Henry Seabohm, whose Eggs of British Birds, published by Pawnson and Brailsford, Sheffield, is both admirably produced and of the highest authority, wrote, and Dr. Bowdler Sharp, left the passage in editing the book after Mr. Seabohm's death. The black-headed gull is one of our commonest species. Its colonies are not so large as those of the kittiwake, but they are much more numerous. It is a resident in the British Isles, frequenting the coast during winter, but retiring inland in summer to breed in colonies and swamps. Now Mr. Henry Seabohm was a mighty ornithologist, and the most indefatigable birds nester at home and abroad who ever lived, and, having read often before, and now again, all he has to say of the nesting places of all kinds of gulls claimable by Great Britain, I am convinced that this claim set up by Murray, perhaps on the word of some local fowler, cannot be maintained either in relation to the black-headed gull or any other kind of gull or tern that breeds in England. 
leaving Skelton Mere behind, we were again in a land of flat heaths of wide extent, and of sheltering hedges of dense Scotch fir. It was a country of the most pleasing face, but, apart from that, no use for any purposes save those of the motorist and the rabbit breeder. That it had been well used by the latter, evidence was soon apparent on the roadside in the form of a gang of men with nets, dogs and ferrets, pursuing their operations on such a scale, and so completely in the open, that they must surely have been authorised rabbit catchers and not poachers. Still, the thought occurred to me that, in bygone days and in far distant North Wales, we always found from the advertisements that ferrets, who are the poacher's best friends, were to be obtained more easily from Norfolk than from any other part of the country, and that they knew their work very well when they arrived. In fact, there is a huge head of game in Norfolk, and where that state of things exists, there poachers will be. Theirs is a lawless pursuit, of course, but, Lord, as Mr. Pepys would have said, what good sport it must be on a shiny night in the season of the year, and what a vast and intimate knowledge of animal and bird life these poachers must possess. If it was a rabbit catcher's paradise, it was a motorist's paradise also. There was no possible danger to human beings, for, after the rabbit catchers, there were none. After the fir hedges had been passed, the road became an unfenced ribbon of tawny grey running through the bare heath, with no other roads debouching into it, and no cover of any sort for a police trap. There was no reason in life against a good spin at top speed, except that superstitious regard for the letter of the law, which not one man in a thousand really has. The car simply flew forward. The speed indicator marked 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, and even 50 miles an hour. The road seemed to open wide to our advent, to stretch out its arms, so to speak, to embrace us. The motion, smooth, swifter, and swifter still, even as the flight of the albatross that stirreth not his wings, and absolutely free from vibration, was, in a single word, divine. Suddenly, a few miles in front of us, a dusty cloud hove in sight over the road. There, said my friend, half in jest, but only half, for a motorist paradise is at its best when solitary, is one of those beastly motor cars. What a foul dust it is raising! So it turned out, on rising and looking back over the Cape Hood, were we. Not that it mattered, for no wayfarers had been passed, or, therefore, powdered, for many a short mile. I had written a long mile, from force of habit, but it would have been inappropriate. Was the other car meeting us, or going in the same direction? In the same direction, surely, for though the cloud of dust was coming nearer to us, it was not approaching very fast. So we determined to pass as soon as might be, and, giving her a little more gas, we were very soon on terms, as a racing man would say, with a two-seated car going along the middle of the road at a fair pace. Once, twice, thrice our horn sounded, but the occupants of that car never heard us. At last, keeping well to the off-side of the road, and when our bonnet was level with their rear off-wheel, Mr. Johnson and I gave a simultaneous and stentorian yell, and the two pairs of goggles that were turned upon us, who were then, as nearly always, 
ungoggled, clearly covered four eyes starting with surprise. It was a lesson to them, and to us, of the very poor penetrative power of a motor horn in relation to motor cars in front, and of the necessity of looking behind you now and again, especially if you be in a noisy car. So that two-seated car was passed as if it had been standing still, and the lot of the dust recipient, which one or other must needs endure for a while, was transferred from us to them. But they were not called upon to endure it, nor could they have kept it if they had so desired for any length of time. So hey for Watton, near which lies Wayland Wood, fondly famous in local story as being the identical wood in which the ill-fated babes in the wood were lost. That is a tradition as to the origin and true locality of which, so far as I know, even the most ardent folklorists have not concerned themselves very seriously, and certainly the likeness of sound between Wayland and Wailing may have caused it to be localised here. As it happens, however, there is a very much simpler explanation of the name of the wood and of the hundred in which it is situated. Wayland is simply the modern representation of the Wainland of Doomsday, and that again is simply descriptive, like Blacklands in Berkshire, and the names of scores of hundreds besides. For Wainland is just one land, and the more one land than this, from the agricultural point of view, it would be hard to find. Islington in Norfolk may be, in all probability was, the place in which the bailiff's daughter lived, and was beloved by the squire's son. But Wayland Wood cannot detain us. It has no more claim to this particular honour than a hundred other woods in other parts of the kingdom have, except upon an etymological basis, and that has the trifling disadvantage of being quite wrong. Nor did Watton detain us, any more than it need detain anybody else. Brandon, the next place passed, was renowned in ancient times for its rabbits and its quarries of gunflints, and the Grimes graves in the vicinity are said to be interesting earthworks. The glory of the rabbits remains, but the gunflint trade was, of course, vanished. Murray, it is true, says that flints are still, in 1875, exported to Arab tribes round the Mediterranean, but that was more than thirty years ago, and Mr. Rye is, no doubt, correct in saying that the old industry has, naturally enough, died out of late years. But those desert tribes on the African coast of the Mediterranean still use some charmingly antique pieces, and it may be that Brandon flints are still fitted to some of them. They were the same kind of flints which the ancient Briton, or perhaps Neolithic man, used to dig out at Brandon, for excavations some time since revealed a stag's antler, says Murray, in what was clearly a working of a prehistoric flint quarry. Thus much the writer tells us, and no more. It would really have been much more interesting to know something of the nature of the antler, but on that point he is silent. If one were in a hurry, and a train happened to be convenient, it would, for once, be simpler to reach Ely from Brandon by train than by car for the railway follows the course of the Brandon River across Moe Fen, and then cuts straight across Burnt Fen and Middle Fen to Ely. On the other hand, the road, dating very likely to a period long before the reclamation of the Fens, 
and keeping to the high ground turn south-west by south to mildenhall and then skirting mildenhall fen nearly due west to fordham and soham and from soham northwest to ely and this is a long way round here there would be a first-rate opportunity for saying something of the romantic history of the fens for it is truly romantic and of the real glamour which they exercise upon a traveller through their midst the opportunity is deliberately reserved to a later point for three reasons first there is much to be said on other matters secondly you really do not see very much of the fens by this line of route thirdly it was found later that the drive from lynn to ely is par excellence the occasion upon which the peculiar character of the fens their limitless extent their rich and black soil and the reflection that all this wealth has been reclaimed from the wasting waters by the industry and the enterprise of man the very spirit of the fens in fact enter into the traveller's soul fordham and even soham with its remarkable church and its legends of canute's passage over the long vanished mere upon the ice were passed almost unnoticed for our eyes were fixed upon the horizon in front in longing for the vision often seen from a train of ely cathedral rising in beautiful majesty from the centre of the plain girt isle once fengirt in which the saxon made almost his last heroic stand against the all-conquering norman truth to tell for this once only the train has the advantage of the motor-car in providing a splendid and memorable spectacle approaching ely from cambridge by rail one sees the cathedral and the cathedral is the only object that catches the eye for miles and miles and then miles it is a divine sight stirring up memories of canute and of emma his queen of ravaging william the conqueror concerning whom the saxon chroniclers probably wrote without exaggerated regard for truth and of the heroic figure of hereward the wake memories of this vision often seen never to be forgotten had prepared us for something really great and for prolonged enjoyment of it as a fact and it was one which intelligent study of a contour map might have prepared us for the vision did not break upon our eyes until we were through soham and speeding along the causeway built by hervé le breton early in the twelfth century across the mere which stood where the golden corn is reaped and tied and carried every autumn now when it came it was be it stated with the more warmth now in that what is to be written shortly is not entirely the conventional view supremely lovely the air was of that pellucid transparency which is the sure prelude of rain at a distance of four miles or thereabouts the eye could distinguish shades of colour could follow all the delicate tracery of the central octagon and of the huge western tower and it was natural remembering that ely is one of the largest cathedrals in europe to observe that so excellent are its proportions it does not impress the spectator from a distance by its length this very excellent effort is due doubtless to allen of walsingham's fourteenth century design for a grandly broad basis to the octagon tower under which he lies and here rhapsody must cease at the command of candour i had visited ely before as quite a young man i had read much of the history of the cathedral 
much concerning its architecture yet this time it failed to please as a whole within or without when viewed at close quarters the octagon regarded from a distance of not many hundred feet looked to be wanting in substance rather than possessed of airy grace somehow or other in the perverse fashion which is at once irresistible and fatal to cordial admiration it suggested to my mind a ludicrous comparison resist as i might i continued to think of wedding cakes the western tower so far as it was built by bishop riddle in the twelfth century that is to say up to the level of the calestery of the nave seemed and was and is proud substantial massive impressive but the decorated superstructure an octagon with turrets alongside did not satisfy at all nor do i believe that it would have been more satisfying even if the slender spire of wood long vanished from its top had survived on me it produced and i found that it has produced on other and more highly cultivated men an impression of flimsy and jarring incongruity far other was the effect of looking at the honest red brick of the bishop's palace near the west door for the gently warm tone of the bricks builded as our forefathers loved in the reign of the first tudor king was a joy and a rest to the eye before entering the cathedral itself we took luncheon at the lamb for a hungry man is an impatient sightseer but even after that to one returning in contented mood the outside of the western tower satisfied only up to the level of the calestery in fact the original impression whether it argued crass ineptitude or no remained and it is better to write oneself down a bore than to invent raptures which would be untrue inside our experiences were unfortunate the ladies had gone before had seen and enjoyed a good deal my friend and i entered with due reverence the vastness of the nave took Sazen of us at once, but the charm was rudely broken. To us approached a verger of immemorial age. He had informed the ladies that he had been attached to the cathedral for half a century. Wearing a velvet skull-cap, and saying in strident tones, "'It is a fine cathedral, gentlemen. Have you seen it before?' "'Yes,' said i shortly and hoping to be rid of him for to have a babbling guide at one's elbow on occasions of this kind is fatal to intelligent enjoyment but the hope was vain he joined himself to us and went on talking in despair we divided forces and walked briskly away in opposite directions nothing daunted he stood in the middle and talked louder than ever so after admiring the inside of the octagon which is very fine and failing to admire the roof of the nave we left in despair without having studied the architecture in detail without seeing the hammer beams of the transept roofs without lingering over the original norman work in the transepts to us it was a loss and a bitter disappointment but there are some inflictions that are beyond bearing and this doubtless worthy old gentleman was one of them still there are compensations in things and nothing is made quite in vain one of the objects for which this verger was created was that of saving the reader from the infliction of an essay on the architecture of ely cathedral by one who has by his unashamed candour demonstrated himself unworthy to indite such an essay 
the rest of this expedition may be condensed into a paragraph and that not unduly long leaving ely we reach cambridge easily by a flat straight excellent and perfectly uninteresting road marked in the maps as roman but the wise man for reasons already given calls no road roman until he knows for certain that it is such there is however some evidence for this roman road passing quickly through cambridge and over the gog magog hills without noticing them we were soon at royston and from that point to oxford as it happened we were beyond my manor two things happened though which may occur any day or night it began to rain hard just after royston and went on raining and we had trouble in lighting the acetylene lamps after aylesbury neither mattered it was something to have an opportunity of testing the cape hood and the acetylene lamps were after all only a reminder that everything does not always go absolutely smoothly even in the best regulated motor cars we got wet of course on the driving seat but that was of no moment for we were homeward bound and as for the appetite that was carried home the face glowing with clean rain the feeling of overflowing health and the dreamless sleep of that night they were well worth a king's ransom end of chapter five part two Section 10 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. London, Felixstowe, Dunwich, Felixstowe. Part 1. Practical Observations important note the route out of london eastwards given below under distances is believed to be incomparably the best in that direction it is therefore given with great particularity of instruction the distances having been mechanically recorded without care it is easily missed on the inward journey roads bile with crumbling surface of gravel in epping forest good from chelmsford to felixstowe fair from felixstowe to saxmundham farm tracks were tried beyond saxmundham they were found soft rough but not injurious to tyres hills worthy of respect in epping forest owing to bad surface round colchester on leaving Ipswich, and on leaving Dunwich. Distances and Special Directions Oxford Circus to Epping, 22.7 miles. Proceed via Regent Street, Langham Place, Portland Place, Park Crescent to Euston Road. Turn to the right and go straight on past King's Cross Station turn to left into york road which followed to tram lines in camden road here turn to the right and follow tramway lines across holloway road into seven sisters road continue to follow tramway lines to manor house and there taking the right hand fork of tram lines go on to red brick structure in the centre of the road here incline to the left and follow tram lines through tottenham high road to edmonton nine point nine miles and go straight on to ponder's end here at the two brewers turn to the right go over a level crossing at ponder's end beyond the crossing the road passes through fields 
but two gates less than three quarters of a mile apart must be watched for go straight on to chingford thirteen point eight miles look out for loughton and epping signpost which points to whitehall lane and at the end of whitehall lane fifteen point four miles turn to the left and proceed to buckhurst hill then bear to the right at the next fork where signpost directs to loughton seventeen point six miles and epping distances from epping to felixstowe epping to ongar seven and a half miles ongar to chelmsford eleven and three quarter miles chelmsford to colchester twenty three and a quarter miles colchester to ipswich sixteen and three quarter miles ipswich to felixstowe eleven and a half miles felixstowe to dunnage and back distances approximate owing to use of byways and farm tracks felixstowe to woodbridge ten miles woodbridge to saxmundham twelve and three quarter miles saxmundham to dunnage thirteen and a half miles dunnage to felixstowe thirty one miles at precisely ten minutes past three in the afternoon of the seventeenth of march an eighteen horsepower white steam car glided out of kingley street regent street at ten minutes to four without any undue haste in driving it was out in the open country at ponder's end the route taken being by way of york road hard by king's cross station and seven sisters road this route which involves but three turns if the right ones are chosen is at once the quickest way out of london to the eastward far less unpleasant to eye nostrils and ears than the drive through whitechapel far less difficult in the matter of traffic and it has the further advantage of leading the traveller almost at once into scenes of sylvan beauty more often raved about to the sceptical than seen by the eyes of the wise for these reasons it is given with pharmaceutical detail in the practical observations the occupants of the car were mr frederick coleman london manager of the white steam car company of the united states mrs coleman a lady possessing the rare gift of a remarkably exact topographical memory their child my wife and myself and a mechanic who sat contentedly after the manner of his kind at my feet the car was fitted with cape hood for use if necessary and in the way of luggage it carried two fair-sized suitcases upon a platform astern containing all the impedimenta which could reasonably be required by folks who intended to travel by day and to rest comfortably at hotels in the evening it may be added that we had no absolutely fixed plan for we meant to drift whither we pleased allowing fancy or inclination to dictate to us the time for halting and the resting place for the night the expedition had been anticipated with considerably more than ordinary interest because although it had been my lot to be much in motors since motors invaded england it had not been my fortune ever before to take a long drive in a white steam car a very large number of motorists must be as in fact i know that they are without personal experience of a white steam car although it may well be that they are familiar with reports to its prejudice or silent shrugging of the shoulders and raising of the eyebrows when it is mentioned which are perfectly natural and excusable i can readily imagine 
that if I had a pecuniary interest in any of the leading types of petrol-driven cars, between which there is next to no room for choice, I might show no headlong desire to testify in favour of a car moving more smoothly than any petrol car, free from the nuisance of a starting handle. It is a danger too sometimes, as the broken arm of a friend's careless chauffeur has shown recently, absolved from the necessity of change speed gear, capable of an astonishing turn of speed, singularly strong in hill climbing, and considerably less expensive than any petrol driven car of equal power. By power, I do not mean horsepower. The best plan, perhaps, of avoiding the temptation to give such testimony would be to avoid the preliminary experience and not to try a white steam car at all. Having no financial interest in any kind of car, being well aware that even among motorists crass ignorance on the subject of this type of car prevails, having heard from private friends, complete strangers to the motor car industry, that white cars have given them complete satisfaction, and that, in their opinion, the public needs enlightenment on the subject. I deem it right to give some account of the 1906 model of the white steam cars. Now this is an age of advertisement, and, therefore, of necessity, an age given to suspect latent advertisement. It is therefore prudent to state that no consideration of any kind has passed or will pass from the white steam car company or anybody connected with it to me or to the publishers, that nobody connected with the company has even a suspicion that I am going to attempt to describe the car, that anybody connected with the company could do it more accurately, and that there is no other motive in writing than a desire to make known a good thing to those who may be fortunate enough to be able to obtain it. Every motorist, and many a man and woman, not fairly to be described as such, is familiar with the general principles underlying every petrol-driven car, and the distinctions between types of petrol cars are due entirely to little differences of detail in the application of those principles. That is why no description of a petrol-driven car is necessary in these pages, or could be tolerated in them. Very few motorists really know anything about white steam cars, and that is why they are described in short and popular language. Perhaps the best justification for it is to be found in a personal explanation. A week or so after this expedition ended, I met in Piccadilly a friend, high in the service of the Crown, and of large private means, whose name it would be a breach of faith to publish. But, as a guarantee of good faith, I here state that, in the margin of the manuscript, I have written the name for the private information of the publishers. It is one which would carry a great deal of weight if it were printed. I had left my friend's house in May 1905, after trying with him a French and English car, both of well-known makes, of which he was very proud. After our first greeting in March 1906, I remarked that I had been trying a white steam car exhaustively, and that I was simply astonished by its capabilities. It turned out that, in the interval, he had acquired one, and he was entirely at one with me. I am delighted with it. So is my man. The public ought to know about it. Those were the ipsissima verba of an absolutely independent man, 
whose mechanical and engineering knowledge is far above the average, whom, as an exacting judge of sheer comfort, his friends believe to have no superior in this world. After that, let him who pleases suspect latent advertisement. In fact, on y soit qui mal y pense, and let the truth be told. A white steam car is, in general outline and appearance, very like a petrol-driven car, and the cautious Mr. Worley Beaumont, who is honorary consulting engineer to the automobile club and consulting engineer to the commissioner of metropolitan police, has written thus. The makers of these cars are to be congratulated upon the possession and development of a type of steam generator which, in combination with a cleverly designed engine and well-devised and constructed auxiliary gear and parts, has made it possible to produce a car capable of continuing to compare favourably with those propelled by the petrol engine. The essential points are the steam generator, which it is simpler to call the boiler, and the burner or fire. The generator is an ingenious arrangement of coiled tubes, fed with water from the top, always containing, when the fire has been kindled, some water as well as a sufficient supply of superheated steam. The burner is, to quote Mr. Beaumont, in form a shallow drum, the upper face of which is annularly ridged. The ridges are sawn or slit through at close intervals, and provide openings through which the combustible gas and air mixture combines with additional air flowing upwards through the numerous openings in the tubes. In other words, the fuel, petrol, or benzoline, ingeniously vaporized, is forced into the annular ridges, there mixes with air, and the mixture burns fiercely. The steam temperature is most cleverly controlled by the thermostat, which may be described sufficiently for popular purposes by stating that it regulates the force of the fire automatically by the temperature of the steam, the automatic regulation being founded on the different expansions of brass and steel under varying degrees of heat. There are great opportunities, too, for humouring the engine, through the burner and generator, of course, by the adroit use of the throttle. These are the essentials. The drawbacks, if such they be, to this kind of steam car are that it needs to have its burner lighted for a period varying from three to five minutes in the morning before starting, and that it requires a fresh supply of water for every 150 miles or so. The second requirement is really of no moment in this country. The first, it has been argued with all appearance of seriousness, renders this steam car inferior to a petrol car in efficiency. Now this, unless efficiency, has merely technical signification, is absurd. Substantially, even if the hour of setting forth has not been fixed beforehand, one can always afford to wait three minutes before starting on a drive. If it comes to that, so much time is usually occupied in wrapping oneself up and in bestowing passengers, and in any ordinary acceptation of the word, the starting handle, which must be applied after every substantial halt, is the most inefficient device conceivable. Other drawbacks, candidly, I found none, except that, on our first day, some new asbestos packing made itself perceptible to the nostrils, and there was no question that the absence of change-speed gear and the absolute smoothness 
with which more power could be applied when necessary on hills were a genuine pleasure that however was the lesson learned in the course of several days so far as the narrative went we had only passed out of london to ponder's end which was of no interest then we were at chingford on an absolutely lovely day and the beauty of the forest of epping its popularity among londoners and the villainous quality of its roads became simultaneously apparent concerning the roads murray says the forest roads are no longer as in Pepys's days, when he complained that riding in the main way was like riding in a kennel. On verifying the quotation, it appears possible that Mr. Pepys has been misunderstood, but not too clear what he really meant. He had reached Epping overnight, after a visit to Audley End House, where we drank a most admirable drink, and his entry of the 28th of February runs, Up in the morning, then to London through the forest, where we found the way good, but only in one path, which we kept as though we had rode through a kennel all the way. The meaning of the last clause is perhaps a little obscure, but it is at least clear that Mr. Pepys, following the road by which we travelled in 1906, in all probability, found it tolerable when all the rest were bad. He was more fortunate than we were, for all the way from Chingford, past Buckhurst Hill to Epping, the road was atrocious. It was the sort of road, too, which promised to remain scandalously bad, until such time as it should be taken thoroughly in hand on some new principle, since it appeared to be made of gravel and dirt, fairly firm in the middle, but shockingly ploughed up at the sides. On this fine day, it was crowded with holiday traffic, with persons walking on the footpath by the side, with bicyclists innumerable struggling over the broken surface, with hired carriages carrying family parties for a drive in the sun through the heart of the forest. If popularity of resort be a reason why a road should be good rather than bad, as surely it ought to be, then some authority has a good deal to answer for. This was, shameful to relate, my first visit to Epping Forest, but, before giving a first impression of it, there is a ghost to be exorcised. So often as my mind recurs to this passage through the heart of the forest, it is haunted by the memory of one particular cyclist. He was thin, pale to the point of haggardness, anything than robust to look at. He crouched forward over his handlebars, in the manner beloved of the scorcher, and depriving the exercise of any health-giving effects it might produce, until his back was parallel to the road. We were travelling, designedly as a test of the car, and accurately as the speedometer bore witness, at a steady and unvarying pace of twenty miles an hour, on the level on downhill gradients and up hills which, while they offered no sort of trouble to a powerful car, would have made me grunt and grumble and go slowly if I had been on a bicycle. Yet this apparent weakling clung to us, being in fact never more than twenty yards behind us for many miles, without showing any signs of severe effort, save in the tense features of his pallid face. It was really a great achievement, greater probably than the bicyclist was aware. It exemplified the effort of an air shield and the value of a pacemaker in races, but it was a relief when, at last, the pale-faced bicyclist relinquished the pursuit. 
is it wrong to give an impression of epping forest in early spring an impression resulting from a single passage through it surely not did not james anthony froude say or did not somebody say in defence of james anthony froude it really does not matter which something to the effect that a man may write a tolerable description of a country from a single visit or a thorough account of it after prolonged study but that in the intervening period he cannot describe it at all whosoever said it or even if it was never said until now it is a true saying for in the period between first impression and thorough knowledge the mind is so much hampered with details that it cannot survey the whole in proportion it cannot see the wood for the trees of this epping forest i knew as most men do something from hearsay and from desultory reading i had read of the ancient rites apparently rather problematical as a matter of history of the city and the forest of the epping hunt of the saving of seven thousand wild acres lying cheek by jowl with london by the epping forest act of eighteen seventy one had read also countless articles wherein the sylvan beauties of epping forest its ornithological and entomological treasures were proclaimed with emphatic sincerity yet the place itself was a revelation segnia irritant animos demissa per aurum quam c sunt oculis submissa fidelibus so wrote horace long ago and seeing is believing is a blunt but adequate translation of his verses epping forest was and is a sheer delight apart from the roads that traverse it it is as distinctly genuine and unkempt a piece of english woodland as is to be found on these islands the reference here is not to fine timber or to monumental trees but to the tangled thickets of ancient hawthorn rising from beds of bracken they were the brown relics of the last year's glory as we saw them with here and there a natural alley through their midst which stretched far on either side nothing of the tree kind gives such convincing testimony of antiquity as obviously old hawthorns which have been left to the care of nature your huge and venerable oak may be and very often is historic its story may be and often is traced back over several centuries men mourned over the fairlop oak in hainault forest hard by when it was blown down in eighteen twenty because it had been forty-five feet in girth and its boughs shadowed an area of three hundred feet the passage is quoted because its meaning is not too clear and it is said that the pulpit and lectern of st pancras church were made of the timber your historic oaks are the aristocracy of trees their annals are chronicled by the debrets and burkes of forestry but as there are ancient families of english peasants their simple pedigrees never kept because they seem to be of no moment which are probably far older in the land than any noble family so there are in all human probability thorn trees more ancient by far than the oldest oak they have survived or at any rate they give the impression that they have survived which is what really matters longer than the oaks for the same reasons which have led to the survival of the rustic families of men as peasants were left alone when peers went to tower hill so thorn trees have been passed unscathed by storms 
which have torn off the limbs of oaks or laid them prostrate on the ground have been spared by the woodcutter in search of his raw material for england's wooden walls they were insignificant very tough of no particular value as timber they have lived on unnoticed growing into impenetrable thickets bearded with time-honoured lichen garlanded with fragrant blossom in the season of the year haunted by nightingales which find in them nesting places defying even the most hardy boy a few of them have been famous in story the glastonbury thorn for example and the unica spinosa arbor round which the battle of saxon and dane raged fiercest at ashdown but most of the old thorns in the country are like most of the old peasant families simply of immemorial antiquity and when once they have attained maturity particularly in an exposed spot they seem to change little from year to year or in ten years or twenty or thirty that is why to my mind a thicket of gnarled and lichened hawthorns such as you may see by the acre in epping forest and to a greater extent there than in any other forest known to me is the strongest testimony of genuine antiquity and it is the thorn breaks therefore which charm me more than any other feature of the famous forest of epping they embody the very spirit of wild and untended woodland so we passed on through the long and rather pleasing street of epping and here the cyclist elected to remain behind being succeeded by a motorcyclist a cheerful wretch who since the road to ongar is one of many angles had us somewhat at his mercy his pace was nearly equal to the best speed it was prudent for us to achieve he could catch us and go ahead at severe gradients especially if there were a corner in front and he never failed to do so with a triumphant grin on his face when he was behind he knew that the way by which we passed would be clear to him when he was in front of us we could entertain with no such confidence for ourselves in relation to him barring accidents he could probably have clung to us all day that is to say unless he had jolted his heart out through his mouth motorcyclists say of course that they feel no jolting they may say the thing which is true but motorcycling looks so vibratory that their assertion produces no sort of effect on my mind however this particular motorcyclist grew weary of haunting us before we reached ongar and he was not regretted ongar though it owns a mound and an entrenchment made no deep impression on us and we passed on quickly to chelmsford trim neat ancient and modern for the county town of essex bulks fairly large in far away history and as for the modern appearance of its environs especially those through which we passed en route for colchester it has been written the colchester road through the northern suburb of springfield is enlivened by an avenue of villas and gardens comment as the newspapers used to say would be superfluous this colchester road through the northern suburb of springfield was the old roman road of our first tour through boreham and whitham and so far as marks tay at any rate but we travelled it in more genial conditions this time and could see all there was to be seen the villages and towns for whitham is quite a town and an ancient one at that did not seduce us into a halt 
although those of more leisurely mind, may make one for the sake of examining Whitham Church, in the walls of which are many Roman bricks. But the country, which pleased Arthur Young by its fertility, and by virtue of the intelligent pains with which it was treated by the Essex farmers, is, in its peaceful way, one of the most fascinating and characteristic to be found in all England. I shall not attempt to do justice to it at this point, partly because our journey was taken too early in the spring for a landscape, of which the trees are the chief glory to be seen at its best, but principally because, as I think has been explained before, some account of the scenic beauties of Essex can be given more suitably in an attempt to be made later to record some of the experiences acquired during a more than commonly golden September in the course of ten days spent in motoring about Essex from Colchester as a centre. Let no more be said here than that the Essex elms, or most of them, are not shrouded, as is the custom of many southern counties. That is to say, their side branches are not lopped off periodically to supply fuel and pea stocks a mere tuft being left at the top, and the result of leaving trees in their natural state is to make the road shady and delightful, although road surveyors might take a different view of them. Reaching Colchester, whereof any description is postponed for the reason already given, in the late afternoon of a market day, we betook ourselves to my old headquarters, the Red Lion, for afternoon tea. It is a delightfully old-fashioned house, having much oak timber, carved and black, on the front, and the motor enters under an overhanging archway into a courtyard shaded by an immemorial creeper. Here, usually, are military officers to be found, and the house has military traditions, for it is at least said that in the old Red Lion were gathered together the ill-fated Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyle and their officers, after the surrender of the city to Fairfax and Ireton had become inevitable. And, if tradition be true, as there is no reason to believe that it is not, it was from the Red Lion that they went forth gallantly and cheerfully to meet their deaths. It was a fine episode, and a sad one. Lucas was first shot, and he himself gave the orders to fire, with the same alacrity as if he had commanded a platoon of his own soldiers. Lyle instantly ran and kissed the dead body, then cheerfully presented himself to a like fate, thinking that the soldiers, destined for his execution, stood at too great a distance, he called to them to come nearer. One of them replied, I'll warrant you, sir, we'll hit you. He answered, smiling, Friends, I have been nearer you when you have missed me. Thus perished this generous spirit. Darkness was beginning to threaten before we left Colchester for Ipswich, and it had fallen before Ipswich was reached by the same road used in leaving it heretofore. So we passed through the streets of Ipswich, still crooked, of course, still infested with giant tramcars, and still crowded into the open country beyond the light of the acetylene lamps piercing the gloom for fully a quarter of a mile ahead. We pushed on partly because our minds had been half made up to spend the night at Felixstowe, partly because, on the whole, it seemed that Felixstowe would be a more pleasant resting place than Ipswich. 
the drawback was that we saw nothing more of the country than that apparently we crossed a good deal of heathland and that at trimley the towers of two churches appeared in quick succession they were in fact in the same churchyard as was seen another day and one was and is trimley st mary and the other trimley st martin why they stand cheek by jowl in this wasteful fashion i am unhappily not able to say not for lack of inquiry or curiosity but because inquiry has not been addressed to the right authorities and curiosity has therefore been in vain of felixstowe that night we saw nothing much we gathered an impression of streets of new villas detached and semi-detached leading at last to a large hotel which albeit in a state of semi-hibernation was welcome semi-hibernation means that the dining-room proper was not in use and that only the first-floor bedrooms were ready for the reception of visitors still there was dinner ready and its readiness quite made up for cramped quarters need it be added that the hotel is named after felix the burgundian as is the town felix every schoolboy knows but a good many grown men and women may have forgotten was the first bishop of east anglia imported by king sigebert in 630 a.d and had his see at dunnage perhaps the most weirdly forlorn place in all england which we visited next day that next day opened ill with abundance of warm rain which at first at any rate showed no signs of abating that rain was really a blessing in disguise for when it abated sullenly mr coleman proposed a morning call on mr felix cobbold m p whom in fact he had been helping in the election which ought to be known for all time as the motor-car election and mr cobbold was hospitality personified he kept us willing prisoners taking us with him as hostages while he went in search of the ladies and hence comes it that without stepping outside my rule never to inspect another man's house save as his guest i can at least attempt to describe a very perfect gem of an earthly paradise you must know first that felixstowe is fitly one must not write happily named in that being situate on the east coast of england where the air has been known to exceed its duties in the way of bracing the constitution of man it has a little aspect of its own nearly due south along the front of this for some distance runs a parade esplanade promenade or whatever they may choose to call it and from this unless memory is playing a trick the usual pier of the modern watering place runs into the sea in the usual way it would appear then that felixstowe itself made no abiding impression exercised no strong fascination on my mind that is so it is just a seaside town with lots of new houses which lays itself out to attract sojourning visitors in summer and such places differ little some clacton on sea for example which is also within my manor are a little worse than others by reason of the multitudes and quality of the company some are a little better and have golf links felixstowe is of the latter kind and the golf links which we saw next day look distinctly good but for seaside places as such i have frankly no use and it is the rarest thing in the world for them to be possessed 
of any architectural interest. End of chapter 6, part 1